Hi everyone and welcome to this special emergency Hash Reconnect Julian stream. We are meeting here with all of you today because we are gravely concerned for Julian Assange. His right to communicate, his human Connect right Julian's to communicate. Stream. We are oh. meeting... Sorry for the feedback, guys. I'll just start again. We are gravely concerned for Julian because his right to communicate with his loved ones, both online and in person, has been restricted by the Ecuadorian embassy. This is being widely reported across media around the world, and uh, uh, several of the people who are close to him are also releasing statements. I believe the Courage Foundation is also making a statement. I want to start this off by telling you what we know so far. So I'd like to start with the statement that has been released by Brian Eno and Yanis Varoufakis. I'm gonna share screen for you guys for a minute and we're gonna read it through together while the other guests on the stream also get prepared. The link to this is on my Twitter, at Suzy3D. Brian Eno and Yanis Varoufakis restored Julian Assange's access to visitors and the outside world. It is with great concern that we heard that Julian Assange has lost access to the internet and the right to receive visitors at the Ecuadorian London Embassy. Only extraordinary pressure from the US and the Spanish governments can explain why Ecuador's authorities should have taken such appalling steps in isolating Julian. Only recently, the government of Ecuador granted Julian citizenship and a diplomatic passport in a bid to allow him safe passage from London. The UK government, under heavy pressure from the US government, refused to exploit this opportunity to end Julian's detention, even after the Swedish authorities announced that no charges were or would be laid against him. Now it seems that the Ecuadorian government that has been leaned on mercilessly, not only to stop attempting to provide Julian with a diplomatic route to safety, but to drive him out of their London embassy as well. In addition to US pressure, the Spanish government is also using its leverage over Ecuador to silence Julian's criticisms of Madrid's imprisonment of Catalan politicians, and in particular, of the arrest of Catalonia's former premier in Germany. Clearly, Ecuador's government has been subjected to bullying over its decision to grant Julian asylum, support, and ultimately diplomatic status. Naturally, Quito cannot admit that it is buckling under that pressure, and it argues in public that Julian's tweets over Catalonia are responsible for the decision to isolate him. Of course, this is utterly unbelievable. Julian is now a citizen of Ecuador and as such enjoys the full protections of his freedom of expression guaranteed by the constitution of Ecuador. Additionally, the only reason Julian is holed up in Ecuador's London embassy and why Ecuador gave him asylum in the first place is precisely because he empowered whistleblowers freedom of expression and defended our right to know the truth about practices of the US and other Western powers that the latter found inconvenient once exposed to the light of day. A world in which whistleblowers are hounded, small countries are forced to violate their cherished principles and politicians are jailed for pursuing peacefully their political agenda is a deeply troubled world. A world at odds with the one the liberal establishment in Europe and the United States proclaimed as its artifact since the end of the Cold War. With these thoughts in mind, we call upon all citizens of good conscience to send a message to the Ecuadorian authorities asking that Julian's access to the outside world be restored and another more pertinent one to the British authorities to end Julian's detention. And there is a petition that people can sign in support of ending Julian's isolation immediately. 
So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susie Dawson. I'm a journalist, I'm an activist, and I'm the current leader of the Internet Party of New Zealand. I have assembled here today with a few key friends and some other supporters of Julian who will be coming to speak to you as well about the situation. We have done so for several reasons. Firstly, because Julian's human right to communication, to freedom of communication, freedom of speech must be restored by Ecuador immediately. And we are going to keep organizing together and making as much noise as possible until those freedoms, those human rights are restored to him. Secondly, Julian supporters in the UK are right now assembling at the Ecuadorian embassy in Harms Crescent at the Knightsbridge station in London. We call on everybody who is in the UK or particularly in England to travel to the Ecuadorian embassy and to make your support for Julian known. It will be a huge comfort for him to see supporters massing outside the embassy. This ridiculous arbitrary detention of Julian has gone on for too many years. It has been tolerated to an extent that is in my opinion, despicable. It is time that we all take some responsibility for this hero of our generation and helping to liberate him. Those who don't, who don't live in the UK, but who know someone who does, you should reach out to your family and friends in the UK and make sure that they are aware of the situation, that they are aware that Julian is effectively trapped inside the embassy with no outside communication, that that is wrong and that we need to do something about it. For those that don't fall into either category, but who do care about Julian and to his millions of supporters around the world, join in retweeting the hashtag hash reconnect Julian. Spread the word about what has happened to him. Raise his, hope, his profile as high as possible. Make as much sustained noise as you can. Petition the Ecuadorian embassy, the British government, who's particularly liable for this situation, and demand that they free Julian Assange. I would like to hand over now to the Internet Party founder and visionary, tech entrepreneur Kim.com. Kim is a close friend of Julian and has been for a number of years. I would like him to speak now about his opinion on this situation, what he would like to see done in honor of Julian. Hi, Kim. Hi, thank Hi. you very much. Um, this is a, a very appalling situation that Julian Assange is in now. Um, what the US government has tried to accomplish for many, many years uh, has uh, happened today. They silenced Julian Assange. He cannot receive any visitors at the embassy and he has been disconnected uh, from all communications, including the internet. Meaning uh, his basic human right uh, to communicate and uh, for free speech have now been uh, undermined. And we need all uh, to come together and we need all to work together uh, to let everyone in the world know about this and fight together that uh, Julian's communication is restored. Um, on the internet right now, the hashtag that we want everyone to focus on and to tweet about is reconnect Julian. Hashtag reconnect Julian. Um, if you know anyone in London or if you yourself are in London, uh, please uh, show yourself at the embassy, at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, let everyone know and see that we will not accept uh, this intrusion into Julian's rights um, and do everything you can to let your friends uh, and family know that this is going on and the best thing that we can do right now for those that are in London is to show up uh, and uh, show your support physically at the embassy and for everyone who isn't in London 
let everyone in the world know through Twitter, Facebook, all social media, uh, what is going on here right now. Because if we don't restore uh, Julian's connectivity, uh, we will have lost one of the last great investigative voices on the planet, uh, someone who is telling us the truth about government secrets, who is exposing uh, criminal wars and criminal government uh, activities that uh, the population doesn't even know about in detail because they are keeping it secret from us. Uh, Julian is such a powerful resource for truth that uh, he absolutely deserves uh, our uh, support in re-establishing his uh, free speech. And uh, to the uh, leadership in Ecuador, I like to say to you, you have done a great service to the world uh, by supporting Julian Assange with uh, asylum and with guaranteeing his free speech over the last few years. Everybody knows and everyone can imagine that uh, the country of Ecuador has been bullied as a result of your stand for Julian Assange. Uh, and uh, I think after all these years, to now give in to political pressure and bullying by countries like the United States and Spain uh, is sending the wrong signal uh, to the people that uh, have appreciated you so much for your support. So um, I have asked everyone who is following me uh, to write a tweet uh, to Lenin Moreno and let him know, the president of Ecuador, that we ask him kindly and respectfully to return Julian Assange to the internet. And we demand that Ecuador will not give in to the pressure of forces that uh, want to destroy Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And let us be absolutely clear why they want to achieve that. They don't want to achieve that because Julian Assange is a criminal. They don't want to achieve that because Julian Assange is a terrorist. They want to achieve the silencing of Julian Assange because he is providing us with truth, with facts, with transparency that we don't get from our governments anymore. He is the one person in the world who, who has fought more for your rights uh, than anybody else in recent history. This man does not deserve to be silenced. We should all come together. We should all work together to uh, right this wrong. We cannot sit here and do nothing about it. That's why I urge you, ask everyone, this is the time. Call your friends, text your friends, email your friends. Let them know about what's going on. Share this message. Let us restore Julian's communications. Retweet the hashtag reconnect Julian. And let us talk for a moment about why all of this is happening at, at the moment. Um, I believe that Ecuador has stronger ties with Spain than they have with the United States. And Julian Assange has been supportive of the people in Catalonia who want to self-determine their future and what government to live under. And they have in great numbers come out to say that they would like to uh, be independent. They would like to have more rights and more powers to control their own destiny. And uh, just like Julian Assange always did in the past, 
He is listening to those people. He's not listening to the politicians and the business people that have uh, invested interests not to allow the Catalonian people to decide their own faith. He is listening to the people and he's saying, well, why shouldn't they have the right to at least vote about what they want? And that has been a big thorn on the side of uh, Spain and Spanish royalty. They cannot accept uh, that there is a region in their country that uh, wants to have independence. And just recently, in a very dirty way, uh, have they arrested the president of the Catalonia region uh, in Germany. And Julian has been tweeting about that. Julian has uh, explained to the world the history of uh, something similar happening in, in 1940 when Germany to took a previous leader of Catalonia under arrest, handed him over to Spain, and then uh, have him executed in Spain. And uh, I think Julian is making a lot of people aware about the real risk of this happening again, because Spain will almost, it seems, do anything in their power to stop Catalonia from having their, uh, uh, their way. And uh, if, in fact, um, this extradition takes place from Germany to Spain, it would be a grave injustice because even in Germany, you don't have a law that matches the kind of laws that Spain is using to try and extradite this man. And uh, just like Julian has always done in the past, he is making a stand for what's right, for a man who has done nothing wrong, a man who has not asked for any kind of violence, a man who has not done, uh, committed any crime, a man who purely uh, makes uh, his position known uh, and fights for his people, who asked him to be their leader and to fight for their independence. And if that is not allowed, if we can't do that, and you know, right now in Spanish jails, a lot of these Catalonian leaders are, are rotting and waiting, uh, and uh, you know, there's no progress with their uh, freedom, and uh, they remain locked up. You know, we need to ask ourselves, how is this okay? And how can the Spanish government now bully Ecuador into silencing Julian Assange simply because he lets us know about uh, these atrocities that are happening in Spain, where uh, Spanish police is uh, violent towards protesters that are peacefully trying to let uh, everyone in Spain and around the world know that they would like to decide their own faith and their own destiny uh, and be independent. You know, when someone gets silenced over his attempt to bring justice to the world, which is really what Julian does, he doesn't pick sides. He doesn't pick the US or Russia, he doesn't pick between left or right. All he cares about is that we all have our equal human rights, that we fight against this inequality between the 1% and the powerful and everybody else. You know, Julian is a man of principle like I've never ever seen anywhere uh, in history. I mean, this guy has gone through years of pain uh, and stuck to his principles. You know, he, he could have easily said, okay, I'm done with WikiLeaks, and they would have just, uh, you know, let him be. Uh, instead, he chose this path um, because he saw that the world is, sh is changing and is shifting in a way that we are, we the people, 
are losing control. Um, you know, the powerful enact new laws to make us weaker and weaker. They spy on us. They, uh, uh, you know, they, they do a propaganda war on our minds where they, uh, you know, have the media uh, on their side and, and the movie makers on their side to, to sell us a story that isn't the reality, that is just fake because they have an agenda that they are pushing. And, uh, you know, Julian is an enemy uh, to those people who just want to play with us, who don't care about us, the 1% that really run things, you know. And uh, if we allow Julian's voice to be silent, and if we don't stand up for him, well, who else is, is out there? You know, you can't trust the mainstream media anymore. Uh, there is hardly any investigative journalism. Uh, the CIA and numerous global spy agencies have so-called non-official agents, uh, which are journalists. They pay thousands and thousands of journalists around the world to spin their narrative, to sell you wars, to sell you lies. And, uh, you know, obviously they don't like Julian Assange because he's getting in their way. You know, he is uh, telling us things uh, that no one else does. And whenever he receives a document, you know, he has to, you know, every single time he has to make a decision if this is, uh, you know, if he can publish it, if, if, if this is... Uh, you know, somehow critical <clears throat> to some people's uh, safety or lives. So he has a huge responsibility. And in all this time that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have worked for you, the public, they have not betrayed you. They have never uh, gotten anything wrong. And if you want to pay him back for this honesty and his principles and him providing us with the truth, then now is the time. This is the time. You know, we need to stop the silencing of Julian Assange. We need to get Julian reconnected. We need to get the Ecuadorian government to allow Julian to have visitors again. And we need to let them know day in and day out, as long as it takes, that we are here fighting for Julian, that we are not going to uh, give up on this uh, atrocity that is happening right now. We're not going to give up on Julian's human right to communicate with us and with the world and to continue his important work, no matter what the U.S. government says or the spy agencies say, you know, this is too important for us. We're going to lose uh, you know, an institution for truth if we don't fight for Julian now. And that's exactly what the U.S. government wants. And that's exactly what Spain wants right now, because Julian is an inconvenience to them. And that is exactly why Ecuador is doing this right now. You know, they have been bullied and they have given in. And now we need to remind them that they have to get back onto the path that they have been on for the last few years, helping Julian. They need to continue to help Julian and they need to protect him from this bullying. And we need to support them and Julian against the bullies. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really all I have to say right now. And uh, Susie or um, Elizabeth, if you want to add something to it, please go ahead. I know that there are a lot of people watching and I don't know if they're all familiar with me, but I'm Elizabeth Voss, I'm editor in chief of Dispute Media and I'm really honored to be a part of this vigil uh, to reconnect Assange. And I think Kim, the point you made about Assange standing up for people everywhere, people that don't have a voice and refusing to, to stand down in his defense of them is such an important point. It can't be said enough. You can't emphasize that enough. And the, as you're totally right in saying that, you know, this effort, this online vigil, and also, you know, everyone who is telling their friends to go to the embassy, who is, who are standing in front of the embassy now, that is the, it is the most important time for them to show their support in that way. 
So fantastic points. And, um, you know, we will be here as long as it takes. We are going to be here for hours. We're going to have, you know, amazing people join us hopefully very soon. And I really appreciate everyone who is joining us now in this vigil. Um, you know, I'm, I'm upset that this has happened, but it's, you know, it's bringing us all together to support the truth and support the right of people everywhere and uh, to hopefully pay back Assange just a little bit for everything that he does uh, for disadvantaged and uh, people that are attacked by their governments around the world. So, and uh, Kim, I know that you mentioned that um, we don't need to be, um, you know, that we should address the Ecuadorian government um, in a in a kind way. And I think that, that should also be really emphasized. And I was wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit more about uh, the ways in which we can address Ecuador that uh, which doesn't harm uh, Julian's um, chances of getting um, reconnected. So, uh, you know, not not coming out and being outright angry at them, but actually encouraging towards them. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, Ecuador, which is a small country, is just as much a, a victim in all of this as uh, Julian Assange. Because what has happened over the last few years is mounting diplomatic pressure. The US pressuring them and other countries like the UK and now Spain uh, applying pressure on Ecuador. And everyone needs to understand that that pressure is not just verbal, um, it also goes into the economy of Ecuador. It goes into all kinds of uh, important things to the Ecuadorian government to advance their own goals. And when you have uh, a country like the United States uh, directly or indirectly putting sanctions on you and uh, causing you pain, well, then after a couple of years of that, you do think about your choices. You do wonder, well, was this right that we uh, defended Julian Assange? And one good example uh, of that is New Zealand. New Zealand had a no nuclear stance. They came out and said, we don't want nuclear warships in our harbors. We don't want nuclear powers in our, power in our country, and we are against nuclear weapons. And the United States absolutely hated that. And for decades, they have punished New Zealand for that by putting New Zealand into a corner, by uh, you know, not doing the kind of deals with New Zealand, free trade and so on, that they were doing with other countries. So New Zealand for making that stance, which was absolutely the right thing to do, has been punished with billions of dollars worth of losses and damages until they turned around like that little bully puppy and was uh, seeking the warmth of the United States government again. And what did they do? They did this outrageous raid uh, on, on my family in a copyright case, something that is just uh, cannot be explained by anything else than kissing the behind of the United States government to earn favor with them and uh, Hollywood. And, uh, you know, everyone breaks under pressure if it just lasts long enough. And uh, I think Ecuador um, uh, is now at a point where they are desperate to find a resolution to the problem. They have granted Julian uh, citizenship. They have granted him immunity. They have offered to the British government to just give him safe passage to Ecuador uh, so that they also don't have to deal with this situation anymore. But the British government refused on the orders of the United States, which is, of course, already for many years seeking to extradite Julian Assange for reporting the truth. 
that is really what his crime is in the eyes of uh, the U.S. government. You have told too many people the truth about our dirty wars, about our uh, criminal drone killings, about how we lie to the public, about how our political system is so corrupt. You know, you have done so much damage to our image and uh, to our, you know, smooth operations of our corruptness uh, that, you know, you need to be brought to the United States and uh, probably be trialed in a secret courtroom where no one will ever see him again and locked up in solitary confinement uh, until he's dead. That is really what the United States government wants. And yeah, we cannot absolutely. allow that. You know, in the world, uh, here's one thing that the United States needs to understand. Everyone was on the side of the U.S. after 9-11. No country in the world uh, was, uh, you know, feeling that anyone deserves anything like this. And then they started the war on terror. And they used the war on terror uh, to spy on all of us, to create all these technologies and tools that allowed them to listen to every single email and every, every single text message and every voice call being transcribed and stored in some database. And not just uh, of the world population, but every American too, you know. And by doing that and then raising uh, all these wars against, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and everywhere, um, you know, they have lost that momentum after 9-11. They have lost that respect of the world community. And, uh, you know, it's one of the very few countries in the world that stood up to the U.S., and said, we are not going to be part of this alliance. We are not going to go to a fake war based on lies, it was Germany. Germany knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction because the very person who told the U.S. that was a German informant and was paid by the German uh, BND uh, spy agency uh, as an informant. And after years of working with that guy, they just knew he's lying. He's making things up. He told them about these mobile uh, uh, chemical labs for mass destruction and, and made drawings and all of that. And then the, German, incredible. the German government sent people over to Iraq to verify his claims, and none of them ever were verified. And the funniest thing is, at the end, this guy who did all this uh, took credit for it and said, yeah, of course I lied, and you went to war in Iraq based on my lies. And here's the worst thing about it. The Germans informed the United States government that he's a liar and that his information is not credible, yet Colin Powell used this stuff anyway in the United Nations to convince the world to go to war over this fake uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction story. And if we wouldn't have people like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that report to us these leaks, these cables, uh, and the atrocities that are being done, you know, we wouldn't know in all this detail about this stuff. And it's because of Julian Assange, uh, you know, that I started to wake up. I was living in my happy bubble and I didn't really care much. You know, I, I, I was doing well. I made a lot of money. You know, I lived a great lifestyle. No worries in my life at all. But then I saw the video, Collateral Murder, and... I saw how U.S. helicopter pilots, almost like in a video game, uh, shot innocent people in the dozen uh, on the ground and laughing about it and joking about it as if it is a video game, as if, if it is a joke. And they killed children that day. They killed uh, journalists. They shot innocent people, and they were having fun doing that. And when I saw that, after everything that I knew about 
the WMD lies from Colin Powell. I said enough is enough. You know, how arrogant can you be to go halfway around the world and kill innocent people and joke about it like it's nothing and like their lives isn't worth any uh, uh, much as, as, as an American life. You know, you treat people outside of the United States as as less and low. And, you know, the Nazis did that, you know, and if you go around the world and you, you wage these wars Well, then you have to accept that if you do something wrong, if you breach international laws and you lie to the world about your uh, reasons, well, you know, then you need to understand that people are out there like Julian Assange, who are principled, honest, who are going to report about this, because that can't be the way of our world, you know? We can't accept that this is how, uh, how we live as human beings. You know, we need to respect Absolutely. life. We need to respect life. We need to respect other countries, other religions. You know, we need to get along and we can't go out and, and have all these wars. And when we are really honest about it, it was all about the oil, you know? Yeah. The, the yeah. British government and the U.S. government met, met and before they even went to war and before they even started all these lies, they were already cutting off, cutting off the share of, you know, who's getting what, who's getting which region, what oil, what deals. And that is really what this is all, all about. It's war for profit, you know. It's all about the money. It's not about the people or peace or freedom, bringing freedom to Iraq. What a bullshit. Look at Iraq now. You know, you have completely messed that country up. Yes, Saddam Hussein was a piece of shit. Excuse my language, you know, but people had a life. And look at it now, you know, it's just a complete uh, miserable situation for millions and millions of people. And you have caused the biggest refugee crisis in modern history. And now all the European countries have to pay for all these people flooding into them because the U.S. foreign policy has caused all of these issues. And we have to applaud Julian Assange for letting us know what's really going on in the world because our media doesn't do it anymore. You know, they are all owned by massive uh, conglomerates, by massive business conglomerates that have their own agenda. They are interested to have a good standing with the government, you know, to get that extra treatment or the tax reform or, you know, whatever else they are lobbying for. These large conglomerates are in bed with the people that are lying to you and they are doing it professionally, uh, effectively every day. And we see this since the election of Trump, the fake news media has been exposed You know, they are all, uh, they've gone on overdrive uh, to, to lie to you and they have gone too far. Now everybody knows that the mainstream media is, is a bunch of, of liars, you know, that are just spinning a story to achieve the outcome that their owners want, you know. So when we have someone like Julian Assange, who is immune to this bullshit, who is immune to being bribed, being bought, who is principled and says, well, I tell the world the way it is. How the hell can we not come together to fight for this guy now and say his communication needs to be restored immediately? Ecuador, you cannot do this to Julian Assange because all the credit that you've earned Uh, around the world as standing up for him is about to get wasted with uh, cutting his freedom of speech. And uh, like I said uh, at the outset uh, of this uh, stream, we all have to come together now. Now is the time. This is the time to stand up for truth, to stand up for WikiLeaks and to stand up for Julian Assange, you know? Anything you can do, agree with you. do it. I completely agree with you. Um, we have an amazing audience assembled here already. I'd just like to quickly fill you guys in on some of what's happening in the social media sphere. 
I'd like to say thank you to our huge team of mods in the YouTube and on Facebook and Twitter who are working their butts off right now. I've just been sent some of the metrics for the hash reconnect Julian tab, um, tag and I would like to show you guys because it is absolutely spectacular. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly and I'd like you all to have a look at this. I if I can get my zoom out of the way. Okay, so in the last two hours since this hashtag was started, there is over 5,000 tweets with an audience of 8.7 million accounts reached. 2,668 people have tweeted about Reconnect Julian already. There is over 70 tweets a minute, more than one a second being added to the hashtag as we speak. And the total reach is at 24.4 million. That is absolutely spectacular, but I want more, 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 more. I want everybody in the world to see this hashtag, to know what has happened to Julian and to know how much people care about him and how much people are willing to fight for his right, his human right to communication with his friends, his family, his supporters, and with the public to be reestablished effective immediately. So please, here's what I'd like to do. We've got more than 500 people watching just on YouTube and we're streaming to a whole bunch of different platforms at the moment. But just on the one YouTube channel, there's more than 500 people watching this second. Guys, I would like you to take the amazing information that Kim is sharing with you and everything that you hear on the stream write quotes from it on Twitter, on Facebook, anywhere and everywhere on the internet and include the link to the stream and include the hash hashtag, hash reconnect Julian. Spread this as far and wide as you can because while all of the mainstream media are reporting on what has happened to Julian and his situation, they are not reporting on the massive widespread support for him and this hashtag is not yet trending which is an abomination considering you've just seen the incredible metrics on it. So we need to push this so viral that everybody is asking, why isn't it trending? So that we can get some accountability from the, the corporations who are complicit in this situation, who are working at the behest and in the interests of the governments, the corrupt governments who have been persecuting Julian, have been persecuting Julian for, for years and years and years and who are continuing to do so. Only the combined and concerted voices of the people raised together in concert demanding justice for Julian can make a difference for him and can help to free him and help to re-establish his communication with his supporters and with the public. So please, guys, just work your butts off. Spread that hashtag everywhere that you can. Find articles about Julian, memes about Julian. There's thousands of them on the internet and share them far and wide. I want when Julian does inevitably have his communications channels re-established, I want him to see how many tens of thousands of people cared about him and spoke up for him and fought for him during this time. Um, I'd also like you to know that I am in communication with a dozens, in fact, of whistleblowers and politicians and activists and journalists who are all sending me messages of support for Julian. We have people wanting to call in and give their messages of support. We have a large number of people who are intending to join the stream and to advocate directly for Julian themselves. Because we did this on less than an hour's notice, most of them are driving places or at other events. We've got some really big name people who are literally on air advocating for Julian on other media channels on TV and on radio as we speak. But as the night progresses, we will have more and more people, some close supporters and friends of Julian coming in to speak on his behalf and to advocate for him. There is a pirate pad being prepared right now um, for questions. So if you guys have questions for Kim or for myself or for Elizabeth that relate to Julian or to WikiLeaks or to his situation, then these will be compiled. And at some point we will begin to answer some of the questions. 
Um, I've asked our mods to have a zero tolerance policy for trolling. I don't want us to have to deal with people who have nothing but negative energy for Julian. But those of you who have good energy will absolutely be raised up and will be answered um, at some point in the stream. So thank you so much for caring and for being a part of this. It is really historic and really important. And this is how we display our power is by getting together and combining our voices and having this amazing reach to our fellow members of the public and letting them know how serious of an issue this is and that it is in all of our hands to do something about it and to make change happen. So sorry for interrupting you, Elizabeth. I know you have some more questions for Kim, so I'll well, hand it back to you, but I greatly appreciate it. Um, you'll just one last thing. If you look, I'm pretty sure it's the pinned tweet on my Twitter account right now. It has the event media resources. It's a paste bin link. If you check that out, there's a whole list of really credible sources, Twitter accounts um, of people who are close to Julian and close to WikiLeaks who you should check out their timelines because they will have the most reliable um, information, up-to-date information about Julian's situation. Uh, do not believe everything that you hear from the mainstream media. Actually go and check out the timeline and, and the timelines of and the information from those credible sources. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, I just had two really brief points that were in response to what Kim said. And th those were that, first of all, and as, as Susie noted, we know that this is obviously an infringement on Julian Assange's personal right and human right to free speech. But because of what Julian has done and given for the benefit of everyone around the world, this is also something that will, as Kim mentioned, affect all of us negatively. We all, our own self-interest depends on giving Julian his right to free speech back. This isn't only his personal right. It is a public, you know, really a danger for all of us that he has been silenced. And it cannot be a precedent that is set where we have dissidents and people that are truth tellers um, that, stand up to the establishment to have them silenced in this way is absolutely unacceptable we cannot let this happen and then the other point i wanted to just um you know reflect on what kim said was that he mentioned you know the war the war economy the, you know the economy of death and i think it's really really fascinating as well that um, despite the way that a lot of people try to make Assange into somebody who has been, um, you know, casting him or characterizing him as a politicized figure, you know, he has stood up to the war economy um, in a bi uh, that has been bipartisan. So whether, whether it's George W. Bush or Obama or any other president, Assange has always stood up against um, the war economy under those presidencies. So it's not a Democrat or a Republican or a left or a right. He's always just st uh, stood up for truth and for the benefit of people that are suffering around the world. And so I think that's just really important to remember right now. And um, those are the just two brief points I wanted to say um, in response to what Kim said. They were really awesome, awesome points that he made. So, I've just know. seen uh, Twitter starting to trend uh, reconnect Julian uh, on my phone. It now shows 18,600 uh, tweets about that hashtag. That's uh, pretty decent considering that we just started this about three hours ago. So uh, thank you very much, everyone who uh, is retweeting that and is adding that to their tweets. Also, I've seen a lot of messages, very respectful, uh, very kind to the president of Ecuador, letting him know that Julian is important to us and uh, asking him kindly to restore uh, Julian's communication. So this thing is uh, building momentum. We see um, that, uh, uh, you know, it's growing. So let's keep it up, everybody. Um, you know, make sure, don't be shy, tweet about it. Uh, let everyone know that uh, this matters to you. Um, and always with every tweet, use the hashtag uh, ReconnectJulian. Do we have uh, any questions yet, Elizabeth? I'm just checking chat right now, and I've just been retweeting all of the wonderful tweets that people have sent out about this vigil. So, and chat's moving very, very fast, I see. 
people are, you know, agreeing with us that we need Julian back online. Um, you know, very much a huge amount of support being shown. And then um, one person pointed out that Donald Trump had just tweeted something. So it would be good to re reply to that with uh, reconnect Julian just to get visibility out there. Um, I don't see any questions at this point that stand out. Okay, everyone who's watching the chat right now, if you have any questions, uh, just go ahead and uh, type it into the uh, stream chat. And then, uh, you know, whatever we, we see that we can answer, we'll answer for you. We're going to be here for a while. So, you know, let's make it, let's make it worthwhile. Definitely. So I'm, I'm just scrolling through uh, the reconnect uh, Julian hashtag. And it's just amazing the number of tweets uh, that are rolling uh, through here. Every two seconds, I see a new tweet. So, you know, we're definitely building something here, guys. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I'm sure uh, Julian, who unfortunately right now can't follow this development, uh, uh, I'm sure will be very happy once he's back on the internet and he can see all of this. You know, he will be very uh, grateful for your support, I'm sure. I'm just chatting right now with Randy Critico, who's um, hoping to join us. Randy Critico is an old friend of Julian as well, has, um, has met with him several times in the Ecuadorian embassy. I think he's interviewed Julian three times on his radio show. Um, he's a huge- your, your voice is a bit quiet. Oh, is it? Sorry, okay. I might, I'll just plug in a headset and then hopefully that will improve <laughs> the situation. It was fine before. Sorry, my Mac is a little bit temperamental. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, cool. I was just saying that I'm just um, texting back and forth with Randy Critico at the moment. Randy is a old friend of Julian's. He's interviewed Julian, I think, three times on Randy's um, radio show. Um, Randy's also uh, remarkably interviewed Christine Assange several times. Um, Randy is outraged by what is happening um, and is hoping to join us on the stream soon. He's just currently driving around New York and Manhattan traffic. Yeah, that is, that cannot be a pleasant experience. <laughs> um, but I, there's a number of people who are sending us statements of support as well. Um, I know that the Pirate Parties International have also just messaged me before and told me that the Pirate Parties are united in their support for Julian and uh, their belief that Julian's human right to communication should be immediately restored. And I see that our WikiLeaks task force has tweeted the link and the hashtag reconnect Julian as well, as well as, and they've also embedded into that tweet, a live stream from the embassy. So that's an important, if you guys uh, go to my Twitter account, uh, that will be an important one or go, sorry, go to the WikiLeaks task force. Uh, please retweet that. It's an important, it's an important one to support. Now um, my contacts at Courage Foundation had told me that they were putting out a statement as well. Um, Great. So I'm just looking for that because I think that's an important one to read through. It looks like it isn't up yet. However, this is really cool. Courage has, I'll just take you guys through the timeline for a second. Courage Foundation is a foundation that Julian helped to establish. It supports whistleblowers and at-risk journalists around the world and has had some pretty major achievements in supporting them, like Lori Love up there we see. So here we go. Courage has shared our stream, which is fantastic. They've also shared a tweet by Jessalyn Radak, who is a very prominent attorney who advocates for whistleblowers. She is asking London people to please go to the Ecuadorian embassy and demand that Julian Assange of WikiLeaks has internet access and be allowed visitors and has shared the hashtag, hash reconnect Julian. Awesome. A number of other tweets. Also, I see Courage has retweeted Kim where Kim has taken photos of the first protesters arriving at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Oh, um, I haven't taken those photos. I'm in New Zealand. Yes. But yeah, I've of course. Tweeted, 
<laughs> has tweeted photos of the of yeah. the first. Now, I also have actually received a message from um, the support group that meets periodically on the ground at the Ecuadorian embassy. They've been meeting for years down to support Julian there. Um, they have told me that there is a special event planned for 10 a.m. tomorrow morning London time, a special vigil event in support of Julian and to demand that his human right for communication be restored. So if you cannot make it down there tonight, and I know it's all, I think it's already dark in London, um, that you can meet everybody there at 10 a.m. tomorrow for a special rally in support of Julian. However, we are still asking. I personally would like to see, I would like to see an occupation there. I would like to see people <laughs> camp, camped out 24 seven. And if I was in a position to be able to be in London, you can guarantee that that's exactly where I would be right now, camped out outside the embassy demanding justice for Julian. I totally agree, but this is the best we can do. This is the online version of that exact act. That's what we're doing, so. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, it would be fantastic if there's a giant upon, a convergence upon the embassy, but right now we have already achieved a massive online convergence, exactly. which is an important first step. Yeah, I also have uh, a couple of screens here in front of me uh, following the news and uh, the BBC just had a, a piece about uh, Julian's internet being disconnected. So, you know, it's, it's hitting the mainstream now, uh, you know, obviously with their own little spin, no one uh, over there is asking to reconnect him. You know, they're just reporting that Ecuador uh, disconnected uh, Julian from the internet. But, you know, it's definitely uh, uh, getting known now, and that is that is good because, um, you know, a lot of supporters don't even know yet that this is happening. And, uh, you know, we're all going to come together and the numbers are going to increase. Uh, and then, you know, we'll keep the pressure on until Julian is back online. I've just received confirmation that um, we have several people incoming to the Zoom. Elizabeth, if you want to um, go ahead, I've just put the link to the Etherpad with the questions from viewers. If you want to uh, weed out the best ones and field them towards Kim, that would be great. I'm okay. going to disappear for a few minutes while I just play technician and help people to work out how to use the Zoom and so that they can speak to you all as well. Okay, so the first question I'm seeing on this etherpad, which uh, is from, it looks like Laurie Burt on Facebook, who asked, why can't Julian go to Ecuador? And I think that's a great question because he does have diplomatic immunity. So Ecuador didn't just make him a citizen, they also gave uh, made him a diplomat. So technically, you know, he should be able to go to Ecuador without a problem. Kim, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, the, the UK government has basically uh, told... Uh, Ecuador in no uncertain terms that they are not going to accept this diplomatic immunity uh, that Julian has and that they will arrest him anyhow. The moment they have the opportunity uh, to arrest him, they will do it. So, um, uh, you know, this is just in line with everything else that the British government has done. For example, not honoring the ruling by the United Nations uh, that the illegal detention um, of Julian Assange must stop and that he should be compensated. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a pattern of complete disregard uh, of, uh, you know, international treaties, of international law. Uh, the British government uh, doesn't honor any of that. And, uh, of course... Uh, they are not honoring it because the U.S. government is telling them not to. The U.S. government is driving all of this. They drove uh, the uh, destruction of Julian's reputation with these false charges in Sweden. 
they drove him into uh, the situation that he is in now. And uh, obviously, uh, they are persecuting him and they want to continue to punish him. And there are a lot of people right now in the U.S. government, in the Pentagon, in the CIA headquarters, uh, in the NSA headquarters, they are sitting there, thumbs up, cheering each other on how great it is, this achievement that they were able to silence Julian Assange. But what they always underestimate, and they do it every single time, time and time again, is the people out there, is the internet, the power of the internet, we are not going to shut up until Julian Assange has his uh, communications back. And if you think deep state in the United States and you can get away with this stuff, you're mistaken. We are more powerful than you. You know, you can go and, and, and watch this unfold over the next few days until Julian's connectivity will be restored because Ecuador uh, you know, they, they have been bullied into this, but they're going to realize, I hope, soon enough that this bullying is really tarnishing their reputation. They have helped Julian all these years. What, what is it for if he's now not allowed to communicate, not allowed to uh, uh, do his free speech and his truth telling to the world? It is tarnishing... Uh, Ecuador's reputation uh, and it's just showing weakness because that is what this is. Ecuador is now, after all these years, giving in to the bullies. And that is weak. That is not the strength that we are used to from Ecuador when they said, yes, we're giving this guy asylum because we can see that his case um, um, of being persecuted by the U.S. has merit. You know, Ecuador looked at what Julian uh, presented to them and said, yes, the U.S. government is after you for telling the truth, you know, and we don't stand for that. And they need to return to those roots where it all started, and they need to continue to support uh, Julian and not bow to the pressure of the United States, the UK government, and now Spain because of the whole Catalonia issue. Absolutely. I think that brings up a number of really great points, especially um, in terms of the amount of pressure put on Ecuador. Um, in Susie's recent article on being Julian Assange, which was so timely in its publication, she pointed out a really great, fascinating um, point about the amount of pressure put on WikiLeaks. She wrote, um, and this is a quoting from her, her article, and if somebody can link it into the chat in, on YouTube, that would be great. But it said, she said, throughout the time period, um, the publisher, WikiLeaks, was the subject of a worldwide manhunt and an all-of-government investigation. So this is, you know, I, I want to make that point because I feel like it's really um, significant to really get people to understand that an all of government investigation was put onto WikiLeaks and Assange. So uh, definitely. Um, and the other point I wanted to make before I go on to the next question was that, um, oh, never mind, I'll just go on to the questions. So um, we've got a couple of them uh, crossed out. Marion on Facebook and Bullshit, <laughs> sorry, uh, Bullshit Man on YouTube both asked similar questions. They said, is there any way to get internet access to Julian temporarily, like a Wi-Fi hotspot outside the embassy? Um, or at least one tweet or public statement from him, or would Ecuador need to officially approve it? And I'm not sure. So that's a great question, both for Kim as well as uh, people on the ground. If you are um, on the ground and you have access to the YouTube chat, the stream, then please let us know um, what the situation is there. Um, I'd like to answer that one if possible. Great. Um, so this is a question that I've heard quite a few times and it's like, you know, why can't he just use a mobile phone instead of the internet or why can't we provide him a hotspot or whatever? I don't know the answer for a fact, but I can tell you what I think is the case. And what I think is the case is from my own experience in embassies is that they are actually mobile free zones. They're high security zones. And Interesting. For for, yeah, for security reasons, they are quite often do not allow any mobile device or Wi-Fi devices to be inside the embassy. 
um, because obviously they're processing sensitive documents there and, and official government communications. They usually have security protocols that are very much very unlike, you know, any other establishment or place that you might be in a city. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is just no way for him to actually have mobile phone access in there. Um, I know from photos of Julian's office that he hardwires his internet connections. He uses Ethernet, which is a much more secure method of transmitting data than Wi-Fi. Um, I think, yeah, it just boils down to security. But also, if Ecuador are openly stating, as they have in an official communication, that they are preventing him from having access to the internet, I would be very surprised if they're leaving any stone unturned. Um, and I, I, I would take that at face value that, yes, he absolutely has no access to the internet. Um, obviously, it's seriously concerning because the very nature of Julian's situation is that he is in already in a form of isolation. Even when he has contact with the occasional visitor or even when he's able to tweet, he's physically isolated. So taking these last ties with the outside world away from him is even more grave and, and more serious uh, than it might be for somebody else who could still live a semi-normal life. Julian has not been allowed to live a normal life now for seven, eight years. And that's that's really why it's so imperative and that we that we fight for him and fight to reestablish his communications. Um, and it's interesting that you call my article timely now because I obviously didn't foresee any of this happening when I wrote yeah, the article. Yeah, of course not. I knew of course not. How yeah, I knew how seriously he was being targeted. But you're right. In retrospect, it is really timely. Um, and I would encourage you guys, not at all for my sake, but for your own sake, to go Google, or not Google, DuckDuckGo would be perfect. Yeah. Go, go search on Being Julian Assange, the article titled Being Julian Assange, purely because it debunks mountains of smears against Julian and against WikiLeaks that uh, unsuspecting members of the public have been um, subjected to over a number of years. And it is really important to correct that historical record, and, and the article does do that. But first and foremost, we need action now to free Julian, and we need action now to, at a minimum, re-establish his ability to communicate with and contact with, uh, have contact with his supporters, his family, his loved ones. So please continue pushing. Uh, that hashtag is just amazing what's happening with it right now. It's just escalating and escalating. So thank you so much. Keep going. You guys are doing a great job. Yeah, and that is a really great point. And your article um, is really important for people to tweet, again, not because of the fact that, you know, you wrote it or, or are like promoting it, but because it lays out all of the reasons that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange need support and that we uh, must support them. So I think if you have family or friends that don't know a lot about Assange or that they, you know, are on the fence about him, you know, if, if you're explaining the situation that he's currently in, provide Susie's article to them so they can understand how important WikiLeaks and Assange are and all of the ways that they have been targeted. So, but uh, moving on with some questions, um, one of which um, the first one I'm looking at relates directly to uh, Susie's article because it asks what is Julian's current state of health? And if you, um, you know, if you read Susie's article, it will go into depth on a little bit of that. There have been records that have been released by WikiLeaks that discuss that. And I don't know if Susie wants to speak about it, but um, from my memory of reading the article, it's, um, you know, he has some, some health issues that need tending to that are not being seen to, that cannot be uh, remedied when he's in the embassy. You know, he needs uh, uh, dental work. He needs a uh, CAT scan or an, MRI, sorry, an MRI scan on his shoulder. So, you know, that is another infringement on his human rights is his right to medical care and attention. You know, even somebody in prison would not be um, subjected to this level of lack of health care that Assange is going through. So that's a really important point, and it's it's just you know it's it's important alongside um, his right to free speech being re restored. So I think that answers um, that question from um, I believe from Facebook. But I have a question now for Kim from Stephanie Chateau on YouTube. She said, uh, "You seem very not knowledgeable on the law. Isn't the first rule of legal proceedings assurance of non-bias? So how is Arbonaut's defense contractor ties not a problem?" And that goes back to obviously the UK um, 
you know, upholding the arrest warrant against Assange and the corruption uh, there with a the magistrate involved. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a very clear evidence of a conflict of interest. Uh, that judge should never have been sitting on the case uh, simply because the husband of that judge uh, is working in the intelligence community with the former MI6 uh, leader. And uh, obviously, as you could see in her judgment and in the whole tone of it, uh, it was a predetermined matter. Uh, the language was quite aggressive against Julian. Uh, almost uh, uh, done in a way to insult him uh, and to insult his supporters. And uh, the reason for that is because when the deep state wants to win a case, they shop for the right judge. That is what they do. Do not think that the judiciary is immune to these types of uh, attacks it happens all the time. It happened in my case many times when, when, whenever the attorney general uh, uh, wanted to have an outcome here in New Zealand, uh, he would make sure that judges would sit on my case that are friendly to him, that uh, you know, then uh, weeks later uh, get a promotion to be a, a, a judge at a higher court uh, or other types of rewards like a knighthood or, you know, titles. Uh, they do this kind of stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a shame because they don't even hide it. I mean, it's so obvious what is going on here. Any observer who looks at this uh, case uh, recently in the UK courts can tell that this isn't right, you know, that uh, this should, this woman should not have been sitting on that case. Uh, and it, it was allowed to happen. And the government uh, in Great Britain, they don't really care about the law. They don't really care about uh, human rights or international law or treaties. Uh, all they care about is winning. And they will win at all costs because their big boss uh, across the ocean in the United States is telling them what they expect and what they what they want. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's quite serious for Julian because he is up against, you know, uh, two powerful uh, governments. Sweden has now dropped out of the picture, fortunately, after so many years of being part of this whole circus against Julian. Uh, but, you know, he's still up against two very powerful opponents. And they know, Great Britain and the United States government know that if Julian is allowed to leave the embassy and find his freedom in Ecuador, that they are losing this uh, tool of torturing him, of keeping him confined. Uh, and they are also doing it because they can control completely his communications. They uh, put so much surveillance effort into finding out what Julian's next move is that that entire house has been bucked 20 times over. I don't think there's any other real estate in the world that has more bugs and is, is more scrutinized by surveillance uh, than uh, Julian's uh, current home. Absolutely. And there are questions just piling in right now that are really fantastic, um, one of which is um, for Kim. And it says, how did uh, Julian help you? It's from Adam. And Adam Holt, and he says, Kim, how has Julian helped you in regards to your court case in New Zealand for the copyright? Uh, and then he, you know, he says the, for the copyright bullshit. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, so first of all, description. yeah. First of all, Julian has helped me by opening my eyes. I uh, talked about that a bit uh, earlier in the stream. I said that. Um, you know, I was living in my happy bubble. I was doing really well with my business. And then this collateral murder video came along. 
and I watched it and I was just so shocked and so upset uh, that this is happening. And it opened my eyes because it sparked my interest and I started reading more. I really thought, you know, I need to educate myself better. I need to understand more about what's going on. And then all the cables were released, uh, you know, the diplomatic cables and all uh, the documents uh, that followed. And, you know, the more you read about what they are actually doing and how they are lying to us, the governments around the world and their, their intelligence communities, the more disgusted you get. And they are doing it with an arrogance uh, that is, uh, you know, it's, it's just incredible. They break the law all the time and they, they keep getting away with it. And I got this sense very quickly, you know, it's one law for them, one law for us. It's, you know, everything they do is for commercial interest. It's never about peace or democracy or achieving freedom somewhere, giving people freedom. It's all bullshit. It's all a war machinery for profit. You know, every single war is for profit. It's not about, uh, you know, the United States going somewhere and, you know, we are the good guys, we're helping you guys. You know, it's not at all. When the warehouses in the U.S. are full of rockets and torpedoes and bombs and weapons, they need to be emptied. That is the reality of the war for business. OK, and when they are all empty, then we have a year or a couple of years until all these weapons have to be manufactured again. The warehouses stacking up, stacking up until they are full with weapons and then we go to war again. That is really what's going on. It's business, you know, and when you have someone like Julian explain this to you in their own words, it's not him saying, oh, it's my opinion or, you know, this is what I think. He is giving it to us in their own words with their own documents. And that is the most powerful uh, uh, truth because it's what they actually say behind closed doors with their top secret labels under national security. And once you see these things and you understand what's really going on, uh, you just, you're disgusted. And I was disgusted, you know? And then of course, Julian helped me uh, with my case because just like everyone who has half a brain, uh, you know, he could see that this case is a piece of uh, crap, you know? They went after me because I became a WikiLeaks supporter and a large donor to WikiLeaks. I gave a lot of money to WikiLeaks because I wanted them to continue their great work. And then the copyright case, you know, was really just the way in to, to persecute me and to destroy me as a WikiLeaks supporter, you know? Don't believe for a minute that a civil copyright case can be the reason for a paramilitary raid with 72 armed cops, half of them anti-terror troops with silenced Bushmaster rifles flying in to a residential property with two helicopters and uh, arresting everyone at gunpoint and scaring everyone to death and screaming bombs, bombs, where are the bombs? I mean, holy crap, these people have done that in a copyright case. And it was never about copyright. It was always about punishing that guy who helped WikiLeaks. You know, this is a deep state persecution that I'm uh, uh, subject to. And unfortunately, the New Zealand government under John Key, the former government, was completely corrupt in going along with it. You know, they wanted to curry favor with the United States. They wanted to get good back into the good graces after the non-nuclear stands. You know, they wanted Hollywood to do more movies here. So it was a win-win situation for them. They didn't care about my human rights, my rights at all. You know, it didn't matter that uh, my wife almost miscarried. She was seven months pregnant with, with twins when they did this to us. 
And then when she had contractions from the stress and the fear, they didn't even call an ambulance for three That's hours. So you know? evil, they, absolutely they, despicable. You know wow. what? I'm going to share a few things about this way, which I haven't shared with anybody yet. When I was sitting there and, uh, you know, after I was, you know, arrested and they, they took me down to the, to the living room, I asked to call a lawyer. They didn't let me call a lawyer for an hour, which is ridiculous. I mean, in a situation like that, uh, you know, you don't talk to me or ask me questions or uh, try and interrogate me without me having a lawyer there. That is, uh, you know, a principle of law in any country. But then even worse, while I was sitting there, uh, all these cops were running through my home and were pointing at things, pointing at a, a large TV or uh, at a painting and, and looking at me and asking, well, how much is this and how much is that? And, and laughing and joking. And, you know, basically, uh, you know, when I sat there, I had a feeling that these guys were having fun and they were enjoying it. And it reminded me of this collateral murder video where they just killed all these people and they don't see the human being. They don't see the family that is uh, being exposed to a kind of terror that we never knew. We didn't have any idea that, you know, uh, people would run at you with, with machine guns and, and scream bombs and, and yell at everyone and, and, and may force them into the ground. I have little kids. They witnessed all of that. You know, my son was peeing into the bed for five years you know, after this, this is how much it affected him. You know, my uh, kids uh, were traumatized by the experience, but they don't care about any of that. You know, they, 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 they did this whole thing and they were enjoying it. For them, it was a game. They had fun. There was no consideration about my pregnant wife or my children or even the risk of landing a helicopter right in front of my courtyard, uh, you know, if anything would have gone wrong, people would have died, you know? And all of it for a civil copyright case. Because here's what we know today. In New Zealand, under New Zealand law, even if you take the allegations of the United States at face value, which you can't because the USDOJ is a bunch of lying pricks, right? But even if you could, under New Zealand law, it's completely not criminal. It's only a civil matter. There's even a safe harbor law in New Zealand that says no internet service provider can be responsible criminally at all for the actions of their users, you know? So, and this is why we will win. Ultimately, we will win the extradition matter. There will be no extradition because that is the law. And, you know, they've tried to maneuver it and, 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 and hack it and fix it and try and find a way to still get the extradition going. But in the end, they will fail because there's just no pathway to make that happen. And when that all becomes clear and the judgment comes out that there will be no extradition, finally, I hope that the New Zealand public will demand answers and will make sure over a lengthy and detailed investigative process that all of it, the entire truth comes out and that everyone, yeah, everyone can, can see what happened here and that hopefully it will never happen again to anybody else. Kim, before we uh, move on, I really, I have one short question from Bobby who says they had their top secret clearance suspended after vocally supporting Snowden 2013. So what can somebody like them do to help? I thought that was really interesting to hear. Well, anyone in the intelligence community who says anything positive about Julian or Snowden, they lose their jobs, you know? There's just no tolerance <clears throat> for them. I know that there are more Snowdens. I know there are more people inside the intelligence community 
that see what's going on. And, uh, you know, a lot of them have ethics. They are <coughs> morally challenged by being part of the wrong that these intelligence organizations are doing. And uh, I would, wouldn't be surprised at all if we will find out more, if there will be more Snowdens down the road and, uh, you know, more leaks uh, are coming out. Uh, but, you know, the intelligence community, and this is the sick uh, part about it, is full of good people. There are a lot of really good people that think they are doing the right thing because they are being lied to, just like the public. There's a handful of people that have an agenda that uh, go through the revolving door after their intelligence community career is over. They become, uh, you know, executives in these companies that they have actually uh, generated the profits for, the war machinery, you know. That's why every single time, you know, you see someone a senior retire from the CIA or the NSA, they are picked up immediately by these large government contractors that are building the weapons, building the private uh, contractors in, in the intelligence business, and they make millions, you know, and they are basically getting rewarded for all the lying and all the damage that they have done while they were the leaders of uh, those uh, deep state agencies. The analyst who's sitting at his computer and is tasked with finding out information about threats and, you know, uh, developing tools to, to, you know, penetrate communication systems or computers. They think they're doing the right thing. They think it's for an honest uh, purpose, but they are being lied to just like we are being lied to by our media, you know? So you can't really blame everyone who is working in those environments uh, for what's going on. But here's the good news. More and more people are waking up to this. You know, they kind of feel it. They had a sense for it. But now with everything, thanks to WikiLeaks, thanks to Snowden, thanks to Vault 7, thanks to, you know, Intercept and all the things that are, that are coming out, more and more people, including in the intelligence community, are waking up to the abuses of power and they realize that this will not work out forever. This cannot continue. You know, sooner or later, this is all going to come to an end. And we can make sure it happens sooner when we have people like Julian Assange who are telling us the truth. Because if we don't know, there's nothing we can do about it. But if we know and we all become aware of the games that the deep state is playing with people and how they are directing the tax dollars uh, from the people into the pockets of the war profiteers. You know, once the people realize that and more and more are doing it every day, uh, then, uh, you know, we will be able to elect people and to change the system in a way that doesn't allow them to do that anymore. And that is the biggest fear, really, of the deep state and, and why they hate the Internet and why they hate a guy like Julian Assange, who is a one uh, a guy who, who, who has you know, access to all this information that is so damaging to them. But at the end of the day, when you look at it all, it is the truth that he is reporting. You know, it is not an opinion. He is reporting the truth. He's reporting their own words. And when you spend even just a day to really look at the most popular documents on WikiLeaks and you actually take the time and read them, you, you are enlightened. You know, it's like opening this book full of truth and you read it and you go, my God, I had no idea. This is terrible. Why are we doing this? How is our tax money going into all of the stuff? And they're telling us we can't have a good healthcare system. We can't have a good education system because all of our money is going into the pockets of billionaires that wage wars around the world that kill millions of innocent civilians. 
You know, once you understand what's really going on, uh, you know, you become enlightened. And it's thanks to Julian Assange that we are having access to this information. Absolutely. Can I just jump in for a second there, Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, Kim, I don't know that you ever get to hear this enough. I know that the Prime Minister of New Zealand apologised to you, but I'm not sure how much meaning that had for you. I know it wouldn't have a lot for me. I just wanted to say, hearing the stories of the suffering of the people around you, we know what we've seen what you've been put through, but what you've just confided in us gives it new meaning, really, what your children have been through and, and what your wife went through. I just want to say personally that I'm really sorry for that because I'm mm. a mother and so that hits me really hard. I know how our families are made to suffer. Families of targets are made to suffer in horrific ways. So I just want to say I'm sorry for that. I also wanted to just point out um, an answer to that question that was asked about Julian's support for Kim, that Julian has showed solidarity for Kim. That is why Julian supports Kim. It is the solidarity of one deep state target for another deep state target. And that is why Julian has done what he can to support Kim over the years, because Julian was fully aware that it was an unjust persecution of Kim, just as Julian is right now in front of our eyes, still being unjustly persecuted. I also just quickly wanted to show you guys a little bit of good news. And that is, I've just been sent another set of metrics for the hashtag. We are now up to over 40 million impressions on the hash reconnect Julian hashtag with 72.8 tweets a minute, 4,281 Twitter accounts have participated in the hashtag so far with nearly 10,000 total tweets. And this is just what's been captured by this one dashboard. So fantastic and amazing that the, the hashtag ha is now in fact trending on Twitter. And so I think those numbers will become even more astronomical as the night goes on. Um, go ahead, Elizabeth. I'm going to take a break just to make one more call, and then we're going to bring on some other panellists who we have that have joined us now. Thank okay. you so much, everybody, for your support. Um, Susie, one question, if you're, if you're able to answer one short, very short question before you leave. Um, someone sure. asked, um, is reconnect Assange a legitimate hashtag to use or should we only use reconnect oh. Julian? Because um, I have seen that a number of people are tweeting reconnect Assange as well. So any thoughts on that? It's, it's quite a common occurrence when you have a, a social media campaign like this that people will use different variations. If you want to contribute to the trending hashtag and you want to help to build the stats on this, please use hash reconnect Julian. But really you can use whatever hashtag that you like. Just, just keep hash reconnect Julian in there as well. Awesome. Yeah, and then we have another very short question that I can answer right off the bat really easily. They said, who exactly cut off in uh, Julian's internet access? And uh, obviously that was the Ecuadorian embassy on behalf of the uh, Ecuadorian government that did that. They um, they released a statement on it and they said that he was it was because he was interfering in the um, affairs of, of a state again. And as Kim mentioned, um, that's very much in relation to, um, assumedly, their, uh, Julian's support of the Catalonian people and, and um, his coverage of the unfair treatment of the Catalan uh, populace. So that's a very quick answer to that. Um, one thing to point out, uh, I think that is uh, quite important. Um, Julian and I, and I don't think a lot of people know this, and that's why we know that uh, we are all part of a deep state persecution, WikiLeaks as well as WikiLeaks supporters. Julian and I are, have been charged uh, by the same prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, as well as Edward Snowden. What does Kim.com, the copyright guy, <laughs> have to do uh, in, this, uh, in this venue? You know, it's because that is where the 300 man task force sits that is fighting 
to destroy WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and all of WikiLeaks supporters. You know, it is the, the hotbed of the intelligence community. That district uh, does all the terrorist cases and everything that is of national security interest to the United States. My case uh, is, uh, uh, has been initiated and was run by the same team that went after uh, Julian with a grand jury. Uh, and you know the same people that want to extradite Julian are the people that want to extradite me. If I was a copyright case, well, why would they uh, deal with me in, in, in the deep state uh, department of the, of the Department of Justice? Because that is where my case is uh, dealt with. Okay, that's awesome. Good to know. Um, then Leonard Sel Selche, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your, your name correctly. They asked, is WikiLeaks getting ready for another drop? And then they mention uh, HRC raw vid 55. I'm not sure what that means, but um, I don't think, you know, I, I have no idea. I, you know, hand this over to Kim, but I don't think that we can say whether or not that something like that would have had any sort of um, impact on this decision to cut Assange's internet. Um, you know, with Julian, you always have to be prepared that there's the next big release. And, you know, often for Julian, it's also about timing. You know, uh, he, will, he will take his time to review documents and to find the important pieces and then to roll uh, the information out in a way that uh, it is guaranteed to get attention for a longer time. And Julian has been very good at uh, rolling out information. So I wouldn't uh, be surprised at all uh, if Julian has access to some, you know, interesting information. But unfortunately, his current situation uh, has played him into a corner where the Ecuadorian government has asked him, Julian, to sign an agreement with them and to say, to basically guarantee uh, that he is not going to do anything uh, that is going to affect, uh, you know, the relationship between Ecuador and other countries. And uh, they have kind of gagged him with this agreement. They have kind of put him in a position where if he says anything, even just a tweet about the, the Catalan president, that you know he will lose his connectivity so you can be quite sure that he has been um very careful with what he's publishing i'm pretty sure he's sitting on a couple of big releases uh, but the ecuadorian government said look we are making this effort now uh, we are giving you a citizenship we are giving you diplomatic immunity let us do our work uh, diplomatically to try and get you out of here. And while we are doing this, we want you to slow down, you know? And I'm pretty sure he has honored that and he is sitting on a couple of big releases. Uh, and, uh, you know, the reason why they cut off his internet now wasn't the release of any secret uh, documents. It was simply because he stood up for the Catalan president who has been arrested in Germany and is facing extradition to Spain. And then certain multi-decade uh, prison sentences. Uh, and that is just, you know, he, he's not the kind of guy who's quiet about that stuff. That is completely unfair, totally unjust. They trapped... Uh, this this guy um, by first abandoning a European arrest warrant and saying, ah, we don't need this anymore. You know, uh, we're fine with the situation the way it is. And then this guy travels to Finland uh, to give a speech and to be part, uh, you know, in, in, in political uh, discussions. And then they reinstate, Spain reinstates uh, uh, the European arrest wants to trick him and to leave there. And then they wait just when he crosses into Germany in Northern Germany from Denmark into Germany 
to arrest him because they think the Germans are just going to deliver this guy on a silver platter like they did in 1940 with the other Catalan president who was then executed. And, you know, for Julian to point this out is the right thing to do. And if Ecuador thinks that Julian doesn't have the right to do that because of some gagging agreement that they have put on, on him, then they are wrong. He's entitled to his opinion. He's entitled to tell us what he thinks about this. And all he's basically saying is that this is Spain persecuting an entire group of people that all they want is self-determination. How can you not give it to them, you know? And uh, Ecuador is just as bad as Spain, the UK, and the United States if they continue... Uh, uh, interfering in the free speech of Julian Assange because he's done nothing wrong. He's done nothing to breach uh, this agreement. Absolutely. Amazing points. Really good answer to that question. And the next one I have on my list is from Absolute Katie. And she asked, um, do you think this pressure on Ecuador and silencing Assange today has anything to do with the pressure on other countries to expel Russian diplomats? And I think we've kind of gotten a partial answer. I think this is more to do with Spain than it is, um, you know, pressure regarding Russia. But um, do you have any thoughts on that at all, Kim? Yeah, I would agree. It's uh, it's it's uh, primarily Spain because if you look at the the Twitter activity from Julian over the last few days, it was really about uh, this uh, arrest in Germany, and there wasn't much other stuff, anything that would have been like a new release. So the closeness. Uh, uh, in in the timeline of Julian speaking out. Uh, you know, for the Catalan president um, and now the, the cutting of his uh, internet connection, I think are totally uh, obviously re related. Yeah, I think it's really great to point that out. And I remember uh, when Assange was really advocating not only for the leaders of the Catalonian freedom uh, and self-determination movement, but also pointing out that the crackdown in Spain that resulted from their um, wish collectively to get, gain self-determination, um, you know, really exposed the hypocrisy of the West and the idea of the West having this, um, you know, love of freedom and democracy when um, the EU allowed Spain to really crack down on the Catalonians. Um, without even issuing any sort of statement saying, you know, hey, maybe, you know, beating old ladies in the street isn't a good idea. So I um, think what, what triggered this outrage in Spain that led uh, to Ecuador doing this is a video that Julian tweeted about protesters uh, that were against this arrest in Germany. And then the security forces, the police, shooting live rounds from shotguns into the air to intimidate the protesters who came there peacefully, but to intimidate them and shock them and scare them uh, to uh, dis disband and uh, uh, get out of there. And once the state does that, you know, and they shoot live rounds, the next step is really just shooting at the people. And imagine if that happens, there will be a civil war. You know, the situation in Catalonia is already boiling hot. All it takes is one spark for that whole situation to explode into violence and potentially, uh, uh, you know, civil war. Um, and for Julian to point out that the Spanish government and the police is taking this risk so lightly and is shooting live rounds at, uh, just above the heads of protesters, uh, I think is very important. You know, it's important for people to see how ridiculous it is for Spain to take this risk, to take the risk that might cause the bloodshed of thousands of people. You know, how can they not brief their uh, police and their security uh, services better to make sure 
that there should be a non-violent approach to these protesters and that they should not shoot uh, above their heads. Because imagine if one of the protesters mistakes this as actually getting shot at and has a weapon and says, you know, I have enough, I'm going to shoot back now. We have war. The situation there is so boiling hot. We will have war. And for Julian to point this out and to show to the world that this is what's going on and how unfair it is, you know, that is what triggered Spain to go crazy. And I wouldn't be surprised if the king himself picked up the phone because we know exactly where he stands on Catalonia. He hates the whole thing. His um, empire. Queen. Yeah. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, but just to be fair, um, this might be entirely conjecture on the part of The Guardian, but The Guardian has just published an article and they're claiming that the reason that Julian's internet was cut off was about his scruple tweets about the, recent, about the recent poisoning. I'm actually going to just take you through this article now because I think that this is an important development in the case. So here we go. I'm just going to share screen and I'll read this for everybody. So this is an article by The Guardian that's come out today. Um, they are referencing Ecuador's official statement confirming that, yes, they have cut off Julian's communication. It says, the move came after Assange tweeted on Monday challenging Britain's accusation that Russia was responsible for the nerve agent poisoning of a Russian former double agent and his daughter in the English city of Salisbury early that, earlier this month. The WikiLeaks founder also questioned the decision by the UK and more than 20 other countries to retaliate against the poisoning by expelling Russian diplomats deemed spies. Assange has lived in the embassy since June 2012 to avoid extradition to Sweden over allegations of sex crimes that he denies, blah, blah, blah. Sweden has dropped the case, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, but that is complete uh, speculation. I on the agree. Part of the I agree. I agree. Uh, with the, there's no confirmation at all that Ecuador uh, has taken this as a reason. Their closeness to Russia is non-existent. Ecuador and Russia, you know, their relations are, are minimal, uh, whereas Ecuador and Spain are much uh, closer and uh, uh, you know, much more relevant, uh, especially with this recent arrest of the uh, Catalonian president. So I don't believe this at all. This is this is a nice spin uh, from the Guardian. We know that we can't believe the Guardian. They write a lot of crap all the time. Um, in my mind, uh, it has to do with uh, the situation in Spain, simply because of the much closer ties between. Ecuador and Spain. And let's just talk for a minute about the allegation of uh, a poisoning with a nerve agent in Great Britain. I find it uh, surprising, to say the least, that the British government, within basically two, three days of the attack, coming out, pointing the finger at Russia, and the only reason that they give uh, for, for this allegation is that they say the nerve agent was originally made in Russia. Now, what we know today is that the recipe for the nerve agent has been published by the chemist who created it. So anyone can create this nerve agent. Um, and we also know that samples of the nerve agent uh, uh, went missing because, uh, you know, in the 80s, uh, they were used for uh, poisoning attacks and so on, and a lot of vials were never found. So no one can, with certainty, point the finger at Russia at this stage. It's premature. And all that Russia has asked uh, Great Britain to do is to send them a sample of the nerve agent that was found at the site uh, where it was used. And the British government refused to do that. Now, for the sake of having an open and fair investigation 
in which the alleged party can participate, why the hell wouldn't you send them a sample, you know? And it's just Julian who has so much knowledge about false narratives, about the motivations be behind this allegation by the UK and by the US, you know, to attack uh, Putin. Um, you know, he has so much knowledge about their common themes of doing things over and over again that are just not true, that he calls right away, he calls out what's wrong with the allegation and how you cannot just act on this allegation unless you provide more evidence and they haven't done it. And then the UK government goes uh, into a full out diplomatic war, expelling everyone and asking all their allies uh, in Europe and in the United States to do the same. Where is the evidence that shows that this nerve agent was used by Russia to kill, uh, you know, to target this family? I, I completely agree with you that The Guardian is probably, um, or if anything, even the UK is trying to take credit publicly for having been so powerful and influential as to, to be able to cut off uh, Sanders' communications. I also do note that the original statement I read at the beginning of the stream by Brian Eno and Yaranis Varoufakis was explicit in, in their statement that they believe that this is about Julian's um, support for Catalan and for Catalonian leaders. Uh, I would also say that that, is, that was the basis on which his internet was cut off the last time, was actually uh, ar around similar issues. So... For me, though, I actually don't think it matters why. I actually don't think it matters why or whatever the official reasons are for why this has been done. He has a human right to freedom of speech. He has a human right to freedom of communication. And it is inhumane to prevent him from having access to his family, his loved ones, to his supporters or lawyers or to the public. So I think that we need to be really clear that no matter what reason, supposed reason, this was done for, that it's wrong and that his, his right to communication needs to be restored to him effective immediately. I tell you what I think has happened here with uh, the British government now so strongly uh, alleging that Russia did this attack. I'm pretty sure, based on all the evidence and all the uh, hearings that took place uh, in the UK about Litvinenko, the guy who was poisoned with polonium, I'm pretty sure that that was a Russian hit job and that the evidence is, is, is crystal clear. The, the people who were behind that, who delivered the agent uh, to, uh, uh, you know, Great Britain and then poisoned this former spy uh, and then returned to Russia and, and, and got rewarded with, uh, you know, becoming a member of parliament and Duma and, and, and being, uh, you know, uh, treated uh, nicely by the Russian uh, government. Uh, I think the Litvinenko case is 100% Russia and uh, probably authorized by Putin. And now they are using this, this latest attack, to basically get payback for what was done to Litvinenko, where they all know it was the Russians. So in their mind, it is justified uh, to now either create a situation where they have another event where they can uh, blame Russia or more likely not knowing exactly who's behind this attack, but because of past attacks uh, uh, that where they just know for a fact that it was Russia, they are now punishing them many years later for having done that. And, and morally, they feel justified in doing that. And in a way... Uh, you know, you need to accept that what Russia has done to Litvinenko is an absolute atrocity. Uh, you know, Russia needs to be punished 
for this type of uh, uh, crime. And if the British government is now using this latest uh, uh, attack, even without conclusive evidence to to enforce that and 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 do that punishment you can kind of see where they are coming from you know i'm speculating but i i'm i'm you know quite knowledgeable about all these things so you know for me it's something that makes sense where you can make sense of uh, the current situation yeah and this is also an attack on the freedom of the press because assange is a journalist wikileaks is a journalistic publication and so this is in addition to the amazing point Susie made about his freedom of speech as a human being, you know, as a journalist, this is an attack on his freedom to uh, speak out as a journalist. So hand it back to Susie. I just wanted to say that because I think we forget that Wikileaks is a journalistic entity as well. Yeah, that's very valid. And I would hope that there will be large numbers of media organisations and free press organisations speaking out, you know, in the coming times about this. Okay, guys, we are in the very unique position of being able to speak with someone who was just with Julian at the embassy in the last week. Uh, Her name is Cassandra Fairbanks. Many of you would have heard of her. She is a journalist who has been covering WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and advocating for Julian for a number of years. Um, I I would just like to point out something We have a number of people coming on with us tonight who are from completely different political ideologies and different political spheres. And that is okay and good. And I want people to understand that if you support Julian, it actually doesn't matter what your political ideology or affiliation is. We are congregating here on this stream so that we can show our solidarity for him. So you can expect to see people from the left wing, from the right wing, and from, quite frankly, no wing here tonight. I'm really pleased to have Cass with us. Cass, are you unmuted now? Oh, I've got you. Here you go. Say hi to everyone. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I actually hadn't publicly said anywhere that I visited Julian, but I guess now that that's out of the bag, that it was... Yeah, very nice to actually meet him in person. Yeah, it's an incredible opportunity. I know he's someone that when you speak to, you can learn an immense amount from because he's just so knowledgeable. Cass, I'd really like you to talk to us about how it was that you first came across WikiLeaks, what it is that has um, that has formed this connection for you with WikiLeaks, why you've advocated for them so strongly and how you feel about what has happened, what's happened to him now. Um, Well, I first got into WikiLeaks years and years ago. Um, It was around the same time as everybody else, probably, you know, when the collateral murder video came out. Um, I was a huge anti-war advocate. And this, it just blew my mind actually seeing it and seeing somebody doing something and publishing these things that you normally wouldn't see from the press. Um, And I have just... I've been a supporter ever since. I think that they do the most important work um, out of any publication in history. And um, I think it's horrible what's happening to him right now. Um, I mean, Ecuador is wonderful for having, you know, protected him for so long, but I wish that they um, would give him back his voice. (laughs) because that's a horrible, horrible thing to take from somebody, especially when you have so many people, powerful people and powerful governments and nations that want you dead, um, not being able to confirm his safety or his well-being or his health um, himself to, to the people who care about him is a really dangerous thing. Um, yeah. So what, do you want to see, what do you want to see happen from here, Cass? Well, I, I don't even think Ecuador should be in this position. Assange should be free. He has done nothing different than any other newspaper or publication or journalist worth their salt. Like he shouldn't, he, Ecuador shouldn't even have to be in this position. Um, you know, Donald Trump has the power to pardon him preemptively, even though there's technically no um, public charges. Um, it's rare, but it's happened. Um, Richard Nixon was granted one. 
and then he would be able to travel safely to Ecuador or wherever he needed to get. And this is something even Donald Trump's lawyers have advocated for this because Donald Trump is currently being sued by a bunch of former Obama lawyers. And in the filings, they've been quietly defending WikiLeaks, <laughs> which is bizarre and it's self-serving because it's, you know, to save Trump's own butt. But um, the points that they make are very valid. Um, they've argued that WikiLeaks um, passes the Bartnecki First Amendment test, which says that a publication can publish stolen or leaked uh, material, even if it was obtained Ill completely illegally, no matter what, as long as the person publishing it is not the one who stole it and that it's of newsworthy or that it's newsworthy material. They also argued that um, this covers the entire public the entire publication, not just the certain emails that are you know, exceptionally newsworthy because it's, it applies in bulk. Um, they also had argued, let me see, I have that right here, that um, publications are, let's see, protected um, from publishing, if they publish truthful speech, like they can't be prosecuted for publishing truthful speech. And, um, they wrote that punishing truthful publication in the name, name of privacy is an extraordinary measure. So this is Donald Trump's own lawyers have been arguing this. It's There's no reason why Trump shouldn't issue a pardon. And then Ecuador wouldn't even be in this position and everybody could be happy. <laughs> so that's what I'd like to see. And sorry, I'm super awkward. <laughs> I hate cameras. <laughs> You're fine. Don't worry. It took me five or six years of filming interviews with other people before I actually ever put myself on in the frame. Yeah. I am really interested to know what you, how important you feel WikiLeaks is, how, how invaluable a service it is to us, but particularly what are the dangers, you know, if, if the situation isn't resolved, if we just sit quietly and do nothing, what are the dangers, you know, to humanity, to the press, but also to humanity? I mean, this is, this is hugely important to the press. Every single journalist in the world should be outraged by what's going on because they could be next. I mean, what he's published is no different than what Buzzfeed or Washington Post or New York Times has published. I mean, that stupid dossier that Buzzfeed published, I mean, that if, if Julian Assange can be imprisoned and have his voice taken away, why, sh why couldn't they? Why aren't they next, you know? Um, it's, it's really important that people like stand up and defend him. He's, he's been fighting for all of us. We should be fighting for him. And that especially goes for the press. It's absolutely shameful that every news anchor, every reporter is not screaming from the rooftops right now. So, um, yeah. And, and the fact that, um, you know, as you're saying, Trump's lawyers are for Assange, uh, they're defending Assange that uh, meanwhile, the CIA uh, is completely after his life. I think that really shows the power of the unelected, you know, military interests in our government and the fact that it doesn't really matter what the president wants. If, if Assange is against the military industrial complex, then they will still go after him. I think that really exposes them, um, more than maybe it would be otherwise, so. I just heard that Caitlin Johnston is in the chat. Hi, Caitlin. Yeah. Oh, Caitlin, we, Caitlin, we so much want to see you in here. I'm very interested in what you've got to say as you're yet another extremely significant journalist who's done a massive amount of work circulating WikiLeaks uh, publications and also talking about the importance of Julian and of WikiLeaks. It's amazing. Um, your work is incredible and inspiring. So please, I hope that you reach out and DM and, and come and join the Zoom if you would like to. Cassandra, um, tell us about your friendship with Julian. He's shared your work for a number of years. There's a very select group of journalists whose work he has shared. Um, over the years, it, I consider it to be my singular biggest achievement journalistically that Julian has shared my work in a year in and year out. And I've often said that to me, it's more significant to get a retweet by Julian than it is to win a Pulitzer Prize. And I very much believe that to be the case. Uh, so tell us how, how it's made you feel that he has raised you up and promoted your work 
and how it is that, that you've gotten to know him? Um, well, yeah, every time that he's ever retweeted me, I'm always, you know, turned into a cartoon hard eyes. Like I adore him. And so getting, knowing that he thinks something is worth sharing that I've worked on is a huge honor. It makes my day every time. I just, I idolize him. I think he's the most important man in the world. So yeah, it's, it's a great, great honor. Um, he, it's always very appreciated. I just, I reached out to him years ago and we've just chatted here and there. Um, a couple months ago, I asked if I could come up out to London and he said yes. And I went out and it was great. It was really nice meeting him finally. And he was exactly as you would expect. <laughs> so it felt like I already knew him though. So it was a little strange, but I don't know. <laughs> I think it's really easy to, for people to forget when they see such a high profile person that they are a real human being. And it's so easy for them to think, oh, this person just has a profile because they're an agent of ABC XYZ. It's just completely untrue. Julian's profile is the result of his extremely hard work and his risk taking. I often hear the same thing about Snowden, the same types of criticisms. And even lately, I've been hearing similar things about myself. But the reality is that we, our, our profile is actually organic. Nobody, you know, pulled me out of nowhere and, sit and put me all over the world's papers. It, it's only my own audience as a result of my own work. WikiLeaks audience has been developed over a decade as a result of their hard work, incredibly hard work, and their very serious risk taking. Same with Snowden. Snowden's hard work and his risk taking is the reason why he's become a significant media figure. It's not actually some conspiracy behind the scenes like people tend to think that it is. Um, your work also, you've, you have developed a large following, but it's an organic following that um, has come over a number of years. How has that felt like for you for going from, you know, journalist on the ground at actions to uh, where you are now? Um, it's certainly been weird. <laughs> Um, it's a, a very strange feeling, you know, sometimes people come up and ask for selfies and I'm such an awkward, like, homebody weirdo that it's just a, it's, it's become a very strange thing. Um, it's great, though, like, you know, I was an activist before I ever started writing. And so it's cool to have this platform where I can reach thousands and thousands of people compared to like when I was you know a teenager holding a sign outside of a circus by myself and hoping that maybe three or four people saw it um so it's it's great um I don't know <laughs> but then there's obviously the downside to it too which is obviously that you're subjected to risk and subjected to criticism. I think that nobody in the world has been more criticized than Julian. Certainly no one in the world has been more smeared uh, than Julian. What's that been like for you to witness? Um, it's horrible. I get intensely defensive as you guys all do too. So I, I get more angry when people are critical of him than when they're critical of me, <laughs> because I just, he's done so much for everyone. I mean, everything that he's ever done has been so hugely important. And for people to degrade that or claim that he's some kind of operative or make up these outrageous things, it's, it's really disheartening. And it's hard to watch because, you know, he's very capable of defending himself, but it, you, you can't help but want to just, you know, punch people through the internet, which you can't do. <laughs> so definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, how are we going with questions from chat? Oh, wow. There are a lot of questions. Let me just check the etherpad real fast. Um, a number of them we didn't answer earlier, but they were generally on the same trend of, you know, how can we get internet to him? Can we give him a Wi-Fi hotspot? You know, a number of people have asked that. And I think that's been pretty well answered at this point. So um, another, um, Imagine All asks, um, how do we know if Julian is safe one, uh, and okay since he has no phone or visitors now? And so, and then another, that um, also goes for a number of questions about, you know, proof of life and all this sort of thing that really mushroomed into a problem the last time Julian's internet was cut. So I don't know if any of you have thoughts on that, but I remember that, yeah. 
that Julian said it was a black PR campaign when that proof of life stuff really mushroomed out of control. But well, Cass is proof that he was alive last week. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does have um, a lawyer with him right now. Oh, that is really good to know. Right, and so- that doesn't count as a visitor apparently, so that's really good. And I've spoke with him today, so I know Fantastic. that Julian is definitely okay right now. So. That is really, really fantastic to hear. And thank you for giving us that update. Um, I know also that the Courage Foundation, like I said earlier, is about to put out a formal press statement, um, which should give us all some more information too about Julian's situation. So we'll keep an eye out for that. And then I'll read it on the stream as soon as it comes out. Um, Cass, do you have any questions for Kim? Or Kim, do you have any questions for Cass? No, but it's so nice to sort of meet you. <laughs> yeah. Kim, you're muted. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> nice to meet you too, Cass. I actually just watched the documentary about you on the plane while I was going to London. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the uh, caught in the web. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like it? I thought it was really good. It's terrible it happened to you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, it's just the first chapter. The second chapter will be a bit more uplifting. Okay. Because that's when we win and uh, we take the deep state down. Good. Can't wait. <laughs> so um, you have been uh, with Julian. What I'm uh, you know, personally always most interested in is uh, how... Is he coping? How, you know, how is his spirit? Uh, do you feel that uh, there's still fire uh, in him and uh, energy? Is it, is it, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how, how he is? Yeah, he was, I mean, he definitely needs some sunshine. <laughs> but <laughs> he seemed to be in good spirits. He was sharp. He was, you know, brilliant. Um, he, I learned a lot from him. He was very, you know, as intelligent and sharp. There's no other way to describe it as you would expect. I mean, he's very well-spoken. He seemed to be doing well. The people at the embassy, the staff were extremely nice, super polite. They were really, um, they seemed to really like him. So that was good to see. Um, there were protesters outside at this random hour when I went um, so that was also really nice to see. Um, they've, it, there's a small group that's been going out there um, a couple times a week for six years. So that, that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, he seemed, I mean, he, he was doing as well as you could expect given the situation. Mm. So. But no sign, <laughs> no, sign of, no sign of breakage. He's still standing his ground, yeah? Yes, for sure. And he smelled good. So that was totally fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was as well as could be expected. And um, I mean, we all know that uh, where he lives right now, uh, you know, so many eyes are on him and so many devices are trying to capture anything that is going on inside of his little space. Right. Did he speak about that? Did, did you feel like, uh, uh, you know, he's uh, aware of, uh, you know, the constant surveillance around him? Did he point that out to you? Yeah, for sure. Um, and he was very cautious about that. I mean, even with me visiting, I had to leave my phone at the front desk and turn it off. And um, he's, he's definitely aware <laughs> that they're watching and that they're paying attention. Which is um, a, I have a some, very scary thing because I'm sure that a lot, pretty much everybody in here is also on their radar, and it's a, it's a scary concept to think about. I, 
I just want to break in one moment and let you know that like literally in the last 50 seconds, uh, WikiLeaks has tweeted about this. And the, from the official account, they said, uh, WikiLeaks editor Julian Assange has been gagged and isolated by order of Ecuador's new president, Lenin Moreno. He cannot speak, tw- uh, cannot tweet, speak to the press, receive visitors or make telephone calls. Ecuador demanded that he remove the following tweet. So this seems to get to the heart of why he's been silenced. And it's his tweet saying, in 1940, the elected president of Catalonia, Luis Companies, was it captured by the Gestapo at the request of Spain, delivered to them and executed. Today, the German police have arrested the elected president of Catalonia, Charles P- Puigdemont. I'm totally uh, sorry for um, not pronouncing that correctly. At the request of Spain to be extradited. So it looks like Kim was right with the, about guessing or gauging the um, root cause of this uh, latest silence. It's the only thing that makes sense. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the king himself picked up the phone uh, to call uh, in Ecuador and say, you know, this is uh, really affecting our relations and we want you to do something about this. Absolutely. So, yeah, I was really glad to see that WikiLeaks uh, kind of put that to rest as to why this has happened. And it shows you again that you can't trust the Guardian. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Good point. Yeah, and I think one reason they maybe went with that false narrative was because if you publicize the fact that he's being silenced for speaking out in defense of Catalonia and Catalonians' right to self-determination, that doesn't look, that doesn't reflect well on the deep state, uh, you know, attacks on him. So they had to make it about, you know, a Russian and and the whole Russian saga some more as opposed to the real reason. So I think that was definitely a calculated PR move on their part, knowing full well that it wasn't uh, true. So. so I'm well, going to keep you know, if, oh, go ahead. If we, if we learn one thing from the situation, now that we have the confirmation from WikiLeaks, what the reason is behind uh, this uh, disconnect of Julian from all communications. I mean, what does that tell us about Ecuador? You know, on the one hand, if it's the US or the UK, you know, they are willing to stand up for Julian and say, you know, we're we're not going to accept this uh, injustice. We are going to protect you. But once it is a closer ally to them, a bigger friend, a bigger trading partner, you know, all of a sudden, this concept of justice and freedom of speech can be put to a side, to the side, and now it's okay uh, to ban his communications because, uh, you know, the person or the state that has asked for a favor is so much closer to Ecuador uh, than, for example, the United States. And in a way, you know, that's a hypocrisy. You can't say we are uh, safeguarding this guy, Julian Assange, because, uh, you know, he is a publisher. He has done nothing criminal. Uh, You know, we don't agree with this persecution of him. We don't think he would ever get a fair trial in the U.S. And that's why we gave him asylum. Well, how does that not apply the very same thing to Julian Assange telling us the truth, a historic fact from 1940 about something that has happened uh, with the previous uh, Catalan president? How come? that Ecuador would want him to censor that tweet, delete that tweet, when all he's stating is a historic fact. And a historic fact that is so powerful that Spain now has to fear because of the German Nazi history that they will now not extradite the Catalan president as a result of that powerful tweet that basically goes to the heart of Germans' history and how it will make them look if they make that same mistake again. And, you know, I'm pretty sure the Spaniards, uh, the government was sitting there and saying to themselves, ha, now we got him, the Germans are going to deliver him, and here comes Julian Assange with a historic truth bomb right into the middle of their ambitions, 
and blowing it all up. And I'm pretty sure by now uh, the German uh, prosecutors that are looking at this case, uh, they will be in favor of not extraditing him. I'm pretty sure we'll see some interesting uh, movement uh, towards you know, letting this man go back to Belgium, to his family, uh, where he was allowed to stay and where the Belgian government had already determined that he cannot be extradited. And here are the, Sp the, the, the here's the Spanish government trying to pull a trick on this man, trying to cheat him by making him believe that the European arrest one has been canceled and then using the Germans to do the same thing that they have done in 1940. And by making, and here's the, this is the power of Julian Assange. By making this tweet about this historic fact, he has hit the nail on the head and right into the hearts of the German government where they say to themselves, well, we can't be part of this. It's just bad optics. We cannot do this. And it's, it's, again, Julian that is changing the course of history and that is delivering justice to a man who is representing a large number of people that want to self-determine their future and be independent. How the hell does Spain think that any of this is okay? And then applying pressure on Ecuador on, on a large trading partner that they have uh, enormous strong history ties with, you know, to cut off Julian Assange. It's ridiculous, you know? And Ecuador should really have a look at this again and say, you know, either you are for protecting this man who's telling us the truth, no matter who of your allies is asking uh, to back down and uh, to deliver him uh, to the United States, you know? You, you ha it can't work just with the United States. It needs to work with everybody. If Spain is trying to uh, silence someone who's just uh, uh, reporting historic facts, well, that is as bad, if not worse, than what the U.S. is trying to do to this man. So Ecuador, you really need to look at this, uh, uh, the Ecuadorian government and the president. You need to look at this and see how it makes, how it reflects on you, how it makes you look like a hypocrite. Absolutely. <laughs> all, all great points, mic drop, you know, for sure. Let's go, baby. I'm on fire. Yeah, Kim, you're on fire and they're queuing up to join us right now. Um, awesome. I'm just helping Ray McGovern, the CIA whistleblower, to log on and speak with us, which is wow. pretty amazing. I just want to give you guys a couple of updates. So Randy Critico is currently at MSNBC actually doing an interview um, about uh, his situation, about WikiLeaks. Uh, he's given me a statement that he wanted me to read to you guys and then hopefully he will join us a little later tonight. He says that he hopes that the Ecuadorian government changes their mind sooner rather than later, being that Mr. Assange's human, civil and legal rights have all been abused by the British government for the last six years. He says Julian Assange has suffered enough and that is his statement. Wow, very, very powerful. Very much so. Also, I just wanted to let you know that we have with us Emmy. Emmy was just at the Ecuadorian embassy for the last few hours in London. She is one of the key vigil organisers for Julian. She's also met with him in person uh, previously. Emmy, are you able to join us and give us an update on how things are there in London? You are muted, but I can unmute you. There you go. Hi, Emmy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Please go ahead for all of those of us who can't be there on the ground in London. Please let us know how are things going. Well, we have been witnessing yet again another chapter in this uh, prolonged uh, suffering of Julian Assange. Um, may I just check? You hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you yes. just fine. Yes. So um, I'm part of a solidarity group that for the last um, almost six years 
We go outside the embassy with banners and posters, uh, very respectfully and quietly. At times we may chant, we may have a little bit of music at times, uh, basically reminding passers-by that uh, here is uh, Julian Assange, the editor of Wikileaks, and explaining to the public, uh, who consists of uh, British people, but also a lot of uh, foreigners, tourists visiting the area, uh, about the latest developments in the Julian Assange case. As long as he's in there, uh, and it has dragged on long enough, uh, we are out there um, telling the story, answering questions and reminding people of uh, the work of WikiLeaks and why he's where he is at the moment. We explain to people various aspects of the case because we keep ourselves informed. Uh, we distribute flyers and uh, the main function is solidarity, is to show that we care and we're there um, witnessing what is going on. Uh, we'd li I'd like to particularly um, uh, put across the, uh, the news that tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, we are organizing a new vigil. Uh, it's very short notice for people, we appreciate that, but the circumstances are such we, we can't give people a lot of notice. Uh, please join us, a number of us will start congregating from 10 a.m. Uh, anytime you can, uh, you've got free time, pop in join us. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, media coverage tomorrow, I'm sure. Uh, we have the possibility to put up a presence with our banners, um, our posters, and, and be there for Wikileaks and for Julian Assange at this difficult time. Um, oh, Susie, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for being there on the ground and being present for him. I know that the vigils that you've held for so many years have been a huge moral support to Julian. I remember previously Christine Assange had spoken about how relentless your support group has been day in and day out, sunshine, rain and snow and hail to be there and to consistently support Julian. So I think that you guys are really citizen heroes for what you do and the solidarity that you've shown for him. And I think that the visibility that you provide uh, re it produces a constant reminder to the public uh, that Julian is in there and that he's suffering. It, it prevents him from being forgotten by passers-by. It, it keeps, you know, that constant presence really does help with his visibility. Um, but also just lets him know that there's friendly faces around. It's not just all the surveillance and the police, but that there are people who genuinely care about his well-being that are a stone's throw from where he's sitting. And I think that's amazing. Did you at all see Julian today? Like, no, was we, haven't. we haven't seen him or the cat, because sometimes the cat <laughs> comes to the window, which is very cute, uh, very entertaining for us as well. Uh, great curiosity. Um, but thank you very much for your kind words, Susie. And uh, we certainly appreciate everyone who retweets uh, our photographs, which is literally a witnessing uh, a testament that we're there for him and for the organization. Um, and of course, um, we are witnessing uh, events. We, we take part, we see the policing operation, we often uh, experience the undercover uh, police operation, often things that never make the headlines of the news. We are there, we're experiencing it. And at the same time, I would like to pass a very, very clear message. Because myself and the others are literally on the street talking to the public, there is tremendous support for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Everyday people, people who join us, people who pass by, who stop, who inquire, they can see what's going on. Often this does not reflect, it's not reflected in the newspaper articles that establishment media wish to present a particular point of view. Uh, but I'm on the street for years now and I can tell you, it is very evident that there's a highly political case here that um, um, legal processes have been used to entrap this man um, and try to uh, weaken uh, his organization. And um, people who stop by to talk to us join and understand that this is the situation. No matter how it's presented in Western press and particularly the UK press, which is uh, very, very biased against him and WikiLeaks. So uh, it is very heartening to come into contact with everyday people, speak to them face to face, talk about anything relating to the case or sometimes generally about politics and find that you agree. 
that you agree. And uh, it's, it's a very, um, uh, how can I say, very positive message and one that keeps us going. You don't know if Sorry, we come across the pros. <laughs> you know, okay, the police is not always nice, but um, they are civil. They were, they used to be when uh, they were a lot more present. Uh, they, they, they stopped uh, uh, the uniform police in October 2015. Now you really rarely see uniform police out there. When they were there 24-7, yes, the situation was more tense uh, for us too, because sometimes we would... Uh, and they would engage with us, um, asking us to take banners down or wanting to know who we were. Um, I had been asked uh, my where I come from, uh, things like that. You feel you feel the presence, but um, now things are slightly more uh, relaxed in that way because the the appearance of uh, the uniform police is no longer there. The, of course, it's been uh, replaced by a very regular undercover operation. And I have been, myself and others, writing to the local London Assembly, questioning the London mayor who is responsible for the budget of the Metropolitan Police to reveal the true cost of the uh, surveillance operation. It is classified. It's uh, under police operations. They do not reveal the thousands upon thousands spent in taxpayers' money on this ridiculous surveillance operation to keep him entrapped in that embassy. It's a scandalous politically, but there you are. Emmy, you have also, you've also met with Julian in the embassy previously. What were your impressions of him? He's a normal guy, you know, like um, anyone else. Of course, it was a very nerve wracking experience going into the embassy, extremely rigorous uh, security operation. And of course, I was stopped at the steps uh, by a policeman uh, wanting to know what I was doing there, which was not uh, the best experience one uh, can have. Um, but uh, Julian himself, well, it was wonderful to meet him because you finally uh, see that he is like us. Um, uh, you realize uh, previously you might see him as a, as a public person. Obviously, he is. He's very well known around the world. But once you get to see him, you realize at the end of the day, he's human just like us. And you can connect and you can feel the solidarity stronger and truer and simpler. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a privilege to meet him, certainly. That is remarkable and amazing. I'm so happy for you that you had that experience. Um, almost uniformly, everybody who has met with Julian has said how intelligent, how learned, um, and how generous he is. And I think that... Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that the, um, the smearing of him over the years is particularly egregious because it is just so simply not rooted in fact as to how his personality actually is which is nothing like it has been presented by his opponents to the public. Well, I think a lot of public people engage uh, public relations uh, teams in order to manage their public um, image. He hasn't done that. He presents himself as he is. Of course, uh, now that um, it's my daughter <laughs> who has invaded my first live podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. She's just come for the crisps. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of people employ professionals and he, he hasn't done that. He is himself. Um, he creates himself as he goes along. Um, and it's wonderful because um, you can see that, again, he's a human being like us. Um, you, you see it as it is. You see him as he is. Um, and at the end of the day, it is the work. It is the work that he does with his colleagues. He inspires hundreds of people to assist him. Uh, he inspires whistleblowers to trust him with information that is for the common good. He has spearheaded a movement for transparency. Um, I heard earlier, a little bit earlier, uh, Kim talking about uh, history and, and Germany. I believe history is happening now. The historic events that he described live with us today, now, in us. We carry on. And Julian Assange, with um, his um, 
a particular kind of contribution uh, in his, this historic record with publishing original documents of importance, persecuted documents, adds to our understanding of history now. And it's extremely exciting uh, for people who have an interest of understanding how the world is and understanding why historic events happen as they do, which affect us profoundly. History is not something that happens to someone else that you read in history books. In history is something that happens to us every day. And um, yeah, I think he's done a wonderful job uh, in spearheading uh, this uh, movement. Others have also contributed and keep contributing and things are changing. But uh, his sheer determination and stubbornness to persist no matter what has allowed others to follow. Um, and um, it's, it's to his tribute really and um, highly admirable what he has done and also extremely self-sacrificing for himself as well as for the people who help him. Uh, there's been a high price for him personally and for others who have helped him uh, to continue with this type of work and, and we witnessed that both at the vigil and of course uh, by following the story in the press um, and understanding um, all these legal difficulties that have been put forward, how they have affected him and his family. It's yeah, so I'm important to remember yeah. that he that he is a human. It's so so important to remember he is not just a picture. He's not just a meme. He's he is a human being. Like all of us, and uh, he has done something tremendous with his life and uh, offers an example to many, we certainly cannot follow. Um, uh, but on a human level, we are all equal. And um, if we can, uh, each and every one of us do something in their own way to assist with this endeavor, I think it's really worthwhile. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to, um, on that note, uh, emphasize and, you know, echo Susie's praise of you earlier, because just like Julian is, is an example to us on standing up to the establishment, you and the people that stand with you outside the, Equ uh, outside the Ecuadorian embassy every day are an example in solidarity. You're really setting, you know, the tone for other people that support Julian, and I, I really, really appreciate that a lot. I think you, you all are heroes, so... Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I mean, um, I, I, we all do what we can. I mean, there are people there that uh, have had, um, uh, you know, as I said, history has touched them. Um, one of our, our lovely, lovely um, ladies who comes, Clara, and, um, you know, she's been in this country originally through political asylum. She came from Chile. She has lived uh, the consequences of uh, the Pinochet dictatorship. Um, and that memory is very strong with her and has formed her thinking and her commitment to human rights and to the political asylum of Julia Assange. I mean, she often says, even Pinochet would let us go if we had political asylum. How is that the UK government, Western democracy, does not allow for safe passage? That is an incredible, incredible point. She Great keeps point. That. And the power yeah. of the Pinochet uh, story keep popping up uh, to whoever has followed it closely, especially in the legal sense. Uh, so we will have another um, gentleman, Kieran, Kieran O'Reilly, uh, who, who has dedicated his life uh, in human rights, equality, in um, nonviolent um, dissent and anti-war um, activist. Uh, I've just taken a small short video Mm, and I uploaded it on YouTube. Please take a look. He spoke to us today and he talked about the importance of solidarity. Um, so you have the people who, um, who understand about these things and or others who just uh, literally um, stop for a chat and join us for a few weeks or a few months. So, um, and again, uh, there is no pressure. It's a very relaxed and environment and we enjoy each other's talk you know conversations about politics so we keep going <laughs> that's awesome we hope hope that um his um ordeal will not last forever 
And I remember how much everyone, myself included, looked to you, Emmy, when you're when uh, the last time that Assange's uh, internet was cut off at the embassy. Um, you know, your account was really, really helpful in in guiding supporters and give, keeping us informed. So, Thank really you. appreciate it. Because I am in on on Twitter and I've got my own blog and I write in other blogs, I, I provide um, that link with the internet. Uh, but there are people there who go a lot more than me, uh, who um, are there three and four times a week consistently for many, many years. That is and, incredible. Uh, they do not have access to the internet. So we talk about what we're going to do. And then um, when there is consensus, we just say, okay, I me, you know, send a visual call out. Um, you might see me doing the call out, but in fact, it's just... Um, you know, a discussion that we have together, we decide to do it, and I just put it up on the, on the web. And uh, I have a lot of support from them, and I try to support them. We're doing banners, we're doing posters. Anybody, everybody offers what they can. Um, and I think that's the beauty of solidarity, you know. Um, find the thing that you can do and just do it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be one single way. Keep it simple. Uh, and uh, I keep saying to people again and again, the simplest thing is put your hand in your pocket and give a donation, you know, go to Wikileaks to talk, donate and give $5 or £5 or £10 or go to the wonderful Wikileaks shop. And you've got a great variety of supporters items there you can you can spend your money on and enjoy yourself as well as, um, you know, support uh, Wikileaks. So um, it's, a, it's such a, a rewarding journey for me because there's a wide variety of things that you can do. Whether you're interested in history, uh, current affairs, politics, or you're interested in solidarity. Um, so I encourage people. I've certainly enjoyed my uh, support, despite, uh, you know, some aspects which might not be so pleasant, but, you know, no one's yeah, we've. <laughs> We've definitely gotten a lot of questions along the lines of how can we normal people help? How, what can we do? And I think you that's a really great point that we haven't really emphasized prior uh, or before that in this stream, which is to go donate. And that is a really important, real yeah. thing that people could do, as well as just spread information, retweeting, sharing on Facebook, despite the censorship, all of that, you know. So We've seen how uh, it's the number one attempt to stop them by, don by depriving them of resources um, and support. We've seen it recently, I hate to mention, um, you know, the efforts of um, certain Mika Lee, um, um, you know, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, how, um, uh, you know, himself or whoever else is in this managed to uh, cut off a considerable amount of donations from the US coming into WikiLeaks. Um, it's extremely important for the legal work that WikiLeaks uh, requires the legal support to have resources to finance that. Although a great number of wonderful legal minds have offered uh, their services pro bono, they still have costs. Um, the Courage Foundation is a wonderful vehicle of, uh, you know, um, calling for donations and, and, and it's a wonderful way to, to um, donate to the legal fund of WikiLeaks and uh, other whistleblowers. And one I'm very proud to support. And so you have the option, you want to uh, support the publishing work of Wikileaks, you go one way. If you want to support the actual people and uh, the legal costs of, of supporting and defending the people of Wikileaks, you donate to the Courage Foundation. Um, it's great that these channels have grown um, through the needs of the organization and the needs of this uh, this journey yeah definitely and i was wondering kim if you had any thoughts on how people additionally to what we've just said how they can help right now in this time when julian is silenced and well I, uh, the yeah. most important thing of course is uh, that we make everyone aware <clears throat> that this is happening um and then uh you know we just need to uh, put pressure <laughs> on Ecuador, <laughs> sorry, uh, put pressure on Ecuador, let them know that, you know, you can't have it uh, both ways. Either uh, you are protecting 
Julian for his right to publish and for his right to be a journalist and for him to have the free speech and not be interfered with by the United States, or you don't. You know, you can't uh, choose uh, one ally over another and then change your position uh, based on whoever's asking you for a favor. And by the way, this is something that I think is important to point out. Once again, those in power are making a grave mistake because they think in the heat of the moment that by silencing Julian Assange, they are going to achieve the outcome that they want, which is the extradition of the Catalan president. But they achieve the exact opposite because now this uh, matter is becoming so much more important. You know that the Spanish government is going this far uh, in order to get their way to silence one of the biggest voices in recent history, uh, Julian Assange, just to get their way, to get this extradition done, you can be sure the exact opposite is going to happen now. Uh, you know, the German government is going to look at this and they will not extradite uh, and they will not uh, be uh, impressed by what's happening here. You know, they can see that this is uh, all very political and that this pressure that is being applied on them and on Ecuador and on Julian is all really just them throwing their toys around, being all mad. They want to have it their way and they're not going to get it, especially now because they have gone so far to embarrass themselves, to embarrass Ecuador and uh, to punish a man for telling the truth. That is what the outcome, the understanding for everyone is going to be about this episode. They, they try to censor him. They try to silence him after he told the truth in a tweet, you know, and that is really um, not looking good for Ecuador. So what we should all do is just let everyone know about it, let everyone understand what's going on here, tell Ecuador to you know, get back uh, uh, on the right path that they have been on the last years helping Julian, uh, you know, and not change their attitude simply because a more important ally or a more powerful ally of theirs is now asking for a favor or is throwing their toys around and yelling at Ecuador, like, how can you do this? No, no, no. You know, don't be weak. You know, Moreno, don't be weak, man. Julian has done a lot of suffering and you have been uh, there, your government, your country has been there. You have been recently elected. Don't throw all this great history that your country has written by helping this man, don't throw that in the bin. It's not worth it, you know? That guy, the Catalan president, is not going to get extradited anyway because the Germans realize that what Spain is doing here is a complete overreach, you know? It's not fair. And Germany has learned one thing more than any other country in Europe that they cannot abuse their power, you know? They have done it and the consequence was horrible. A lot of people died. So we have this, this historic knowledge in our DNA, you know, where we have guilt for things, where we care about other people. You're not going to get the Catalan president. I can tell you that now, Spain. It's not gonna happen. And you have only made it worse, your situation, you have only made it worse by attacking a man for telling the truth. And if I were you, I would pick up the phone and call Moreno and tell him to back off before this whole thing blows out of proportion and the whole Catalan conflict is going to get re-inflamed and people go onto the streets and really demand their independence because so far they've all just been nice. They've all just been 
you know, non-violent and uh, trying to, you know, make you understand that they want to determine their own future. But if you do things like this, things can escalate very quickly, you know. So it's counterproductive. And Julian needs to get back online sooner rather than later before this whole thing blows up uh, into something that nobody wants. Kim, you're just spot on. Um, look, I'm so excited, you guys, because someone who I deeply respect and whose work I have followed for a number of years has joined us, and that is, of course, Ray McGovern. Ray is a CIA whistleblower. He is, in my opinion, a geopolitical expert of almost unparalleled proportion. He is also a tireless advocate for Julian Assange, for free speech, free press, and for WikiLeaks. And I'm so pleased that he is here to, to advocate for Julian's rights, his, his right, human right to communication to be restored. Ray, can you hear me? Ken, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank Great. you so much. I'm so looking forward to your two cents on these recent developments. Well, I'm glad to be with you and thank you for inviting me. I have to tell you, uh, first off, that Julian is a treasured friend of mine. We don't see each other very often. And we did uh, actually uh, three days before the U.S. election in November of 2016, and uh, it was quite a remarkable day. He had warned me that he couldn't spend the usual hour or two uh, drinking some beer with me. He said he was sort of busy. <laughs> and indeed he was. Uh, he had uh, uh, given an interview or given an John Pilger, an interview to shop around to uh, British outlets, uh, his, final, his final commentary on the US election. And he had just heard from Pilger uh, that he had uh, succeeded, not the way they had intended, uh, but that he had succeeded in uh, offering it and getting it uh, published on RT. Now, what did they hope? They hoped, of course, that it would get on BBC or Channel 4, or any of the so-called mainstream media. But John had uh, told, uh, told Julian, <laughs> I tried, I almost offered them money to take it. <laughs> Not only wouldn't they pay me, but they wouldn't, uh, you know, take any money. So uh, the, it, it was the less favored outlet, but it got out. And uh, Julian was reconciled to the fact that John, of course, had as he always does, it done his best. And so we sat down, we had a beer, and we had some Mideast food like we usually do. And the man was exhausted. But, you know, I know the feeling of being exhausted and having done everything you possibly can uh, for justice's sake. You know, this sounds phony perhaps these days, but, you know, Dr. King famously said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And he was just trying to get the, get the word out. Uh, and of course, famously, he uh, got the word out about the Democratic National Committee uh, emails. And what did they show? Well, they showed very clearly that Hillary Clinton and her DNC colleagues had stolen the nomination from Bernie Sanders. It was Clarissa Bell. It's right there. All the machinations they went through uh, to, to, to show that the Bernie was not the good person and so forth and so on. And uh, Julian was satisfied that even though he and I and everybody expected Hillary to win, that he had done his part. Uh, he didn't expect Hillary to win. Nobody expected, except people suggest that Putin expected Hillary to win. Putin expected Trump to win. So what I'm saying here is that, sure, he had this pallor that made him look like somebody who had been indoors for five years. I, I guess that was he. He had been indoors for five years. But he had this feeling of, this vibrant feeling that, look, I had done everything I could, let's have a beer and maybe I can catch up on my sleep. So we didn't spend an only two hours, but we did spend an hour. And of course, three days later, <laughs> three
three days later, there was this shock. I was in Germany at the time. And the Germans, you know, my friends, the Germans, were convinced, as I was, that, that what the Germans call, uh, it was eine Wahl zwischen Pest und Cholera. <laughs> A choice between plague and cholera. Uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And, and so when I got up early in the morning to watch the the returns on German TV, they were just like CNN. They, they <laughs> was, was ist denn? Was ist denn? <laughs> they couldn't understand what was going on, see? So it was kind of uh, really interesting there in Germany. And what I did, uh, there was a parliamentary vote the next day. And I said, look, uh, before you approve, before you approve further German participation in this feckless war in Syria, in violation of all kinds of accords, uh, maybe you ought to think, maybe you ought to think about what Mr. Trump, uh, in my view, the only sensible idea that Mr. Trump had, and that is, why don't we have a better relationship with Russia? I guess I'm, I'm wandering off the path here, but this is sort of background to how much I admire Julian Assange for doing everything he possibly could on the most extreme conditions. And, and now what's going on? Well, somebody is pressing really, really hard <laughs> at to get him to stop. Now, who could that be? Let me see. Uh, Ecuadorians? I don't think so. Now, I have to confess that I know very little about how Ecuador looks at Catalan. Um, my guess is that they don't really care very much. <laughs> that maybe they do, but my guess is that uh, this is a pretext, okay? They wanted Julian to shut up. Now, why would Julian persist on talking about Catalan? Well, it's a justice issue. Julian cares about justice. Nobody else is saying anything about Catalan. U.S. New York Times readers, Catalan, is, is that near Ukraine in the middle of the Pacific? <laughs> Whoa, you know. So, you know, Julian doesn't make any compromises. Now, what's behind all this? Well, you know, there's been a little, no, there's been a big reshuffle in our government. We have... Um, we have this fellow, Mike Pompeo, who has called Julian Assange and his associates demons. Demons, that's sort of demonology, right? I mean, like, if, you, if it weren't for the fact that he, well known to be a Christian fundamentalist, you would think that demons would be out of discourse, but now he's a demon, and not only that, uh, he should be God after, right? Now, he is, uh, WikiLeaks is a non-state hostile intelligence service. Huh. You know, that's a new category. I mean, <laughs> I've never heard of a non-state hostile intelligence service before, but that's what Mom, Mike Pompeo said. Now, if you look at that, you say, well, why that? Why then? I think this was like April the 13th or something of this year. Well, if you look uh, two weeks before, uh, you had Julian Assange telling the truth in a very open way about something called Vault 7. Whoa, <laughs> what's Vault 7? Well, uh, as usual, uh, Julian, uh, deals in the real McCoy, as we say in the Bronx. Uh, it, it, it's the real thing. It's authentic. I mean, even, mark you, even the CIA, NSA, FBI joint memorandum of 6 January admitted that uh, so-called Russian hackers chose WikiLeaks because WikiLeaks deals in only authentic material, and so it would have credibility. <laughs> There's a strange compliment, compliment coming from those guys, but, but even they were there. So what is Vault 7? Hmm. Wow. Well, what I know about Vault 7 is what WikiLeaks announced on the 7th of March of this year. And that was that through a, a leaker, uh, through a whistleblower who works 
either for the CIA or more likely as a contractor for the CIA, he saw all this stuff going on with cyber offensive tools, cyber warfare. And he said, my God, look what they can do. Uh, they can take control of a fancy car, fancier than mine, something with very all computers, are, and make it go at 10 miles an hour oh, without being able to put the brakes on. Gosh, you know, that actually happened here. Uh, it happened to it happened to a fellow who was writing a long piece on John Brennan, the head of the CIA. Look it up. It happened in Los Angeles, and it happened to this fellow who couldn't control his car. Well, that's really interesting. That's one of the old seven cyber tools. Now, what's another one? Well, another one was advertised as a, uh, well, it's a tool that allowed you to make, to, to penetrate a television, a television. Uh, South Korean, I think, made television. Not Sanyo, but the new one. Uh, and even though it's sensibly off, and you're in your bedroom, and maybe you're making love to your wife, uh, it's on. I mean, like it's really on. And every all that audio comes through. Maybe some of the video as well, I don't know, but the audio for sure. Now, how is this played? Well, it was quite big news in the New York Times on March 7th. And then later in March, when the, the latest thing about the, the TV thing was, was announced. But then, and this is sort of curious, on March 31st, uh, part three of Vault 7, a called Marble Framework was announced. Whoa, what's that all about? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what it's about. It's about a very sophisticated computer, a, a, a cyber weapon that allows you to penetrate a system, a computer or a network or a server and make, and, and what the CIA word was, was obfuscate. Now, not many Americans know what obfuscate is, but we do. Uh, obfuscate who hacked in. And not only that, but divert attention by inserting little things like, oh, they worked in five languages, Chinese, uh, Persian, Arabic, Korean, and guess what? Russian, <laughs> okay? So what you have here is, this, is a system being revealed by Julian Assange saying, look, uh, the Russians have this cyber tool, they call it Marble Framework, and it allows people to to get right into your computer, uh, disguise who hacked it, and leave telltale signs like, oh, wild guess, Cyrillic, or, or maybe the, the name of the first head of the Soviet secret police, Felix Emulovich, Dzerzhinsky. So uh, that's, those were clues, okay? Now what happened? All of a sudden, New York Times didn't publish about that. The Wall Street Journal, no. Washington Post, no. Well, actually, the Washington Post, there was one, one author, one journalist, Ellen Nakashima. And she, to her credit, as soon as the story broke, she pounced on it. And she had a headline article in the next day's Washington Post. I, I have the headline here because I thought it was relevant. Here it is, her headline, quote, WikiLeaks' latest release of CIA, CIA cyber tools could blow the cover on agency hacking operations, end quote. Oh, so that was before she got the memo. What I mean by that, of course, is the New York Times, not like the old days, the New York Times, before it publishes anything that looks really sensitive, it calls up the White House and says, it's pretty please, could we, could we do this maybe? Could, is, is it? Oh, and they say, no, 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 no. This would blow our, this, <laughs> this would be what Ellen Nakashima in Washington Post says, it would blow our hacking operation. Now, why is this relevant? Well, you all know, but maybe some of the people here listening would not know automatically. 
But, you know, we have this so-called Russian hack into the Democratic National Committee computers and so-called giving it to WikiLeaks so WikiLeaks could publish it and destroy Hillary Clinton's candidacy. That's the story that is being promoted by the mainstream press in this country. But wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no forensic proof of any of this. As a matter of fact, my colleagues, former technical directors of, this, of the NSA, or my sub-colleagues, I'm saying veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, they've looked at all this stuff and they've said, hey, you know what? It's a canard and we can prove it from forensics. You know, for, for people who know a little bit of physics, it's a principle of physics involved here. Um, let me do an analogy here. Outside my home here, there's a big, big uh, drain pipe. And before we bought this house, uh, when the rains came, it used to flood both sides of the house, okay? And, and my neighbor who worked for the Bureau of Public Roads, he says, Ray, for God's sake, when Arlington County puts in a new drain, uh, drain system, make sure that it's 48 inch diameter and not the 36 that they have in there now. Now, why do I say that? Well, because we have the same fluid dynamics principle here. The internet on July 5th, 2016, which is the Lucifer 2.0 uh, intrusion that we have metadata on, okay, uh, that the capability of the internet was the equivalent of 36 inches. It couldn't handle anything more, okay? <laughs> we know that, that's physics. We know exactly what the capability is. What's, why is that important? Because if you're gonna hack, you gotta use the internet, right? The speed with which that data was downloaded onto a thumb drive was three times the speed that the internet could handle on July 5th. 2016. Now, that's not hard to understand. And Bill Binney has taken the lead on that. And NSA former technical director said, look, before we had a negative argument. Now we can positively argue that at least the forensics show that it couldn't happen the way, uh, the, way the government of us is saying. What, what, I'm, what am I referring to when I said before? Well, before, for over an hour, over Almost two years now, Bill Binney has been saying, look, NSA collects everything. And I would say to Bill, come on, Bill, for God's sake, and all telephones and, and all, come on. He said, look, Ray, trust me. <laughs> I devised a system that allows this, okay? Now, they collect everything, that's the policy. The processing is a little bit different, but they do collect everything. What does that mean, Ray? That means that I can speak, he says, Bill, uh, because Ed Snowden brought out the view graphs. We sort of used to call them view graphs. <laughs> brought out the slides, okay, which show exactly how they do it. I could show the, the, the monitor little uh, network inserts to, to show how these things are tracked. And I have. So trust me, they collect everything. Okay, well, oh, wow. Well, what does that mean, Bill? He says, Ray, you're a little slow. That means that if the Russians hack into the DNC, NSA, ipso facto, would know about it. Well, I said, well, maybe it's so sensitive that they can't, can't uh, admit it. Ray, says Bill, for God's sake. And Snowden has admitted it. We have the, the slides. I can show how it's done. It, pretty much everyone acknowledges this. So it's not like it's sensitive. If they had the information and they should have it, if it existed, then, you know, then uh, they would have it, be, they would be able to adduce it and say, yeah, it's very real. Now, if that was good enough for me. I mean, the bill is the guy, right? Now, uh, the only problem is that we have in this country the Rumsfeld theorem, theorem which is... Uh, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So the absence of evidence that the Russians hacked into the DNC doesn't mean they didn't do it. <laughs> so, so that's what we had here until we had the forensics. We had the forensics late spring. We published on it. 
actually, the bizarre thing is that when we published on the July 24, told a story, and then the Nation magazine carried the story, well, it took them a couple of months. But Pompeo, the head of the CIA, uh, called Bill Benny out of the blue. It's said, Bill, can you come see me? Bill said, sure. They met on October 24th uh, in uh, the seventh, <laughs> spent hours there myself, the seventh floor conference room, the director of CIA's conference room. And the first thing um, Pompeo says is, well, you're probably wondering why I invited you here. Uh, the president told me to, that's why. Now, uh, what, do you, what do you have to say? Bill says, well, uh, sir, with, with all due respect, I should tell you that your, uh, your people are lying to you. So getting back to this thing, what I'm saying here is that this, uh, this intrusion, Vault 7, is, uh, is very important because it talks about who may have hacked into the DNC and uh, our suspicion. Now, this is not forensics and this is not proof, but our suspicion, Bill Binney and mine, is that uh, we have to look for the people who have these cyber tools who can intrude and obfuscate and leave little, little telltale signs like uh, Cyrillic or uh, Felix and Mundovich behind. So this is why it's big. And that's why one, two weeks after the release of this mobile framework part of Vault 7, Pompeo said, ah, they're demons, they're demons, they're demons they're a non-state hostile intelligence organization. And I think that's coming home to roost now because Pompeo is leaving the CIA. God, we don't know who's going to take his place, but it doesn't look like it's going to get any better. He's going to become Secretary of State. The Ecuadorians have to deal with that. They have to figure out what's going to happen if uh, this transition goes even worse and you have a known torturer heading up the CIA. What will she do? So that's the context in which I would put this. I apologize for my long windedness, but uh, you could chalk it up to the fact that I'm Irish. Not a problem at all. And I'm really honored to meet you, Ray. It's just an absolute amazing, um, you know, uh, event that you're here with us. I'm so glad to meet you. Um, I'm editor in chief of Disability Media. My name is Elizabeth Voss and I was, I'm, in addition to being a huge fan of both your work and the work of Bill Binney and Vips, um, I was really honored to have been part of reporting on the story, part of the story that you're mentioning, where you all wrote the memorandum to President Trump. You cited um, the work of the Forensicator and um, our initial coverage of the work of the Forensicator. And so it's just that because of that, it is an extreme honor to meet you. And uh, I just had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you, if that's okay that relate to your friendship with Julian Assange, first of all, which is, I was wondering, how did uh, your support for WikiLeaks and your friendship with Julian Assange um, initially begin? Well, it all happened sort of uh, accidentally. Um, when he released his first tranche of documents, it was the tranche on Afghanistan or Iraq, I forget which one, uh, we immediately thought, that he was deserving of our prize. Uh, we have a Sam Adams Association for uh, Integrity and Intelligence, and we have been awarding up to that time about 10 of our annual awards to various and some, including Craig Murray from, from uh, Ambassador Murray from Britain. And as soon as Julian did that, we thought, wow, this is deserving of our award. We took our normal survey and vote, we approved it. Then the question was, how are we gonna get we always present it in, you probably remember that we presented it to Ed Snowden back in October two years ago, physically, right? <laughs> it took some doing, but it was, so we, we present this, it's a candlestick holder, you know, for showing light into dark places. So we wanted to give that to Julian Assange. So at that big conference where he took people through, uh, we had John, we had uh, Craig Murray there and we had Dan Ellsberg there. And so between the two of them, they went up and they gave him the award. Now, after that, uh, we presented another award at Oxford, actually two more at Oxford University for other reasons, one of whom, one of whom was Tom Finger, and he was a professor at Oxford, former State Department manager. 
And each time Julian was, uh, invited us to have some, some dinner there. It's, and it was wonderful just to, you know, not only was it great just to meet Julian, and I'll tell you a little vignette here. Um, we were waiting for Julian in the ante room. There's that very big ante room. And the door opens and, there, and I'm right next to him. And I said, Julian, I'm Ray McGovern. And he said, well, I know. And I said, oh, you read my stuff? He said, no, I see you on YouTube. <laughs> Which Elizabeth, that really gave me some sort of, what, what I have to do, I have to get on YouTube, whatever, you know, <laughs> use my stuff. Anyhow, we had a great thing there. And I, the greatest part of that, that gathering, we had Tom Drake there. We had other highly technical people, right? And they were talking in a different language <laughs> with Julius, but he was so, what the Germans called begeistert. You know, he, he was so enthusiastic to be able to talk with people who could understand what he would say yeah. about the government with these guys. So that's, you now we saw him twice that way. And then every time I come through London, I, I try to try to meet up with him so far, so good. And it's uh, just, uh, it's, it's sad to see the circumstances under which he has to live. But I always draw encouragement and courage from the fact that this this person is willing to suffer for justice sake. And there aren't many of us around. Definitely. And that leads me to my um, next question. My last question for you is how do you see WikiLeaks um, and its role in journalism, as well as in defending people from the harmful aspects of their government? I know that's a really broad question, but I just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Could you repeat the last part of it, Elizabeth? So, yeah, how do you uh, see WikiLeaks' role in journalism as well as their role in defending people from the harmful aspects of their government, whether that's, you know, the U.S. or Five Eyes governments or, you know. It's a really good question. And I'd like to ask the second part, <laughs> try to answer the second part first. Um, I really admire the fact that a jury or a judge or a court proceeding can look at WikiLeaks material and say, this is the real stuff. You can imagine the man and woman hours devoted to finding out flaws or some sort of cast that uh, some sort of tailoring that Julian might have done, and there isn't any. And so when you have the real deal, you have the real deal. And in my, in my experience of what I've heard is simply that uh, this has been material able to be used in court to help people who are accused of this or that mischief to show that the, the accusations are erroneous. Uh, the other part is that it gives us all kind of a model to, to pattern our, our lives about. Now, I used to be an intelligence analyst. Uh, now I'm writing like a journalist and I, and I had to learn journalism. It's very different, you know? You need to have I mean, intelligence analysts have to make judgments like the, that, that evening, right? Uh, journalists need to find at least two sources, right? <laughs> that was new to me, Good right? Good point, yeah. Be a little bit more careful. So, so Julian, uh, you know, he's got the authentic thing and then it can be corroborated, of course, with Craig Murray and others to help. But uh, so he's been really, uh, he's one of the few people that I admire as much as I do. And uh, as I say, I seek every opportunity to visit him. I advertise the fact that he's my friend and that uh, if I run into a guy like Mike Pompeo, I'm going to say, hey, you know, I don't like what, you, what you're saying about my friend. Uh, you may believe him, demons. Uh, I don't. But even if I did, Julian's not one of them. Absolutely amazing. Susie, I don't know if you had any other uh, questions for Ray that you'd like to ask or Kim, if you do. Elizabeth, let me say something else, if I may. Yeah. I very much admire uh, your role in helping Forensicator uh, bubble to the top. Uh, you know, we have all this expertise, but they're busy doing a lot of stuff. And when we learned that Forensicator and others had been so assiduous in ferreting out the metadata and then making sense out of it, you know, our reaction was, my Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Somebody's doing the work, you know? And of course, we went over it with a fine tooth comb and still are. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and it enabled us, frankly, enabled Bill Binney, Ed Loomis, both of them former technical directors of NSA, to say, yeah, 
this is the real deal. We can rely on it. Uh, we need to help others in VIPS understand what's going on, you know. But we put out that memo on the 24th of July, and we're very proud of having done so. Without your help, what would have happened? Well, I'm completely beyond humbled to hear that. Thank you so much. And I was, um, you know, I wish Forensicator could be here and, and actually, you know, stand up and take some of the the praise that he absolutely deserves from that. And I was just really honored to be the person that, you know, broke coverage of and kind of brought his his investigation to light for the for the public. Right. So thank I you think, so much. I think Forensicator is a she. Maybe, maybe, very possible. It could be so bright uh, if it were he. That's true. Very true. Good point. <laughs> Absolutely right. Ray, Thank I think you. you've I think you've just made Elizabeth's year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My whole life. I I can't even speak to how humble I feel. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you. It's so fantastic to see. Um, Elizabeth has worked so hard and it was such a big deal when the nation uh, cited disobedient yeah. media's work and, and specifically Elizabeth's reporting. It was a huge deal and even more so a huge deal when veterans, veterans, veterans help me say it, please, somebody. I'm getting my tongue stuck. Intelligence professionals. professionals for <laughs> Thank you. When you guys stepped up and, and used your collective power and reach um, to circulate that truth, that was a huge deal. Uh, but I would really like to take this back to Julian now. Yeah. He's sitting in the embassy. He is, has had his communication severed with the people that he loves and who love him and with, with the public. Um, how do you feel about that, Ray? I feel like getting on the next plane and going to visit him. But I'm informed very recently that someone tried to do that today and got turned away. Do you have confirmation of that? No, we did just speak with Emmy before, who was at the embassy today with a number of people um, holding vigil for Julian, and they are returning at 10 a.m. tomorrow to hold another vigil event. But, oh, we did hear actually from Cass. She let us know that Julian does have a lawyer with him. Oh, good, good. So he does have legal support with him. Mm -hmm. But what are the more broad issues here around Julian's treatment, you know, for freedom of the press, free speech, and, and the human right to communicate? You know, it's so hard for me to talk about freedom of the press when I've watched the media go over the last few decades. Um, clearly, uh, the incoming Secretary of State, former CIA director, Mike Pompeo, doesn't have any respect for the press. You know, there was a period seven years ago where uh, the powers that be in this capital in Washington tried to make Julian out to be not a journalist, but a, you got it, terrorist. He was a terrorist. <laughs> I had an experience with CNN. They had about 18 people on saying, ah, Julian is a terrorist, he's a terrorist. And then somebody must have said, well, you know, fair and balanced, you ought to have one person on who, who would try to claim that he was a journalist. That, how, how about McGovern? Yeah, get McGovern. I had five minutes on with one a fellow who's become a star there now. And uh, of, course, of course, he's a journalist. And <laughs> the definition of a journalist is to see, ferret out the secrets that have not been revealed by the state. And uh, so, uh, well, what I have to say is if people are interested in that, just say McGovern, Assange, CNN, and they'll see five minutes of my last, <laughs> at the end of it, they said, well, I guess that would be it. <laughs> well, that was it. McGovern has been banned from CNN for the last seven years. Well, why? Well, we know why. Was it worth it? Of course it was worth it. So yeah, the press is, uh, is so, so, Bustle. And it's the same as, a, you know, I've been in Germany. Uh, it's, it's just as bad there. Uh, you know, we have Ulf, Ulf Kotte, uh, the German, used to work for the, the Frankfurt Allgemeine, uh, and he, he talked about CIA uh, infiltrating these places. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he wrote a book about it and it had a little spurt. And then all of a sudden they said, yeah, but he's a, He's a this or that or the other the character defamation, and nobody's allowed to mention Ulf Kote anymore. So 
It's bad in this country. Uh, not only are VIPS, for example, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, banned from any major media, we can't even get on Democracy Now! Really? I didn't know that. I had in no idea. Goodness. Yeah. Wow. I don't want to hear anything, see? I mean, I describe it, you know, after November 8th of 2016, the election, something, a very virulent virus set in in Washington. It was called HWHW virus. HWHW for Hillary would have won if it weren't for, and it couldn't be if it weren't for the fact that nobody trusted her or <laughs> that she didn't go to the right states to campaign or that she was a terrible candidate. It couldn't be it. It had to be something else. And ah, the Russians, the Russians did it. And, you know, that virus. And of course, you know, I, I, I try to make clear that I think Trump is the worst United States president we ever had. I disagree totally with all of his policies, except that one which said we should have a decent relationship with Russia. That I agree with. But, you know, that having been said, how this, it was the equivalent of PTSD. People couldn't cope, cope with the fact that, and of course I can understand, particularly if you're a woman. I mean, my God, it's outrageous the things he bragged about doing. And I have family, lots of women, and they just can't think about anything else. They might be, you know, might be right about anything. And so it's a very virulent thing. And of course, it's stoked up by those who see real advantage in profiteering from tension with Russia. And that's Definitely. a good thing, you know? I mean, peace is really bad for that business, let's face it. Tension, you know, coops, movements are great for that business. And you can see it in the, the stock market, the, the arms dealers and so forth. So, so this kind of all congealed. And then the Democrats thought, well, the best thing they could do for, for the election coming up later this year is to make sure that they say that uh, Trump owes his election to Vladimir Putin, and we should get back at him now. And so it's, it's, it's kind of really strange, but yeah, I've seen a lot of stuff with the 55 years here in Washington, but never, never stuff this quite this bizarre. I've seen the press abuse things, particularly before the Iraq invasion, but this is even worse. It, and <laughs> I, it's hard for me to hear what he's saying in that, but it was pretty bad in you know, early, 2003. This, in a sense, is even worse because we're dealing with a, a country that, that can help us destroy the rest of the world. And you know, I have nine grandchildren. And I like them to have a chance to live, if not as long as I am, at least almost as long and still have clean water and clean air. So it's terrible stuff. Absolutely. And I think one really good point that Susie made in her article, um, being Julian Assange, at the very start was um, it addressed that point you made about Trump and his, um, you know, negative um, image with women. But at the same time, you had Hillary Clinton's husband, you know, who also has been accused of sexual abuses against women. So, um, you know, she made the really good point that it was a bad, false choice either way. So, yeah, you know, this is a sexual thing. You know, I, uh, you know, that's what they do when they run out of the tools and uh, they could see the inordinate influence uh, that the United States has in Sweden and how they played uh, with this or that prosecutor and got them to act in, in that unconscionable way. Uh, you know, people have to be naive to not to understand what was going on there. It's consensual, whatever it was. And, and even the women involved say, no, we don't want to do this. So, you know, it, it's very clear what happened. And this is what they do to people uh, who are troublesome and they want to really uh, repress. And now they've succeeded, in my view, bringing the uh, Ecuadorians around to saying, well, we need to put the clamps on. We have to, we have to address this and make sure the world, the, the free world, the still free world, and the free press advocates, to the degree they still exist, like us, need to speak out and make sure people know the stakes that are involved here. 
Absolutely. And um, speaking of all of that, we have some great questions for Ray uh, coming in on our Etherpad. And um, one was from the actually um, titled uh, Bullshit Man. He's, he asked what Ray, he wants to ask Ray, uh, with your background in the CIA, can you shed light on how exactly the agency would be monitoring, dealing with, um, you know, Assange and how they want to know how deep and wide would the operation against Assange go, in your opinion, if, if you have any thoughts on that? Well, very deep. Yeah. <laughs> very, very big, yeah. And to the degree it exceeds the, the possibilities from the uh, CIA station there in London, then they, of course, they have the willing help of MI5 and MI6 and GCHQ and all the other people that just say, oh, yes, can we, what else can we do now? So, you know, going into that embassy, I'm always kind of feeling, will I feel the vibrations? <laughs> will, will, yeah. I, will I survive this? So, yeah, it's, uh, it's just so sad to see the, the British acting as toadies uh, of us and the, the latest uh, business about the poisoning and all. I mean, my God, not only the British, but all the rest of the Europeans are falling into line. Uh, how many Russians can you throw out? Oh, uh, well, uh, four. How about you? Five. Uh, New Zealand. They're looking around for Russians to throw out, <laughs> you know? And uh, so it's become a, a really horrible example of toadyism, of sycophants. People who still think that it's 1946 and that they have to count out to the victor, the, the victor on the West side not the victor that really won the war for the West and that was the Soviet Union. Wow, amazing thoughts on that, amazing points. Kim, do you have any comments on, on New Zealand and how it's uh, recently kicked out all of the uh, Russian diplomats and ambassador, I think? Oh well, yeah, I, uh, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, you know, it's actually quite a bit of a stir in the, in the local New Zealand media uh, that the prime minister said uh, she doesn't, believe there are any Russian spies in the country. And I mean, New Zealand is a small village on the world stage. You know, we only have four and a half million people here. So the prime minister of New Zealand is, uh, is um, the mayor of a medium sized town in the Philippines. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's when you compare the number of people that we have and the significance that we have on the world stage, uh, you can understand why the prime minister would say something like this. You know, we are just not on the radar. And that is the very reason why I moved to New Zealand, because I wanted to live in a country and raise my kids in a country that is not on any, any nuclear target list. Uh, and that is not, uh, uh, you know, the, the, facing any kind of attacks or, you know, it's too far away for terrorists to, to get anything done. And it's, uh, it's like I said, you know, if ever there's World War III, um, you know, this is the one place where you could probably sit it out. Well, fantastic points. All fantastic points. And if anybody in the YouTube chat has any questions for Kim, myself, Susie, or especially Ray, please uh, put them in the Etherpad. We would love to um, ask Ray some questions for you as we continue this um, vigil on behalf of Julian Assange in the hopes that he will get his internet connected as soon as possible. So, I have a very simple question for Ray, if, awesome. uh, if you don't mind, Ray. Sure. Um, how large do you think the Russia department in the intelligence community is in the United States. How many people, how much of a budget, how, how much do you think um, uh, in their operation is uh, looking at Russia, analyzing Russia, uh, you know, and trying to provide intelligence on Russia and, uh, you know, how, how big is the Russia department of the deep state? Well, Kim, uh, I need to distinguish between the two agencies that I talk about. CIA is really two agencies. Uh, the analysis part, which is the reason that Harry Truman set up the CIA, he wanted one place 
which would be central and have access to all information on a given issue or country and be able to speak directly to him without fear or favor, not worrying about the Pentagon, not worrying about the State Department. That's what Harry Truman wanted. Now, there are certain things that you have to find out through spies. And so this analysis group needed to have a clandestine capability to recruit and run spies to collect information to, to fill out the picture. So it had to be secret, okay? Now, it was all set, the legislation was, was composed in 1946, and then all of a sudden, after the war, the covert action people came back. Okay. Now, the people came home from the war, very courageous, very imaginative, very patriotic people who have, were specialists in jumping behind lines and overthrowing governments and bringing Ho Chi Minh into Hanoi, you know, and so forth. And they said, well, uh, thanks a lot for the applause. And it was well-deserved applause. Thanks a lot. Uh, you want us to hang around? I mean, like, uh, uh, do you need the capability to overthrow governments? Uh, the question answered itself. George Kennan who was running things in those days in the State Department said, yeah, we need you. The Russians are doing this. All of if the Russians do it, we got to be able to do it. And so the question arised, should we have a Department of Overthrowing Government? No, that didn't sound quite right. So some idiot, and I used the, the word advisedly, said, hey, we're creating this secret organization here, this analysis group, and the legislation is all prepared. Let's let's just bring all, all the overthrowers of government right in there and there'd be one big happy family. Give me a break. We are never a big happy family. You can't be waging a war in Nicaragua, for example, and have any credibility when Congress or anyone else asks you, what do you think about that war? You think that's a good idea? You think you're going to, is there a drug running on you? So, so you can't, it, it was, I served under nine directors. And uh, most of them were able to negotiate this thing in a reasonably sensible way. But as the years have gone by, the covert operators, the people who overthrow governments in like, oh, Kiev on Russia's doorstep, those people have gotten all the money and all the attention and, and all the, you know, all the big jobs to do. Now the analysts, after Russia fell, well, the Russian analysts went off to be what? terrorist hours or targeteers for drones. Now, how did they justify assuming all these covert operators into the CIA analysis group that Truman wanted? They added to the legislation, the director of central intelligence, this is a quote, the director of central intelligence shall, shall provide such other services related to intelligence as the president shall from time to time direct, period. Now, CIA directors, depended, depending on their integrity, inter have interpreted that as, hey, if the president tells us to do something, there's the legislation, we just go ahead and do it, right? Well, that doesn't make them innocent from US or international law, but in many respects, that's how it's been. And the only break on that is the so-called Congressional Oversight Committees, which have turned out to be Congressional Overlook Committees because they're intimidated by the they're supposed to be no, long, long answer, <laughs> short answer is this. Um, the, the people who run the, the secret wars, not so secret wars with the moderate rebels in Syria, the people who overthrow governments like happened in Kiev with advance notice on YouTube two, and a half, or two weeks before, those people are pretty much running the day. The people who are asked to evaluate, is it a good idea to, uh, to, to uh, do a coup on Russia's They either are really dumb, no historical perspective, or realize that the best career move is, oh yeah, we're gonna do that, let's see what happens. So sorry about that, but that's how I look at it. It's really sad to watch. Um, the question was, 
how large do you think the Russia department in the intelligence community in the US is? How many, like if you would have to make a guess, how many people, how, how big of a budget is involved in just dealing with Russia? Well, again, uh, I would say on the covert action side, if you include the kinds of people that orchestrate coups in Ukraine, uh, I would say hundreds, hundreds. If you would talk about the analysis side, I would say probably 30, three of whom know anything about Soviet or Russian history, World War II, how the Russians feel about things uh, or anything having to do with whether Putin is saying things more close to the truth than our president. Now, we know from discovery that uh, the Pentagon and uh, the DOJ and together with the uh, CIA have created a task force, the WikiLeaks task force, which is 300 people strong, 300 people full time working on dealing with the threat of WikiLeaks, uh, with WikiLeaks supporters, donors, to know everything about WikiLeaks and anyone who's supporting WikiLeaks. Would you say that that is a relatively large a department or? Yes, I've seen those reports. I would certainly acknowledge that there, it's very large. I'm not sure if that's corroborated or not, uh, but And with all the people you had working and holding the hands of the Swedes and, and the British and uh, the Ecuadorians, you put them all together, yeah, it's a lot of people. So I'm not surprised. Hmm. Now, I asked you the questions about the Russia department in the deep state because my suspicion is that peace with Russia would result into... Uh, uh, you know, a large reduction in, in manpower and budget for people that are currently keeping the threat alive and, you know, working on the threat of Russia. Uh, so if Trump would have succeeded with uh, a more peaceful relationship with Russia, do you think that the deep state uh, would have, would have uh, had to get rid of a lot of people and, and get a big budget cut. Yes. And you, you put your finger on a very good point. Uh, I would widen that out, though, and, and emphasize that the biggest winner in all this is the so-called military, industrial, congressional, security services, media complex. Now... Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex, right? Well, he wanted to say military industrial congressional complex, but they don't, oh, no, no, I, for God's sake, you know, it's bad enough you're saying military industrial, don't say, well, congressional. How do congressmen get elected? Well, they get money, where they get it from? Lockheed, Raytheon, uh, uh, you know, all the defense industry. So what we have is a, is a system where the arms manufacturers and the arms traders, let me interject here. I don't usually quote the Pope, okay? He and I have uh, problems. <laughs> I think I'm a good Catholic. I think he's a, he's a cafeteria Catholic. Anyhow, um, when he came before Congress two and a half years ago, and he said, and I quote, the main problem, gentlemen and ladies, is the blood-drenched arms traders. What did they do? Yay, yay. And then if you look closely, they're, they're looking in their inside pocket here to make sure that the last uh, envelope from Lockheed and the one from Raytheon is still there. It was giving hypocrisy a bad name, for God's sake. Because the way it works is these arm manufacturers and traders make a lot of money by sending stuff to, selling stuff to Israel and to, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, for God's sake. And all well, that money comes back, and then they're very generous, these guys, and they give it to the, to the congressional guys, and then they vote for more appropriations for defense expenditures, and then they win. And, uh, give me a break. It's really, really bad. And so uh, when, when the Pope had his finger on it, the only problem is 
and this is my problem with the Pope, when the arch blood drenched arms trader, his name is, his name is uh, Trump, came back from Saudi Arabia, having solidified, I think it was a hundred, more than a hundred billion dollars worth of arms trade. And he's gonna stop in the Vatican. And I'm saying, all oh, right, this is terrific. Surely the Pope will remind him of what he said before Congress about the big problem being the blood drenched arms trader. And so I'm waiting there and, and Trump comes in and my progressive friend said, look at Francis, how courageous he was because for the first five photo ops, he didn't smile didn't smile. Then he smiled, but he didn't say diddly about arms traders, even though two days before Trump had solidified this thing with Saudi Arabia. What's my point here? What did, what did the Pope give Trump? He gave him an encyclical. Now, was it a good encyclical? Encyclical, for those of you who don't know, is the most authoritative writings of the, of the, the papacy. And this one was good. It was on the environment, right? So he wanted him to have that. But you know what that reminded me of? It reminded me of after World War II, when Albert Camus was invited to talk to Dominicans in a monastery in France. And they asked him, now, uh, Albert, you, uh, you're not a believer, but what do you think of how the church acted during World War II? And what he said was this. He said, Yes, I'm a non-believer, but I have to tell you, I waited for four years with bated breath for something pronouncement coming out of Rome. Me, an unbeliever? Yes, but there was nothing coming. And later my friend said, but there was, there was an encyclical. And I, Camus said, what's an encyclical? And they explain it's a very pronounced thing. And he, Camus says, now, my dear monks, uh, if an encyclical is wonderful, but it's not, it's not publicized or not talked about from the pulpit, what good is that? Whose fault is it that no one knows about what the, what the papacy stands for? My point is simply this, that unless you have people have some claim to moral authority, and you know, some, some, what's the word? I mean, nobody's going to shoot the Pope, I don't think. Uh, unless they're willing to speak out in a consistent way, not just with rhetoric, uh, you're going to have this arms trader stuff, which is very powerful. A lot of people make money. One last example. You're from, Kim, I think you're from uh, Germany as well as, as Norway. Uh, anyhow, you know Mafai. Finland. 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 Got it. Okay. So here's Mafai. Big, big arms manufacturer in Germany. It's got a French... Uh, co co producer of arms, I forget the name of it, but they had been commissioned to build the common European battle tank. You now it's about ten years ago, and they're working on it. Was sort of dead in the water. Uh, you know why? Because nobody could argue with any credibility that this battle tank was number one uh, a good tool for modern warfare, and number two, what's the threat? They look to the east and say, well. Is Russia going to invade? Are they coming for the full drink? I don't think so. Now, as soon as the coup in Kiev happened, and Putin did the only sensible thing from his point of view in making sure that Crimea didn't go to NATO like the rest of the Ukraine threatens to be, as soon as that happened, whoa, what happened? Mafai stock went up, and uh, finally, they're building this common European battle tank. And, you know, I hate to, say, hate to tell them, but spend a lot of money for something that can be knocked out in the first couple of hours of, a, of modern warfare. So uh, these things are tangible. These things are provable and demonstrable. And it's a lot of money. And it's a lot of congressmen. And there's a lot of people profiteering on wars. And the real last thing I'm going to say is, who owns the media in our country? These same people. Six corporations profiteering on war. Now, they have a business section, maybe 10%, 15% of their, of their business areas, and they're, they're telling the people what's going on in the world. Now, what are the percentages? Let's say MSNBC. Um, General Electric used to own majority share in MSNBC or NBC. Now it only has 
only 49%. Um, what's the prospect that MSNBC is going to let people that differ with uh, Mad Rachel Maddow come on and say, you know, Rachel, uh, the Russians really aren't as bad as, you know, they're not this, they're not demons like you said. You know, what, what would that do to, to uh, GE's bottom line on jet engines that they love to sell, sell for jet aircraft? I mean, so this stuff is real, it's discernible, it's just not in the public eye because, precisely because of the media who doesn't tell the true story. Thanks, that's a, a comprehensive answer. Thanks for not saying long-winded. Well, I think it brings up a really interesting point about um, also the recent um, reports we've had from a number of independent journalists that have pointed out the CIA's infiltration of the media, as well as the report um, that Julian Assange really pointed to that showed how much the CIA and military intelligence operatives were um, running for Congress in, as Democrats. So, Let me give you a very, a very, can I give you a very recent example? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, we know Vladimir Putin made that big address on the 1st of March where he advertised these new weapons, but he also said, let's talk about these things now. Now, now that you know what we have, we need to sit down and talk. Well, there was not much. There was a lot of consternation and nobody knew exactly how to handle this, but five senators, U.S. senators, four of them Democrats, one of them Bernie Sanders, issued a joint statement saying, you know, despite all the problems we have with Russia, it makes good sense to negotiate on arms control. Now, very, very courageously, they put that up on their websites. <laughs> they didn't hold a press conference, but that still doesn't excuse the press for not running. No Americans who read the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal know about that initiative. How did we find out? by monitoring Soviet broadcasts, by God's sake. Toss had it as soon as it was wow. out, okay? So what, what's the point here? The point is that these things happen, nobody knows about it, and then the president goes against instructions. That's the way the New York Times and the Washington Post played it. Donald Trump, despite the instructions from his advisors, went ahead and congratulated Vladimir Putin, congratulated him, and worse still, said, we ought to talk about arms control. Did you know that? Well, you knew it. Nobody in America knows that. Okay, now what's that mean? That means that what the military, industrial, congressional, security services, media complex need to do is to put in precisely the guy who will make sure there's no arms control agreements. And who's that? That's John Bolton. What's John Bolton famous for? A lot of things. But it was he that nixed the ABM Treaty, the, the cornerstone of strategic stability from 1972 for 30 years, okay? It was he, Bolton, that told George W. Bush, look, we don't need that. We can build lots of weapons, lots of money, and the Russians can't do anything about it. Well, the Russians could do something about it, they have done something about it. And we're back to, should we negotiate? And who do they put in as national security advisor? The arch typical anti-Russian person, uh, John Bolton. So it's very powerful lobby. And uh, it's not far off to say that they're really in control. Trump is not. No matter what his inclinations may be, he's gonna, in the end, well, I hope not, but in the end, it looks like he will be better about following instructions if he listens to John Bolton. Yeah, that's the best uh, explanation and um, discussion of the appointment of John Bolton that I've heard. Um, and really of course, Trump has, been, Trump has been taking the advice of Kissinger and Kissinger was whose advisor? Hillary Clinton's. Um, sorry, guys, I'm just going to break in for one second because WikiLeaks has just sent a tweet that I would like to share with you. They say awesome. that claims made by Ecuador's public affairs office that WikiLeaks editor Julian Assange, arguably the world's best known free speech activist, is under a gag agreement are perhaps unsurprisingly entirely false. 
that he was not bound by any such agreement and therefore logically would not be in violation of it. Can I get your comment on that? Well, this, of course, is what they call material. <laughs> this is material evidence. That is the first I've heard of this. The uh, media today, of course, has all been accepting this as, uh, as flat fact, that when the Ecuadorians uh, had problems last December, if memory serves, and they said, please uh, don't embarrass us uh, by pronouncing on, on uh, things that would embarrass the Ecuadorian government, uh, there was an inference there that the Ecuadorians had actually uh, imposed a agreement with Julian that was, uh, if, if some of these reports are correct, that was signed by Julian. Okay, I promise not to do this. Now, that always sort of, sort of bothered me because <laughs> I can't see Julian uh, agreeing to do something like that. Whether he agreed or not, I think the justice issue, Calhoun. It's a justice issue for Pete's sake. And, and Julian is determined, hell-bent and determined to make sure that somebody in the world gets a chance to find out what's really going on there. Yeah, I think, um, unfortunately, with Julian himself silenced, we don't have m many more details available to us than than this tweet but once again we see that the wikileaks account which we're constantly told is run by julian himself is sure enough functioning just fine without him um, which is a point that we've repeatedly made many of the recent slurs against wikileaks have been dependent upon the premise that julian is the sole controller of the account um, wikileaks supporters knew that that was not the case but it has been projected through the press that it was. So yet again, just as with the last time that his internet connection was cut, we see that sure enough, Wikileaks communications channels are still functioning. I find that to be significant as well. That's true. And uh, that's the major point, really. Uh, the notion that uh, Julian sits at his desk there and uh, uh, orchestrates 100% uh, of this stuff is obviously wrong. And uh, these kinds of things, uh, from what I know about the technology, are very elusive. And there are all kinds of mechanisms to make sure that the job continues to get done, even if Julian temporarily, hopefully, is uh, uh, rendered uh, uh, unable to communicate. Okay, I would like to bring in now a couple of other guests that we have with us. We have got Raymond Johansson and Bailey Lamont from Pirate Parties International. Guys, can you hear me all right? Hi, Bailey. Hey. Hi, I can see you. Yeah, my, uh, I, I don't know. I had some kind of internet issue for a second there. I just kind of got... Cool, and raised with you? Awesome. Okay, I know that you guys had a statement prepared that you would um, like to address the situation of what's happening with Julian from the perspective of the Pirate Parties. So please take the floor. Yes, yes, Bailey, would you like me to start or would you like to do the deed? Doesn't matter to me. I mean, we, we didn't really prepare a statement. I mean, we do have thoughts and we have, you know, well wishes to bring from, you know, as, uh, as pirates. Um, I can start off, Ray, or you can go ahead. Well, this is really simple. Um, we care about, uh, well, basically we hate censorship. We hate be people being told to shut the fuck up. And that's what happened to Julian today. And um, Pirate Parties International think that the, the governments of Spain wanting to shut up uh, Catalonia made Ecuador uh, take Julian Assange and WikiLeaks internet away. That's what we believe and we're mad about it, right? Yeah, so, you know, as, as pirates, so I'm, I'm Canadian. Um, I'm affiliated with the Pirate Party of Canada. Um, most of my focus now with the pirate movement at this time is, is more international. Um, Ray's 
Um, I'm also the vice chair of Pirate Parties International, I should mention that. Um, so Ray is also on the board of Pirate Parties International, and uh, he's also from the Pirate Party of Norway. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, as pirates, uh, you know, we really, our values, we really believe in, in transparency and um, and democracy and free speech. And, uh, you know, as everybody here is well aware, um, Julian has been fighting for those values for a very long time. Um, we are, you know, most of us are pretty staunch supporters of WikiLeaks and have been for a very long time. Um, and, uh, you know, hearing about about Julian's internet getting cut off today and uh, the fact that his right to have visitors at the Ecuadorian embassy, um, you know, that being taken away as well. Um, we really feel that that is a grave injustice. Um, and, you know, considering everything that he sacrificed for, um, you know, the transparency cause and, um, you know, just, I mean, the very basic um, fight for, you know, democratic values such as transparency. And I mean, it even, you know, it goes, it goes down to like the public participation in government and, and the public's ability to have an influence on what the government does. And, um, you know, the first step to that is transparency and understanding the mechanisms of government and the mechanisms of uh, things like the deep state. And um, we, we really believe that that cause is important. And as pirates, we, um, you know, we, we try to fight for that and WikiLeaks has been fighting for that. And, um, you know, something to point out, um, you know, just like, just like all of us, um, Julian needs the internet to, you know, not only do his work, but just to communicate with the world, communicate with the public. Um, you know, there's also his his friends and his family, his loved ones. Um, he he deserves that very basic right to communicate with the people who are important to him and to communicate with, um, you know, people who are fighting for the same things that he is. And, um, you know, just uh, keeping that support going for WikiLeaks. And, uh, you know, so... <laughs> I mean, when you hear about internet being cut off, like some people might be very quick to dismiss that and be like, oh, well, that's that's not the end of the world, having your internet cut off. But for Julian, given his situation, that is a very big deal. Um, you know, being stuck in that embassy, like the internet is, is, you know, a very important tool for him to just have contact with the world, right? It's something that a lot of us take for granted when we're not, you know, not being in a situation like he is where, where somebody else, you know, in this case, like connected to, you know, people connected to a nation state, representatives of a nation state having, um, you know, that kind of control over that, you know, being able to just take away his internet. Um, so people can say it's not a big deal, but but it, it really is a big deal. And um, the whole issue of free speech, I mean, you know, um, I just want to say before I make my next point that um, we really commend and love Ecuador for everything they have done for Julian Assange. The fact that they have granted him asylum, they have been so good to him. And, and you know, obviously Julian is, is really appreciative of that. His, supported, his supporters are very appreciative of that. Um, we're very thankful that Ecuador has, has been so good and has, you know, protected him the way that they have. Um, and part of, you know, the whole point of this is to protect his human rights. And there's a very important human right that is being taken away when they do something like cut off the internet, and that is the right to free speech. Article uh, in the, in the, in the uh, universal... Uh, or the, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19 states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So, you know, he, the right to free speech, the right to self-expression is a basic human right. And, and the United Nations has, has declared that. And, um, and, but that's getting taken away from Julian when, when you take away his internet, right? That's, that's, that's censorship. Um, and, and, you know, he's being censored because he's making powerful people angry. I mean, he's been doing that for a long time. 
He's been making powerful people angry for a very long time. Um, but, you know, when you're protecting somebody's human rights, uh, we we feel as though free speech is a very important one. And uh, that, that shouldn't get taken away just because he's making powerful people angry. We can understand that Ecuador may be under political pressure that happens. Um, but I mean, all we can say is don't cave into that, please. Like, don't take away, don't take away Julian's voice. Um, and yeah, so again, our whole point of being here is just to show our support for Julian. Uh, thank you for thank organizing you. this, by the way. This is amazing. And it's very, very important that we we demonstrate our support. Um, so thank you. Thank you so thank you so much for being here. And it's really heartening to see pirates really visibly showing his support for Julian because that solidarity is so so important. And I know that he will deeply appreciate every single person who is fronted to advocate for him tonight. Ray Johansson, did you have anything you want to add? Well, I don't know. Uh what I can add, but I'm really, really, uh, I'm sorry, can I say motherfucking mad? <laughs> no, we can't say that. <laughs> no swearing, Ray. H.A. Goodman isn't, H.A. Goodman is not here yet, though he is incoming, so we don't need to give any profanity alerts yet. <laughs> okay. So I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll not say that, but, but seriously, I'm really motherfucking mad because this um, this is not about Julian. This is not about Julian Assange at all. This is about uh, really, really powerful uh, nations trying to fuck up Julian Assange. Um, and wait, they're trying to fuck up the transparency of it all. They're trying to make us stop supporting people that makes things come into the light, right? Yeah, okay. well, when you... Sorry, go ahead. Isn't that right? Isn't that right, Kim? They want us to stop showing what they're about their lies and everything. Yeah, Julian is exposing the darkness with light and the darkness doesn't like the light. So they are fighting him and they would uh, celebrate if he would just disappear off this earth. Yeah. Uh, do you know, uh, you know, you know, magic is, is cute and, and sexy, right? Magic is, we all love magic. Somebody doing magic. But dark magic uh, is way, way worse. Uh, and this thing where we have a, docu uh, a democracy and then we have what you call dark democracy. What's in that pipe, Ray? <laughs> uh, THC. <laughs> I, I think um, Ray makes a really good point, though, that, um, you know, people who do make sacrifices and take action um, to bring uh, certain information to light, um, about the dark forces that exist in the world, uh, those people do get targeted very heavily. And when those people get targeted, their freedoms get taken away. That is a threat to everyone. I mean, we need to fight for their freedoms, like, obviously, because, I mean, just because we we should anyway. But I mean, we, we also should keep in mind that it is a threat to all of us. Um, if, if it happens to one person, it can happen to everyone. And, and it's a very basic... Um, it's a, it's a very basic value that I think a lot of us, um, you know, political people, progressives, uh, people who support whistleblowers and people who speak out against the surveillance state and, and the deep state, people who are trying to change the world. I mean, that's something that um, we all have to take very seriously. Um, so, you know, Julian being in the situation that he is, I mean, it's outrageous 
just how long this has been going on and the amount of shit that he has been put through by the United States, obviously, um, also Sweden up until very recently and, and the UK, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's extremely fucked up that it's happened. It's been going on for as long as it has. And, um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's been too long. Right. And he should be, he should be out of the embassy. He should, he should have freedom. Um, he deserves freedom and, um, you know, but in the meantime, in the meantime, if, he's going to be stuck in the embassy for a while. He should at least have, he should at least be connected to the rest of the world, however he can. And the internet is crucial for that. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's how it goes. Do you have anything to add, Ray? Anybody? Well, a lot, but it's okay. <laughs> oh god well we're doing pretty well i think we've been streaming over four hours now facebook actually we hit the facebook stream limit which is four hours and our tech guys have had to go ahead and um start a new stream actually on facebook so we're officially oh. on our second facebook stream but this is ricocheting all around the internet and is an incredibly special amazing event I'm just having the next lot of social media metrics sent to me last I saw, which was about 45 minutes ago, we were over 60 million impressions on Twitter, which is just an, an absolutely incredible amount. I see that we are trending in the UK at number three for the hashtag reconnect Julian. And I know that we were trending in multiple other countries before that. So I'll show you guys the metrics. Um, I've received confirmation that the most amazing journalist in Australia, in my opinion, Caitlin Johnston, is going to be joining us. Julian, oh, oh, no, no. Julian has shared her work on a number of occasions. And also H.A. Goodman is also going to be joining us. He has been relentlessly posting about Julian um, for a substantial amount of time now. And Julian has also shared his work on multiple occasions. So this event is so unique. We have heard from people who were with Julian at the embassy not only not a week ago. We've heard from supporters at the vigil at the embassy today and who will be at the vigil event at 10 a.m. London time tomorrow. We have heard from Kim, who's Julian's longtime friend. We've heard from Ray, who's Julian's longtime friend. I'm just really amazed, actually, that we've been able to put this all together and bring everyone together in such a short span of time. We've got the pirates here repping the international activist movement, privacy activist movement, which is just totally amazing. I'm so proud of everybody for pulling this off. I just think it's absolutely exceptional. How are you feeling, Kim? I'm good. Chill. I'm a little bit tired because... Uh... As you know, I haven't slept. I was about to go to bed when they cut off uh, Julian's internet and I decided I'm not going to go to sleep until everyone in the world knows how ridiculous this is and uh, until we have a movement going to get uh, internet uh, connections and, and communications re-established for Julian. Excellent. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so just before you you brought Ray and I on, um, you shared something, some kind of statement. I don't I don't remember where it was from, I forgot already, but um it, it, oh, it was a tweet from WikiLeaks and it said right. yeah, and, and it said that um something along the lines of Julian's not under contract. Like, yeah, yeah. So, okay, he's not under contract, but like what, I mean, they're, they're doing something though. I mean, like what, okay, just cause he's not under contract. So what do they, like, what do they mean by that exactly? So like, what is their justification for, um, for censoring him the way that they are? I mean, interfering, supposedly interfering in the affairs of 
another state or something. I just, I just don't understand their justification basically. Like it, but well, uh, Ecuador has released uh, a statement uh, after they turned off uh, Julian's uh, communication channels. Mm -hmm. And they said that um, there is some kind of understanding, uh, you would think an agreement uh, of some sort, that uh, Julian would uh, agree to a certain uh, set of ground rules uh, and, uh, you know, in exchange for um, the continued support uh, of Ecuador. Now, what that entails, I don't know. Uh, you would suspect that Ecuador wouldn't put out, um, you know, a, a public statement uh, if there wasn't something to it. Uh, maybe it's not you know, an agreement to gag him in any way, but maybe it's some kind of, you know, softer clause where uh, he is going to make his best effort to avoid conflict for Ecuador uh, with his releases or something of that sort, you know, kind of a, a, a soft uh, clause that they are now using to basically say, um, you know, we don't uh, like you uh, saying certain things. We're put under pressure here. You know, we thought we had an understanding. And that is what often happens. You, you, you have an understanding, but one party is seeing it this way and the other party is seeing it that way. And maybe Ecuador is stretching it quite far to now claim that uh, Julian is uh, somehow in breach of that agreement. Uh, I think that is probably why he has his lawyer there, why they are looking at these statements and why they are putting out very clear rebuttals saying there is no uh, agreement uh, that would allow for any kind of gagging. And I believe that 100%, if that's what WikiLeaks says, then that's how it is. But here's the interesting thing. I think Ecuador actually believes that Julian has given them some kind of undertaking uh, to relieve stress from them, you know, relieve stress from the bullies in the United States, relieve stress from the UK, and so on. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, Ecuador has just taken it a bit too far now by uh, interpreting what was agreed much more aggressively than it would uh, it would allow and that is you know often the case when you have agreements you know you have these misunderstandings but i'm 100% uh, believing wikileaks that there is no gagging agreement that's what they just tweeted uh, so the ecuadorians they need to explain what the hell they're talking about. Why do they say Julian is in breach of some clause uh, if Julian says it doesn't exist? The Ecuadorians need to uh, uh, clarify this. Uh, and if there is no such clause, well then th this whole reason why they are doing it is completely fabricated. Kim, can, can, I, ask yeah. you, can I ask you a question, Kim? Yes. Yes. Uh, I had you know, one of the guys that doesn't like Julian much, uh, Stanley Cohen. Do you know who Stanley Cohen is? Uh, heard the name. Stanley Cohen. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Stanley Cohen said to me that uh, that Julian Assange basically breached the agreement that he had with the uh, with the Ecuadorian government, um, where. You know, he signed uh, an agreement where uh, they told him not to talk to other people and make them, you know, hit the Ecuadorian government. It, did, did, he, did Julian breach the Ecuadorian government's uh, deal by hitting the... Uh, the what do you call them? The, the Catalonian people's right to vote or something? Well, let me just uh, read again what 
WikiLeaks has tweeted out, and I oh. think it it, uh, it will uh, make it crystal clear. I just need to find this tweet real quick. Just give me a second. Um, so WikiLeaks says, um, claims made by Ecuador's Public Affairs Office that WikiLeaks editor Julian Assange arguably the world's best known free speech activist is under a gag agreement are per her perhaps unsurprisingly entirely false. So he makes it crystal clear there is no agreement that uh, uh, forces him to be silent. But what I think, because you know, I'm a businessman I have signed, you know, hundreds of agreements with thousands of pages. There is maybe some kind of soft undertaking uh, to do the best Julian can to avoid any issues, you know, diplomatic issues for Ecuador, something of that sort. You know, and he would have signed that because, you know, he can say in good conscience, I'm not going out there trying to do anything on purpose to hurt Ecuador. You guys are helping me. I love you guys. Yeah, no problem. I'm signing this. But here's the thing. Someone might have sold this clause on the other side in the, in the Ecuadorian government as some kind of guarantee that Julian would, uh, you know, uh, if, if asked to remove something like this tweet, we know now from WikiLeaks that Julian was asked to remove a tweet that dealt with the history of a former Catalan president who was extradited uh, from the Nazis to Spain and then executed. That tweet specifically is the reason why Ecuador shut off his communications. And they have done that because they asked Julian to remove that tweet, by the way, which is completely idiotic if you think about it, because when a tweet has already been retweeted 15,000 times, like this one has, and then you take it down, everyone is like, why the hell is that taken down? It just increases the amount of attention and achieves the opposite effect. But here's what they have done. They have asked Julian to remove that tweet, and uh, Julian probably declined because he said, look, this is ridiculous. All I'm doing with this tweet is I'm presenting a fact, a historic fact. This is what happened. I'm just reminding people in Germany that uh, you have uh, done a, a grave mistake in the past by extraditing a former Catalan president who then got killed. Do not do this again. This is probably the, the context of educating everyone about that history. And the fact that Ecuador, based on uh, pressure from Spain, is, is uh, punishing Julian for not removing a tweet that is about a historic fact. It's not even about a new release of a new document. It is something that happened in 1940. And they cannot uh, uh, accept the truth of that historic fact because what it does, it paints a picture of uh, injustice repeating itself. That is the message that Julian was sending to the world with this tweet, saying, here we are again, history repeats itself, and uh, should we allow it? You know, and uh, of course, this is hitting right home, right into the heart of the German conscious. Because of our history, we are now not going to extradite Germany. When I say we, because I'm, I'm a German, I, I still feel German sometimes. You know, we are not going to extradite this guy uh, because we have made that historic error and someone got killed. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that is the power of this tweet. It is not that there's any kind of conspiracy involved or any kind of secret leaks. It is just the power of history 
that is going to change the minds of the German government about extradition. And that is exactly what the Spanish government wants to avoid. That's why they want to silence him. That's why they want uh, Julian to stop talking about this guy and his right and the injustice that the entire Catalan movement is facing right now in Spain. It's ridiculous. It's outrageous. And we should all applaud Julian for pointing these things out. It's politically inconvenient for Spain. And they are pressuring and bullying Ecuador to do something. And it's really a, a sad a moment for Ecuador that they have allowed this uh, to interfere, you know, with their, uh, with their noble attempt to try and protect Julian. And now they are becoming a part of the, of the problem. But I think they are going to realize that soon. I don't think they, uh, this is going to last very long. You know, I think Julian's communications will be reestablished and uh, that will be the end of it, you know, because there's no merit uh, to any allegation that Julian has done anything to hurt Ecuador in any way. Kim, your prediction that this would have ramifications in Spain and in Catalonia with the people of Spain has already come true. I've just been sent this information that I would like to show you. We have just hit 75 million impressions on hash reconnect, Julian from over 7,800 separate accounts tweeting about this hashtag. We have, it's clocking one tweet a second currently um, for a total of over 18,000 tweets just in the course of this event. But look where those tweets are coming from. I'll try and make this a little bit bigger so you can see it a bit better. Wow. Yeah. Number one, United States of America. Number two, Spain. Four hundred and, and, and that is what I said earlier. Spain has now achieved the absolute opposite of what they wanted to achieve. They have now put this topic on everybody's mind in Spain, especially in Catalonia. And uh, this is just going to backfire, you know, and you wonder why these people in power who abuse their power never learn from the mistakes of people that have done this kind of stuff so many times before in the past. They always fail. You know, you cannot uh, try and uh, erase the truth, especially historic truth, especially history. You cannot go and try and erase it. We see it over and over again, you know, where... Uh, there were Holocaust deniers and there were all kinds of people trying to change history. And this is the sick thing right now. Spain is doing that. And by doing it, they are making themselves look absolutely foolish. And uh, one has to wonder, isn't this again another great achievement of Julian Assange to know exactly where the pressure point is, to apply the, the needle and make them explode, uh, and by by exploding, exposing themselves uh, in in the way they have. You know, I I take my head off to Julian Assange for being so brilliant in just nailing the point. Uh, uh, you know, of of what it would mean for Germany to extradite this man, and it's not going to happen now. You know. And that's thanks to Julian. That's probably entirely thanks to Julian Assange. This guy is going to get justice, you know? What you described, it's almost like, it reminds me of uh, what they call the Streisand effect. Yeah. That's the right term. So. You know, they don't want to bring attention to something, but then in turn, their own actions bring a lot more attention to it than, than they wanted, they hope, than they hoped for. Um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully this thing doesn't last long. I mean, that's kind of the whole issue about like any kind of agreement with, with Ecuador. Like that's kind of, that's where I got confused because their statement kind of implied that. Right. But then it's like, was, was there some kind of agreement? What did he sign something? I mean, either way, it doesn't make any sense because I mean, like 
yeah, he, he was granted asylum by Ecuador, but I mean, his asylum shouldn't be conditional, right? He should be able to, to express his opinions on the internet, just like everyone else. And well, I mean, one thing is 100% sure. And I think everyone with half a brain is going to get this. Julian Assange has not signed an agreement to be silent about factual historic events. There's no way in the world that there's any such agreement. And for, for Ecuador to claim this is outrageous, you know, yeah. and they need to paddle back before they lose all credibility. Because if we know one thing about Julian Assange, he has never been proven wrong. You know, all his releases uh, are seen as, you know, uh, now pristine historic uh, documents. You cannot do this to a man who really knows what he's talking about. He knows his facts. He knows his history. And he has not breached any agreement. It's ridiculous. Uh, so I really hope that... Uh, you know, Moreno and, and uh, his, his government in Ecuador uh, are getting the grave mistake that they are making and that they are going to fix this. Absolutely. I think Ray McGovern, Ray McGovern was absolutely spot on before, and I actually tweeted out the quote from him that he said, Catalan is a justice issue, and Julian doesn't make any compromises when it comes to justice. Julian has time and time again put himself on the line for the cause of true justice. So Ray, I think you're absolutely spot on there. Well, thank you. Uh, it's nice to be spot on among some audience here. I don't get much, <laughs> I don't get much that kind of uh, reaction from uh, people here in the United States. Caitlin has just joined us. Welcome to Caitlin Johnston. Can you hear me, Kate? Oh, we might have hit our, oh, I think we're at max panelists now. Thank you, Pirates. Thank you so much. I have two more journos I have to bring in. Thank you so much for joining us. I deeply appreciate it, Bailey and Ray. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for having us and thanks for holding this event. Let's hope uh, not only Julian gets his internet back, but hopefully he'll, I mean, we say this at, like all the time, right? Hopefully he'll just be free and he'll be able to get out of the embassy soon. Free Julian. Free Thank Julian. you guys. Thank you so, so much. Kate, can you hear us? <clears throat> oh, you're muted, hon. Hold on one second. There you go. Oh, you got it. Hi. Hi. Hi everyone, this is exciting. This is so exciting. <laughs> it's a bit of circumstances, it's like meeting at a funeral, isn't it? No. Hello, Caitlin. Hi, Ray, how are you? Very good. Love your work. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. I love Caitlin. Caitlin. Caitlin, you are. Oh, Cassandra. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> really yeah. It's really amazing. I know, it's amazing. About, about <laughs> Lovely songs. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how we fit so many cool people into one stream, but we seem to be managing it. <laughs> That's very exciting. And it's so cool. You're our first Aussie in the house tonight, aside from Elizabeth the ex Aussie, the half Aussie. What do I call you, Elizabeth? Uh, oh, she's I said I said I guess I'm, I'm just a mongrel, I guess. It's fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Caitlin. She sounds pretty Aussie to me, but you know, I will take I will yeah. take that mantle. And I and I have to say I'm really, really, really fucking sorry that my country is so piss poor that they can't fix this. Like it would be so easy to fix this, but we're the fucking Washington's basement gimp. You know, we we don't do anything uh, unless it's uh, absolutely in the <laughs> highest interest of empire. Nothing to do with with our own citizens or anything we don't have any sovereignty that way so it seems like anyway <clears throat> or we're just a country full of dickheads one or the other <laughs> well you produced julian and ozzy also produced you and it produced elizabeth so there's three reasons that i have to still have some hope in you guys <laughs> 
that's that's not a great odds though is it that's That's true (laughs) but yeah like you know uh yeah it's pretty shitty there's not much happening in australian media media about this they ignore everything to do with Assange basically it's just embarrassing you can't really say any if you if you think that he should be out you can't say anything if you if you think he should stay there then uh, even that doesn't play well it's just pretty much radio silence about Julian Assange now the only person talking about it is like our equivalent of Donald Trump Pauline Hansen. she's the only one who ever says anything so that's freaking embarrassing as well I do remember so the, her yeah. I know what you're t- you're saying there yeah you're right. <laughs> so, why, is yeah. why, why is that, do you think? Like, why do we get the Pauline Hansons and the Nigel Farages and not, like, the heroes of, of the social justice movement who should care the most? I mean, it's called social justice, right? So what's going on? I think it must be just propaganda. I think we've been wedged and wedged and wedged um, by psyops for so long that people don't know way, which way is up. Um, we've become, uh, they've done a very good job of creating like this, this yuck factor around, um, uh, around doing anything good anymore. Like, it's all about feeling good. It's not, not about doing good. So like as soon as, you know, as long as you get your pronouns right and um, all of that sort of stuff, then then you're, uh, you're you're for social justice. You're a lefty, and that's fine. But as soon as it comes to actually being brave and step standing up, like stepping up and truth to power, then we just fall down. Like I I can't really explain it because it. I guess for a lot of you too, it would have happened to you too. My friends just became these kind of. You know, and maybe they just got old. Maybe they just got old. Like maybe, maybe that's just what happens and you get old and, and conservative and weird in your ways. I'm not sure. But, um, but, yeah, like, you know, when a lot of my friends who were very pro-Assange, very pro-transparency uh, to government, very pro-bringing truth to power, don't talk about it anymore. And, you know, if you ask them about Assange, they, talk, they have all their heads filled with lies about, you know, rape and uh, his, the, just all the smears have worked really well on them because they're targeted particularly for lefty brains, um, for those sorts of people. Uh, so, yeah, the, the fact that he does really great work um, and he does really great work for all of us doesn't seem to factor in. Caitlin, your work has been repeatedly shared by Julian, as with some of our other awesome people on the panel here. Um, I was saying earlier that each time that Julian shared my work over the years, I felt like it was like better, honest to God, better than winning the Pulitzer Prize. How does it, how, <laughs> how do you, how do you feel when Julian shares your work? And and I mean, just how cool is that for you? Yeah, well, I got a partner in crime here, Tim, who works with me, and we always have at least one high five. It's not, you know, it, it, it's a high five morning if he if WikiLeaks retweets or if Julian retweets. Yeah, because it's a it's a big, um, you know, this guy has devoted his life to working out what's going on behind the curtain. So when when you when Julian Assange thinks you're getting it right, you're probably getting it right. You know, he's he's stuck in that embassy with not much to do other than read lots of transcripts and work out what's going on. He's pretty much like the monk of uh, government transparency. And so, yeah, it's, it, it feels good when, when, uh, when he gives you a kind of pat on the back about that. So, yeah. I but, totally agree like, it that. also gets you a lot of shit. Oh, bring it on. <laughs> it also gives you a lot of <laughs> Yeah, my mentions are a mess because he he retweeted me. So, uh, so and, how do you, you know? Feel- you can't say anything anymore because I'll get I'll get uh, banned. So I, I can't oh, go and fight anymore. Oh that's right. We we forget that so easily that you already had a week in Twitter jail. Right. Yeah, sensitive. for defending me. Yeah, um, and that's that's. that's the um, weapon they can bring out at any point now. Is my internet really slow? 
Uh, it's a little bit choppy, but the audio is coming through really strong and you look beautiful. So don't worry about it. You're all good. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, how do you feel That's about today's how do you feel about today's news? What's that? How do you feel about today's news and what and what's been done to Julian? Oh, I'm devastated for him. I think that's this is really, really bad. Like to to be stuck in that embassy anyway, and now without any contact with the outside world, just must be the most disheartening thing. It's you know like solitary confinement. It is like jail. Like, um, and you can't even no phone calls or anything. So this like. I, you know, I feel his uh, personal pain for it. But also, fuck it, this is really weird. I think this is really weird. I think that, um, I mean, it's probably predictable uh, that Ecuador would take issue with things that were said about the Spanish government um, because there's a long history there. But, um, but yeah, I just think it's... <laughs> It's really tragic and I, I hope that we can actually, um, that this goes the reverse for them, that everyone starts retweeting the tweet that they want him to uh, to, to, to take down uh, and um, we strive in this upper storm. But also I hope that this is, you know, the last thing and that we get him out of there. People start to realise what they're doing to this man, you know, just out of sheer fucking stupidity and, um, you know, and kowtowing to power this is just wrong none of no one who like has a go at him at least to people like us benefits at all from him being in that embassy no one like the only people who benefit from him being in that embassy is very powerful people so no one who has you know who's just an average joe who wants you know a good life for their kids and stuff and a, like a safe planet should be uh should be doing the, the work of the establishment in trying to keep him in there. It's, it's really wrong. And it, I like, you know, and I thank anyone who's out there who is going into bat for Julian because you're on the right side of history and history will remember that you are and we will make sure of that. This is not something that will go missing, okay? So we're going to make sure that the people who stood up for him, are that we remember who they are rather than what happened with the fucking Iraq war, the people who, you know, like we forget so quickly who the monsters are. They're forgiven so quickly. Well, that's not going to happen this time. There'll be no forgiving and no forgetting. Yeah, they're not just forgiven, they're re-employed. Yes, re rehabilitated, re-employed, you know, like and they, George W. Bush just danced the other yeah. day. And, and CNN. New yeah. All over the place. What the fuck I is that? that out. I do not give a shit about that murdering warmonger. He killed a million people. He will always have killed a million people. That's who he is. So we got to see um, him dancing. Sorry to interrupt you, Caitlin. I had promised several okay. times on the stream that there was an official statement from Courage Foundation coming out and that I'd read it. And it had I've just okay. been sent it by Emmy. Um, it doesn't say a lot that we didn't know already, but here it is. Ecuador suspends Julian Assange's internet access and denies visitors. So it's basically confirming what Brian Eno and Yanis Varoufakis had said earlier today. Ecuador has confirmed today that it has suspended Julian Assange's internet access in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. In a message posted to Twitter, the Ecuadorian government says that the suspension is the result of Assange breaking a late 2017 agreement not to issue messages that supposed an interference in relation to other states. And there's screenshots there of the communications from Ecuador. Courage Foundation can confirm that in addition to having his internet access cut off, Julian Assange is currently unable to receive visitors at the Ecuadorian embassy. In response to the suspension, Brian Eno and Yanis Varoufakis issued a letter entitled Restore Julian Assange's Access to Visitors and the Outside World. And then there is a quote on that, from that. And then it says, the letter concludes by calling on supporters to sign a new petition launched by DM25, calling for an end to Assange's isolation. And then it links to, I believe, the change.org petition. Yes, the change.org petition, which you'll find on our hashtag and in many of our tweets. 
So that's the official word from the Courage Foundation. For anyone, anyone want to give a reaction? Yeah, I like to say something. Um, it's you know, it's uh, repeating <clears throat> what is already out there. Uh, the person that I admire the most when it comes to things like this and and putting it all into a very simple message is Glenn Greenwald. And WikiLeaks has just retweeted a tweet from him that I would like to read to the stream. Uh, Glenn Greenwald says, it's bizarre for a country to grant someone political asylum, then condition it on being barred from communicating with the outside world. It makes a mockery of asylum. Once proudly defiant, Ecuador is now depicting itself as a rather subservient to the West. And that is really what's going on here. We had a change of government in Ecuador and the new president uh, is not um, as committed, it seems, to uh, you know, supporting uh, Julian the way it was done in the past. And it looks like when you read the, the tweets from WikiLeaks very carefully, they blame the president of Ecuador directly and personally to be the party that is causing this issue, to be the person who has ordered uh, the Ecuadorian embassy uh, to take these drastic matters against Julian. And, uh, you know, the, the country of Ecuador and the government entered into a commitment when they accepted uh, Julian's uh, asylum and when they allowed him to stay in the embassy and that commitment needs to survive any change in government needs to survive any leader who doesn't agree with it anymore you can't just have an agreement sign an agreement do something according to a treaty and then back out of it because it isn't convenient anymore for the new leadership and that is exactly what is happening here and, uh, you know, Glenn Greenwald's uh, tweet really nails it. You cannot, on the one hand, give someone asylum, but then silence them at the same time. It's, it's, it m makes a mockery of it. And that is exactly what's happening here right now. I have a comment I'd like to add in response to what Courage Foundation said there. And it's just that I want to point out like um, that this entire stream is so successful in reaching so many people. And I want to um, just say it strikes me as a, an, uh, an example of how effective independent media is becoming. You know, we are the ones that are sitting here, not only uh, encouraging people to speak out for Assange, but reporting that this is happening. You know, you don't see CNN re reporting this in that same type of way. So I just thought that was really fantastic. And the way that Susie has pointed out the metrics of this stream, you know, reaching so many people. I mean, this is a real success in just independent journalism. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Elizabeth, um, I've just been sent the, I feel like I'm forever going on about yeah. metrics, but I have just been sent the next lot of metrics and it's only been 10, 15 minutes since the last lot. Um, I have to show you this because it's so significant. We're at 92,165,000 impressions, 8,606 accounts. I have never seen anything like it. At our most successful anti-spy bill event last year, and that was went right around the world, we, you know, we had Kiriakou and many other amazing people with us, we got 8 million Twitter impressions, and that was considered a, an astronomical success. We're at 92,165,000. Incredible. I really don't understand how really cool. <laughs> in the U.S. It's trending in the UK, it's trending in New Zealand, and it's trending in Canada. It's at number two in New Zealand, number three in the UK, and I can't remember what number, but somewhere up there in Canada. But apparently in the United States, you're Look, not allowed to know US, about it. Yeah. My flaws <laughs> in five words 
is trending and it only ha- it's trending at number two and it only has 2,767 tweets. What? <laughs> Ray, I know Ray wanted to say something. Break yeah. in. Uh, I guess we'll talk a good bit about the Ecuadorians and the Spanish and all, but let's talk about the British. I mean, the UN has decided that uh, Julian Assange is being held illegally. It's illegal detention. It's against uh, not only human rights, but UN law. Uh, the, that the British courts were in error in what they did. Now, I would just appeal to the, to the English, the Wales and the North Irish people, have you no shame? I mean, we went through this 15 years ago when Tony Blair and George Bush thumbed their nose at the UN, invaded Iraq illegally. Kofi Annan said it was illegal. Of course it was illegal. There was no Security Council approval and there was no threat. And they went ahead and did it anyway. Now, it wouldn't be so bad uh, if it weren't for, as Caitlin has mentioned, a million people are dead because of that. Now. The UN has served a very useful function in the past, but if people feel free because daddy says so, daddy being Uncle Sam, and the British say, oh, well, we don't have to, you know, the UN, <laughs> the UN decided this is illegal detention, <laughs> so what? I mean, I just asked the question, and maybe this is a function of my heritage where uh, my Irish uh, forefathers suffered under this kind of English disrespect for international law, but have you no shame? Have you British people no shame to let people like Theresa May and the Mokadi Mooks of which my Irish grandmother talked, uh, let, let these kinds of decisions stand against international law and against the ruling of the courts under the UN? Do you have no shame? I think Ray makes a really good point there, that um, we, you know, (laughs) this is a a crucial moment, I think, morally for all citizens. We're being right now that we can control the media. We don't even have to, like none of us have any associations other than, you know, uh, the fact that we line up in truth. There's we don't have, you know, a boss or, or anyone that's connecting us other than we see seeing the same thing and we jump on and we talk about it and we get to know each other and we're creating media here. So that's extremely exciting and we can keep doing that. Um, and that's the good news story. But that's, that's available to everyone. Uh, and, and, yeah, you've got to like take this opportunity, we, we can do this now. And, you know, this door might close on us too. The, the censorship is getting pretty bad. So we've got to keep, like, we've got the door open a crack. We've got to keep pushing. And, and now is the time to push, um, especially when, you know, crisis moments happen like this. Th- these are our opportunities to really shove. Um, so I encourage everyone to, you know, t- talk out about it, take heart, we're listening. That's an amazing amount of um, uh, people who are uh, who are hearing our message right now, and we're just a group of, you know, idiots on the internet. You can do this too. Join us. Let's let's get this thing over and done with. Let's take back control, you know, and return the the power to the people. Return of the will of the planet back to the will of the people, not to a few fucking plutocrats who think they know better than everyone else, just willing to spend their money on solving problems by killing people. That's the extent of their intelligence. We can't allow this anymore. This is not some sort of benevolent sort of overlordship or whatever. They're horrible people. They're killing most of us and they will kill all of us if we're not careful. So now is the time to stand up. I've just been told that Julian Assange is tweeting, uh, sorry, is trending at number four in the US. His name is, but that our hashtag is not trending in the US, although it's trending everywhere else. And apparently um, 
the net effect of that is that people who are clicking on the Julian Assange trend are seeing all of the MSM official story line about what's happening to him rather than seeing our hashtag clicking on it and, and seeing the vigil and hearing the voices that are being presented here. So I've just been told that is categorical proof of, of censorship. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, okay, guys, do it. I've just we've got H A Goodman here. H A is another ferocious supporter of Julian and who's uh, someone whose work Julian has repeatedly shared. Actually, uh, Julian, I think like only a week ago, shared an interview that H A did with me about um, the recent article that Elizabeth and I wrote, or that I wrote, and Elizabeth edited very talentedly edited for me, um, which is called Being Julian Assange. And that was a 23,000 word opus that completely deconstructed the media smears against Julian and against WikiLeaks. So I'm just going to add HA to the panel. Can you hear me, HA? I can see you. I'm just going to unmute you. Hi. Hello, Susie. How are you? I am amazing. Look at all the cool people we have here, H.A. I am honored to be on with everybody here. And I just want to thank you all for doing this. And um, I guess the first thing that I thought was the millions and millions of people around the world who love Julian Assange. And I just hope that that bolsters Julian, that he can feel in some way all the love that and support that he has throughout the world. I think that he is going to be a very happy camper when he gets his internet back and he gets to see this video. Um, to see so many people who love him and who he loves in one place is pretty unique and amazing. I just don't understand. You know, I listen to all the wonderful people on here and everyone is just brilliant. And I, I don't understand one thing. What, what, does, what does silencing Julian Assange accomplish for people who want to, assi want to silence him? It's only going to amplify his voice and his message exponentially. Can you, I, think can you Kim, I can. I think Kim has, has covered that pretty extensively so far. Kim, do you want to fill HA in? Yeah, it's really quite simple. Uh, someone who thinks uh, is really, really smart in the Spanish government has said, uh, you know, we just need to make sure that we get this extradition done ASAP of the Catalonian uh, president uh, from Germany to Spain. And uh, Julian is interfering in that desire. So if we shut up Julian uh, and uh, focus on getting this extradition done, then, you know, hopefully it will all happen very swiftly. And now they have achieved the complete opposite. You know, the Internet is um, uh, heated about the topic. Everyone now knows what the tweet was that... Uh, Ecuador and as a proxy, you know, Spain, uh, uh, you know, had a problem with. Everyone now knows that tweet. And it's simply a historic fact. It's not even a leak. It's not even anything new. It's something that happened in 1940. And, uh, you know, this decision has already backfired, as we can see uh, in the in the Twitter trends, and this is just this momentum is just going to grow. And more importantly, everyone will understand that Julian is standing up for justice again for someone who is being persecuted in this case by the Spanish government simply because he was representing people that wanted to self-determine their path, their future. The Catalonian people, uh, you know, were represented uh, by the, the Catalan president who was elected to represent them. And just for doing his job and basically being the mouthpiece and the representative of the wishes of these people, 
They are now hunting him down like a dog. They want to put him in jail like all of his colleagues. There's over a dozen people in jail in Spain right now simply because of the Catalan movement for independence. And, you know, people need to understand that Julian is uh, on the right side again of history because mm -hmm. all he says is there's a large group of people here who have their own, their own traditions, their own desires, their own feelings about who they are and who they belong to and what they want to achieve with their future. And they should be allowed to decide for themselves what the path for the future is. And, you know, you got to give it to Julian. He really... Um, is uh, consistent with, uh, you know, fighting for the right cause and exposing injustice no matter where in the world it happens. You know, so many media are pointing at, uh, at Julian now and, and, and are repeating the deep state narrative that Julian is some kind of Russian agent trying to help Russia uh, uh, in, in the global uh, battlefield of opinions and things. But what he's really doing, he is fighting for justice wherever there is a cause like this in Catalan. You know, he identifies issues independent of geographics. It doesn't matter to him what the country is in which injustice takes place. He will speak about it when he sees it and he is completely um, independent and unbiased. And just think about this for a moment. Julian knows, of course, that the issue in Spain is uh, of importance to Ecuador because of the close ties between the two countries. And the easiest thing for Julian would have been to say, I just stay out of it, you know, because if I stay out of it, it doesn't affect my asylum and my peace of mind. And hopefully one day uh, a resolution that allows me to live in Ecuador. Instead, he says, this is not about me. I can't be selfish in this matter. I need to let the world know about this injustice. And that is the great person and the great character that we have with Julian Assange. Even if it means his own destruction, he is going to tell us the truth. He's going to defend uh, uh, people against injustice. And you know, for Ecuador to do this right now is, is not going to reflect well on them. That it's a bad stain on, on, on their history now that they have done this. And uh, actually, it's interesting that you mentioned Catalonia again, because um, Emmy recently sent me um, a copy of the latest, the most recent comments that Julian Assange made on the topic of Catalonia. He was asked a question and it said, uh, when you say that the deputy of El Pay, uh, which is the uh, Spanish, um, you know, very mainstream outlet, uh, libeled you, are you referring to his articles arguing that Russia is behind the Catalonian independence movement and your support for it? And he said, uh, Assange responded saying, yes, and not simply that, I'm referring to the accuracy of my comments on the independence of Catalonia. I have supported Article 1 of the United Nations. There must be self-determination for peoples, not self-determination for every family or small town, but self-determination for a people. Catalans have their own language, culture, and so they are a people. They have the right to self-determination. Whether they should be independent is an entirely different question. My own personal belief is that it would be better if the rest of Spain was nice to them and they were nice to the rest of Spain and they all lived happily together. But that isn't my decision to make. That is their decision to make. And so that's specifically the quote Emmy sent me and I want to share it with you all. And I thought that was really interesting the way you perfectly sum that up, Kim. Uh, I think... I think that confirms what Kim was saying. This is an unusual character, this guy, you know. Uh, he's willing to put the welfare, the justice for other people before himself. I mean, that's so rare in this current civilization that no wonder people have trouble believing, you know. I mean, they'd rather believe he's a Russian agent, right? I mean, 
without any proof or anything like that. So it doesn't parse with the, with the people who just can't accept the notion that there is this selflessness, this selflessness, uh, which obtains when a justice issue comes, comes into four. And here is Julian saying, you know, probably I should kind of relax and, and, you know, let this one go, for God's sake. I mean, hello, this, this could affect me. I didn't do that, you know. And for people, people of faith, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And, you know, people say, well, you know, his dad said, no, kill him. No, that wasn't it. He, he got killed because he was a, 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 an agitator for justice. He could have died peacefully in his bed if he didn't take on the system, the religious, the Roman authorities, and that's what did him in. And so that's what made him selfless. And I don't know how Julian feels about that example, but I feel real strong that, you know, this is an example that is very rare and hard to understand by people who are so, so used to the go along to get along and so unaccustomed to people who show real courage. And in my view, Kim had it exactly right and yourself too, Elizabeth, that uh, this is what Julian is all about and why I think most of us really admire what he's done and need to stand up for him now. I view him to be almost like a modern day Socrates. Hopefully he, he, the outcome is different from Socrates, but I'm saying that I think that when you look at truth tellers hundreds of, hundreds of years from now, as I think people lose the historical perspective, they're gonna look at Julian Assange as the ultimate truth teller. Yeah. And they're also going to look at people who who can't stand the truth that he publishes because the people who don't want him to publish are also the people who happen to be writing uh, their criminal acts for all to see. Um, and so when, when the DNC and Podesta emails were published, the reaction from the Democratic Party wasn't, hey, let's go ahead and clean up our act. <laughs> it was... Well, how dare you expose how horrible we are? This is a plot from Russia. You must be silenced and we must attack you. Meanwhile, because I always thought I was naive, I thought, you know, if Trump wins, they're going to look in the mirror and they're going to become a better political party and everything's going to be better. Instead, what they did is they dug their heels in and it's, it was, I know, very intelligent people the first thing they said, and I was so surprised, was, oh, Assange worked with the Russians. Um, for, for what purpose? Why would the Russians hack the DNC? There's no classified intelligence there. And anyway, we already knew Hillary was dishonest and corrupt. So what's, what's, what, what's the new thing we found out? Um, we found out that they tried to use Bernie Sanders' religion against him. They said that an atheist was easier to beat than a Jew. But of course... Um, all the quote unquote anti-fascist people who, who don't like WikiLeaks, they leave that out of the equation. They don't acknowledge that there was anti-Semitism, there was such a dirty behavior that Debbie Wasserman Schultz had to resign. Others had to resign. CNN actually fired uh, Donna Brazil because of the, the WikiLeaks uh, DNC emails. And instead of, instead of making sure that, that, that the Democratic Party is fixed, the corruption is fixed, they attack Julian Assange and they blame Assange for all the problems that the Democrats have. It's just, it's unbelievable to me how people, how people, rational people act in such an irrational manner when their dirty laundry is exposed. Absolutely. Yeah. Go, Caitlin. <laughs> Oh, he embarrassed them. And um, and instead of going, all right, yeah, it's pretty bad here. We should clean this up. Um, they started blaming everyone except themselves. It was really, really weird to watch. Um, but it was also like it became quite a genius move. Like I've got my um, Tim Black T-shirt, I'm a Russian bot on right now because anyone who actually says anything that's real or good in this world anymore is suddenly a Russian bot. They created that out of nothing. Um, so, and that all stems back to those emails um, and how upset they were about it. And so it's, it's created this situation now where they can silence pretty much 
any issue that is, uh, you know, not helpful to the establishment. They can, you know, Dapple or Flint, Michigan, everything. If you just want to talk about anything that's wrong with the world, now you're a Russian bot. So, you know, they allow some things. Or you're an um, abuser. Allow... Yeah, yeah. Or a useful idiot of <laughs> Russia, or Putin puppet, or um, it goes on and on. Hey, I would like to read... Um, um, my poem. I wrote a poem for Julian. So awesome. If you would let me do that. Great. Um, that would be really cool. Because <laughs> it kind of summarizes my whole feelings about the whole Julian thing. <laughs> Julian, because no one else would, a white crane sits in a cage in a sprawling city passing messages to pigeons. Because no one else would, a dream guide sits shackled for letting in light and the world lines up to spit in his face while heads inside screams bark and snarl. Because no one else would, white hairs line the floor and the air is getting stuffy and it's growing harder to breathe. My great grandchildren will scarcely believe that such a creature could ever have existed. That's so unfair. Why'd they do that to him? Why didn't the police save him? Where were the grown-ups? Why did that happen? Why did he have to do that? Because no one else would, child, I will be forced to say. Many of us, many of us could have, but no one else would. And he really yeah. is doing such a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I drew him his little window as a bird cage with the pigeons flying away. Um, yeah, he, he's like I think you're right, Ray. That the you know people don't understand uh, that that there is this kind of selflessness that runs through many of us that that would prefer the highest interest to be um, enacted rather than our own self-interest that understand that, you know, our happiness and our, um, abundance comes from helping others, you know, that it, that it's, there's no good in being like the richest guy in the world. If everyone around you is miserable and, you know, homeless, that's just not fun for, for a lot of people, you know, he, like, and so anyone who can't understand why he's doing this and why he, he will do things that totally go against his own self-interest or only in the highest interest, well, you know, I wonder about them as people. Like, well, where is their selflessness? Where is their altruism? Where, where, when, when do they uh, think about other people? When, why are they so wrapped up in themselves that they only ever put themselves first? That's, it's very concerning to me when someone can't understand him as a person like you know he's he is a interesting character it's not like he's you know he's your average joe but he does have this strong uh urge towards uh selflessness and to to the highest interest that i think is commendable and i th i think you know he models it for all of us it's it's something that uh that once you see in action then you can find it in yourself so, and it, uh, it's left. It, touching upon Touch. what you just stated, this is why I really dislike uh, certain people, especially Democrats, because <laughs> if Kim.com and if Julian Assange and if WikiLeaks corroborated the Russia stole the election from Hillary, they would have first class tickets to Washington DC and they would stay at the Four Seasons and like a you know $2,000 a night hotel room and they would be treated like kings and queens you know with the WikiLeaks. It, it, the men and women of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, Kim.com would be treated in the most respectful manner and they would be given every opportunity to help Mueller or to help further the narrative that Democrats want furthered. Because because the truth is the opposite of what the media and Democrats are, are fomenting, because the truth happens to be the exact opposite 
just like Hillary Clinton was never going to win Arizona, which there were articles saying that she would win Texas and Arizona. I was like, you guys are crazy. But um, because the truth is the opposite, they condemn and they attack uh, Julian Assange and Kim.com and WikiLeaks, and they create this narrative that, like you, like everyone here is saying, that if you if you dare oppose the conventional mentality, you're a Russia uh, appeaser, Putin bot, uh, fascist appeaser, or enabler. All these dumb euphemisms that actually actually have closer ties to fascism than what you know, people who utilize them would like to admit. So I just, I find the hypocrisy to be disgusting. Can, can I add something to that though? It's, it's not just the Democrats. Like I hate defending. No, I agree with I'm you. Not I agree. Defending the Democrats. I don't I agree. like them, but Donald Trump has done nothing to help him. Like none of these people, we have no, the only Senator who even bothered to go and talk to Julian is being called a Russian spy, but like none of, it's across party lines. Nobody's doing anything to help him, even the people who benefited from this. So it's it's bullshit, honestly. Like it's, you know, <laughs> the Republicans owe so much to Julian and they have done nothing. <laughs> and it frustrates me in ways that I can't even explain. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just had That's to a fantastic <laughs> point. And I think it really shows the power of the deep state there. But go ahead, Ray. <laughs> Yeah, every now and then uh, uh, there's a gleam, a glimmer of light that shines through a crack. And sometimes it has to do with lawyers, uh, lawyers who are CYA lawyers uh, covering their hinter uh, parts. OK, cover your ass lawyers. <laughs> and uh, principal among them was a fellow named Barack Obama. And most people don't know that after all his intelligent people, intelligence people told them, yeah, the Russians did it, the Russians did it, then the Russians, you know, the Russians gave it to Assange. But two days before he left office, he held a press conference. Now, most people don't know this, but he said, you know, uh, yeah, the Russians uh, hacked. I, I, but, the, you know, um, the conclusions about how the Russians got that material to WikiLeaks are inconclusive. So you have inconclusive conclusions about the critical factor, about the link between the so-called Russian hack and how it got to WikiLeaks. Whoa, why did he say that? <laughs> because he's a lawyer and he wanted to say, okay, they bought, they sold me a bill of goods on the Russian hack but they never could show me how it got to WikiLeaks. Why is that important? Well, my NSA colleagues in veteran intelligence professionals for sanity tell me that that embassy and Julian and all his associates are covered by NSA cast iron. <laughs> That's the way cast iron coverage is the way NSA uh, describes that kind of coverage. So what's the implication there? That if the internet was used in any way uh, to get this stuff from the Russian hack to WikiLeaks, NSA, if so facto, would know about that. And it's not very sensitive. They would be able to expose exactly how it is. So this crucial point about whether, you know, forget, let's assume there's a Russian hack, which there wasn't. Okay, how it got to WikiLeaks? Well, the president of the United States here, I don't know. Uh, the conclusions, the conclusions, in quotes, by the intelligence community, with high confidence, less, are, in my lawyerly way, inconclusive. But, you know, that's the kind of people we're dealing with here. Inconclusive conclusions, and now it's all coming home because uh, they have the documents. And the, the uh, House Intelligence Committee, actually its chairman has said, he was asked at an interview, do you think these people are ever be brought to, to trial? I said, if they're guilty and the paperwork shows that they're guilty, yes, they will be brought to trial. First time, first time in my experience that any head of an intelligence committee in Congress had threatened uh, people who were uh, are guilty of these kinds of offenses with trial because they're sort of like, let my 
Irish grandmother described as the upper crust. She said, do you know, Raymond, what the upper crust is? I said, no, nah, I know. She, she says, you don't know. The upper crust is a bunch of crumbs held together by a lot of dough. And that's what we've got there in the upper reaches. And touching upon what you said, I find it so amusing when John Brennan is on Twitter. <laughs> it's so He doesn't even know how to talk shit. It's so hilarious. He's like, you will not destroy this country. That's my job. <laughs> and, and so, um, but what you, what you said, I mean, he lied under oath. So did James Clapper. They both lied under oath. And they got away with it. Well, I think that um, Brennan is unlikely to be a fan of this event. And <laughs> even, even less so when he sees that CIA whistle, torture whistleblower John Kiriakou will be joining us on oh, the good. hour. Good. It's fantastic development. For those who don't know John Kiriakou, he's the only CIA employee imprisoned for torture. Now, I have to add quickly, he didn't torture anybody. He refused to be trained in enhanced interrogation techniques. What he did was said was, was to say on television that the approval of torture at these various black sites and other places was a with that approval came for the president of the United States. That's why they went after him. And that's why he had John Kiriakou had to spend two years in federal prison. He had to do a plea, be, plea bargain to avoid having to spend 26 years in federal prison. And the person who actually tortured is now going to potentially be the head of the CIA. So the person who told us about the immense crime and the breach of the human rights and uh, you know uh, the international law, the person who told us the truth went to jail and the person who committed the crime is rewarded uh, with uh, a position of power. That is how sick uh, everything has become. We're going to prevent that. Uh, we are pulling out all the stops to make sure that there's enough decency in our country to prevent a self-admitted, self-exposed torturer to become head of the CIA. So. Expect a, if, if President Trump does not heed our advice in our recent memo to withdraw the nomination, expect a battle royale with not only professional intelligence people, but doctors, psychologists, religious people. We're trying to rally people who have a moral sense. And I hope and pray that enough of them in our country to resonate with our senators so that this can be prevented. Anything that I can do to help, I would be happy to, Roy, uh, Ray. I would just send out the word that, uh, take a look at our VIPS memo of uh, just uh, Saturday or, or Sunday, where we go through chapter and verse about uh, uh, Haspel's record and how she was present uh, for many tortured experiments, including things like rectal feeding. Now, you know, I hate to spoil things here, but there is no ever, none, no justification for rectal feeding. Now, rectal hydration, in extreme cases, that could be medically uh, advised, but rectal feeding is pure, simple, sadistic torture. And she was there when Nashiri uh, was a this stuff. So it's really kind of bad that, that all this stuff is right out there in the open. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence issued a five-year report in December of 2014. Guess what the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee now is doing? He said, I recall all those copies. They belong to the Senate, not to the executive branch. And guess who will comply at a moment's notice? Gina Haspel, since she's named under all the blackens or under all the redacted portions, she should be named as being one of the prime advocates of this horrendous reversion to the Middle Ages or even further back, the Inquisition.
That's really gross. I have to go. So I just want to say goodbye to everyone. Very nice. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Favorite. I adore you. Um, <laughs> You're amazing, Caitlin. <laughs> So yeah, um, thank you for everything that all of you do. It's so amazing. This is really, I think, you know, we can take some good news out of this. That it's it's bringing us all together, and um, and we're actually making a difference. This is actually working. We we know it's working, so we should just keep on pushing through. And thank you for everything that you do. Amen. And also, I just want to say one. Thing. I'm seeing a lot uh, on the um, Twitter about, you know, this So, people's general thing about Assange is that they keep saying over and over and over again that he can just, well, he can just leave. He can just leave. But it's, he can't just leave. It's like, you know, it's, it, that's as stupid as saying he can leave and face a firing squad. It's exactly the same thing. We know that they will torture him just like they did Chelsea Manning. Um, we know that he's, you know, that, that he can't just leave. That's that's just stupid. So um, don't let people say that. It's the most stupid thing. I've you seen. you make a very important point, and I like to emphasize it a bit more. Because let's just think for a moment what is going to happen if Julian Assange walks out of that embassy. They're going to arrest him. They're going to detain him. They're going to keep him in jail without bail, saying that he can never have bail again because he breached his bail last time. And by the way, now we have an extradition request from the U.S. Department of Justice uh, to send Julian uh, to the United States. He will then be locked into legal proceedings without being free for many, many years uh, to the highest court in the country. And uh, potentially in the end, he's going to be extradited to the United States where he would never have a fair trial because of the nature of uh, the allegations and the charges. It would be uh, an, an espionage type of scenario. So he would be in secret courts without the media present uh, he is not going to have any fair judge or any jury. It's all going to be a completely rigged game with the result of Julian Assange ending up with uh, a, you know, a multi-decade uh, jail sentence. So for anyone who is playing with the thought that it should just be so easy for him to go out and face the music and defend himself. You know, if he has nothing, if he's done nothing wrong, he's, uh, he's going to be fine. That logic doesn't apply here because he's not playing on a ba battlefield of fairness. He will be fighting with his hands behind his back. They're going to make it really difficult for him to have the uh, defense that a case like this would deserve because the outcome is already predetermined. You do not need to think for a moment that the deep state would allow uh, Julian to walk out of a US courtroom victorious. They're going to burn him and put him in jail for a very long time and he will probably spend most of his time in solitary confinement just to punish him for the pain that he has inflicted on uh, the deep state in the United States. So that is the reality. And you know, the, the funny thing is the Prime Minister of New Zealand has said the same thing over and over again to the media. If Kim.com has done nothing wrong, why doesn't he just go to the United States and defend his case, you know, and then come back when it's all done? What he doesn't tell people mm -hmm. is that the U.S. government has seized all of my assets so I would arrive in the United States without any funding to defend myself, and I would have to depend on a public defendant in what the U.S. calls the world's largest copyright case. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be completely separated from my family. My children, uh, obviously, without any funding, without any visas, would not be able to uh, come with me to, unite, to the United States uh, and, and be there with me. 
And because of the lengthiness of a case like mine, uh, it would probably go, uh, you know, through three or four different uh, courts. You know, you uh, do not have justice or a result uh, within, you know, if they wanted to stretch it out within five to six years. I'm already fighting my extradition in New Zealand for almost seven years. So I would be separated from my family until my kids are done with school. How is that right? You know, and then on top of that, uh, the judge that was appointed to my case, which uh, the DOJ sh shopped for, they picked him because in that court in Alexandria, they know who's judge, who ju which judge is on for the daily duty for new cases. So they picked the guy and the guy is a former Disney lawyer, is a guy who was paid by the content industry to work for them, to enforce copyright and intellectual property. And the same guy is now a judge and is supposed to uh, uh, you know, lead this case. So this just shows you the completely rigged system and the naivete by some people who think that you can just go there and have a fair go. You can't have a fair go in the United States, especially if you are a target of the deep state. And that is why they indicted me. That is why they want Julian Assange, because uh, they didn't like the truth about their operations uh, coming out. And they didn't like me supporting WikiLeaks financially so that he could continue his work. And that is what it really boils down to, you know. People who say, just go there and face the music and, you know, you'll be fine if you've done nothing wrong, are fucking idiots. Let <laughs> <laughs> me inter interject here, if I may. You know, if you, uh, let, let's take your scenario there. Julian walks out of the Ecuadorian embassy, Kim, and uh, he's wrapped up by the British and put in prison. And then there's an extradition request from the United States from the Department of Justice. Uh, let's, let's see what, what that might look like. Well, there was one for Edward Snowden, uh, sent to the, uh, his equivalent person there in Moscow. And it was very, very supplicant. It said, look, please, please give us back. Give us back Ed Snowden. Uh, we promise not to do capital punishment on him. And we promise not to torture him. Please, please uh, give, us, give us Ed Snowden back. Now, <laughs> it's a very, very low bar as to what the judicial authorities in the United States would do. This was Eric Holder, of course, Barack Obama's uh, uh, attorney general. So I have to admit, uh, to great distress, my, my dad was a, uh, was a teacher of law at a university, and uh, I'm almost glad that he, he passed away, because for him to watch this, what's come to our judicial process with people like Eric Holder saying, oh, we promise not to torture him. Torture? Ed Snowden? Yeah, we're not going to torture him. And this whole business, just a little aside here, but very briefly, uh, the people that we assassinate using drones. Now, uh, it became quite well known that we assassinated four American citizens by using drones. And we knew that there were citizens. And so Eric Holder is asked to explain. Uh, there's a Fifth Amendment that says no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. Well, was John Brennan just signing a guy's name on a list? Did that due process? But Eric Holder at, at Northwestern University, a big law school, explained it all. He said, look, Article 5 or Amendment 5 says without due process. No one can be deprived of life without due process. Now, it doesn't say judicial process. It just says due process. And so we do... Do, 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 do. We, do the, we do the due process right here in the White House. Thank you very much. And all those lawyers at Northwestern University Law School said, oh my God, this is probably on the test, a new wrinkle on the Fifth Amendment. In other words, the judiciary has also been completely corrupted 
uh, by what's been going on in the last several years. So again, if Julian were to step outside the embassy, yeah, he would be extradited. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd hate to read uh, any promise further by the new attorney general, Sessions, saying, we won't, ex we, won't, we won't kill him and we won't talk to him either. Just give him back to us and we'll, we'll take care of him. As you say, Kim, for several years this would take. We have a constitutional provision which says everyone is entitled to uh, a speedy trial. A speedy trial in our country has translated down to as long as the judicial authorities want it to, to prolong. And uh, one proof of that is that my case against Hillary Clinton and George Washington University for beat me up for simply standing silently with my back to Hillary is in its eighth year. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's due process and that's that's a speedy uh, resolution. So just to add to what you've said, I couldn't agree more. You're absolutely right, and we're doing what you're doing. Thank you. I just um, I'd like to add one more unintended consequence for the deep state and for Spain of what's happened today. And that is that there has been a huge effort to divide and conquer in the activist circles in political circles and more broadly, the general public. We have been encouraged to either get in the Trump camp or get in the Clinton camp. The media have pushed this narrative, but behind them, the intelligence agencies have pushed it as well. Because we look at the Occupy movement, the movement of the 99%, it wasn't about the 40% or the 35%, it was about the 99%, which included everybody of all political persuasions and all political ideologies. So unfortunately, the divide and conquer since the 2016 election has been extremely successful. And they really have corralled most people into one of these two camps. But I'd just like to point out something that might not be entirely obvious about this stream and this event. And that's that for the first time, I am blessed to be a part of, but I'm also seeing an event where we have far left social activists, we have right wingers or, or perceived right wingers such as CASP. Um, we have brought together the people who've been encouraged to feud and fight, who've been encouraged to be divided, who've been encouraged to be separated and they are all participating together on this stream. And why? Because we've had this unifying occurrence of Julian's right to communication being violated or being restricted. And so I'm starting to see that this could be a catalyzing event that creates unity across the political divides. And that's something that we have sorely, sorely needed. So as I'm watching our now 110 million impression hashtag i'm seeing the privacy activists the european activists the pirate parties international and i'm seeing maga and i'm seeing occupiers and occupy media people and i'm seeing people from all around the world are all together pushing hash reconnect julian and that is a beautiful beautiful thing because unity is the kryptonite against the agencies and against the deep state. When the people unite around an issue where both poles of the political spectrum have common ground and common issue and can work together, that is the single greatest fear of the deep state. And I'm watching it happen right now. And I'm so proud of every single person who is helping to make this happen. Ray, you're smiling, so I'm taking it that you agree. No, I, uh, yeah, I think that uh, it's happening as we speak, as the, as the saying goes. And uh, I, I really am hopeful that those people who have been snookered into this uh, dichotomy, choose Hillary or choose Trump, will see the light and see that they have been snookered and that there is a different way and a different way is guided by, by the light of truth and, and the struggle for justice. And those are not idle words. Those are what we're all about. Snookered is a fantastic descriptor because you're right, that's exactly what has happened. And so often we see what I call this pincer movement where the same agenda is being pushed from the right 
and from the left and who does it serve in both cases. Um, one example of that that I can give you might not be a popular one in some circles um, is the push on the activist community to renounce Julian, the massive psyops that have come about to try to um, sever his traditional um, areas of, of moral support, which have been the activist community, the privacy, commu privacy community, the far left. Um, they have been taught, actively taught to hate Julian. And it's actually great to see how many of them are, are resistant to that. I'm very pleased to see today. But really there has been this, um, the support from those quarters for Julian has been quite emaciated. But then on the far right, you have the QAnon MAGA um, side of it. And Q has been for the last month or two pushing an anti-Snowden, anti-ED narrative, that Snowden is a CIA limited hangout operation, Snowden is a this, that or the other. Now, who are Julian and Snowden? Julian and Snowden are the two largest targets of the intelligence agencies of the West. One second. I'm sorry to break in. Please hold that thought. I just want you to know that WikiLeaks tweeted the stream link. So. Oh, you're joking me. No, I, I had to break in and tell you that. Yeah. So. That is, that's amazing and incredible. I'll complete my thought and then I'll go. Yeah, and sorry to, to <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you for telling me that's really incredible. But now I'm just blushing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to complete my thought, my point is that the I believe that the same interests are behind both agendas. I believe, or it is really a single agenda. I believe that they are uh, manipulating the left to hate on a CIA target and manipulating the right to hate on a CIA target. And I think that this is just, and if you read through, obviously being Julian Assange, it makes many similar demonstrates that point in, in a multitude of ways, which is that there's always this who benefits agenda. And being Julian Assange, we talk about the push on a certain quarter to hate on the Freedom of the Press Foundation for cutting off WikiLeaks, and then the push on the other side to hate on WikiLeaks and say Freedom of the Press is right, but in reality, the agencies don't like Freedom of the Press or WikiLeaks. So <laughs> they win either way, right? I mean, they hated Greenwald for what he did. He got dragged through the mud. I mean, yeah. pre-Pulitzer, the FBI was just pushing all kinds of rotten narratives about Glenn and trying to smear him, as they were with Snowden. Mm -hmm. And as they do with Julian and with WikiLeaks, and I try to implore people to, when they see these um, scandalous headlines, the next big scandal, oh, Julian tweeted this person or DM'd that person or, oh my God, he said this about that or whatever. If you just step back and you go, hang on a second, who is Julian? Julian is the number one target of the CIA. The CIA held a press conference and they didn't talk about drug smugglers, weapons dealers, despots. No, they talked about a publisher, a journalist, and said, we're going after this guy. Well, then there's this slew of mainstream headlines telling us that he's terrible, he's poison, he's a Nazi, he works for the Jews, he works for the Russians, he works for the CIA, he works for the, anything that they can come up with. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe that has something to do with the fact that he is a target of the CIA. Maybe that is why they're trying to teach people to hate him. And so I just really think if you step back and look at the bigger picture, you get something very different out of it than if you are glued to the Atlantic, gasping over every sentence that's been constructed to make you hate Julian Assange. Quick, quick comment on this. And that's simply that most people don't realize that Ed Snowden, was in one major fix in Hong Kong. He fully expected and said that he fully expected with the CIA station right down the street, it was just a matter of days before they got him, right? And he was willing to take that risk, okay? Who saved him? Anybody know? Julian Assange. He called in all his chips, all the influential people he knew in that part of the world, he knew a lot of them, okay? And quite selflessly, again, uh, put them all into play 
got Sarah Harrison to be on the spot and exactly how this miracle worked, <laughs> despite the dragnet, not only by the by the Hong Kong authorities, Chinese and, and, the, uh, and the, the Americans, he got on that plane, bound, bound he thought for Cuba, okay? Now, that was Julian Assange's doing. So, you know, if you want to say why NSA, CIA, the deep state, why they hate Julian Assange? Well, they hate him yet from another picture. They hate him from the Snowden picture as well as from the other picture. So, so yes, these are the two greatest targets. And, you know, what also they share in common is that the, they're the real deal. What they say is what they think and believe. And when Ed Snowden said, you know, I, I knew I had to, to do this, I said, I saw him after we gave him the award a year later. And I said, you know, Ed, uh, people are saying, uh, why did you do that? And, you know, uh, people are saying, well, one, one of your co-workers said, you know, I don't know why it did it, but I really hate the, the character defamation that's going on. Uh, and, and she told Forbes magazine that. So I asked, I asked Ed, Ed, you're aware of that? Ed silently smiled. He said, yeah, people tell me about things like that. I said, well, tell me about it, Ed. Well, how did you arrive at the decision? And he said, well, Ray, uh, I was in Honolulu and, and I kind of looked around the workplace where we were and I knew that Angie here had a hindered child. Uh, Dick has three kids in college. Everyone was married. with, and, and I knew somebody had to do this. And so I said, well, I guess that would be you, Ed. I mean, <laughs> that's not the way I would have said it. I would have said, well, I looked around these people. They knew they were violating the laws like and left. But I, had, I was the only one encouraged to do it. No, no. It's a, it's a, so I guess it would be me. And I had less in the terms of. So I, so I did it. Now, that's genuine. That's authentic. And that's the kind of thing that the upper crust that I defined before just can't abide, can't even understand. And so Julian and Ed, you know, Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning is out now. So two of the three are still locked up, so to speak, in places they don't want to be. But uh, they're still able to function. And to their great credit, they're still making a real contribution to the public wheel, uh, to the, the joint effort to make sure people have a chance of knowing what's going on. That's one of my favorite things about Julian. Um, you know, he's going through this like horrible situation and he's, you know, being arbitrarily detained and he, he hasn't given up and he's still fighting and he's still making these huge monumental like differences in the world. It's, it's, I love that. I just think that he's so brave and there you can't, I don't even have words for it. I, he's wonderful. <laughs> it's a real shame that he's not appreciated properly. He should have a medal in a parade. <laughs> I agree. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, H.A. No, no, I was just going to add something to Susie, to your, um, your observation of, of the, um, the kind of effort to get people on left and right to disassociate themselves with Julian Assange. And I think that, I guess this is just the way my brain works and I'm not advocating this for anyone else. I'm just saying I've made a mental note of all the people who on the left and right, who claim to oppose either Trump or Clinton and claim to oppose fascism and everything unjust. And I've made a mental note of the people who have platforms, I'm not going to name names, whatever, but the people who have platforms out there who didn't even bother to tweet about this today, who didn't even, but then all that they have a fan base who will talk about, oh, enabler this, enabler that, oh my God, you're such a bad person, but they won't even take a second. And we're talking about people with pretty large fan bases or, you know, viewership who won't even take a second to support or defend or, you know, shine a light on this and who abide by this ridiculous notion that because Julian Assange published information that was detrimental to Hillary, that, um, oh, you know, Trump benefited. So therefore WikiLeaks is bad. That's just, I'm just making a mental note of all the people who didn't, 
either today or in other days when a show of support would have been, you know, warranted and would have helped things. All the people who just didn't take the time, not even to to tweet this out, not even to take a second to to publicize this to their viewership. And these are the same people who claim to be against imperialism and fascism and all these things, these lofty things that they claim to be against. But they're really just tools. They're just tools. And then they go and they complain, oh, you know, this and that. Da, da, da. It's like, well, there's a person named Julian Assange today, March 28th, who needs you. And, it, you know, he's doing fine without you, but he's, you know, could use perhaps some support today. And I just see the same people who lecture left and right, not just left, but left. There's a lot. There's, I don't know. I, I see the hypocrisy there, but these people are silent, absolutely silent. It's, I find it disgusting. Yeah, there are definitely times that silence speaks very, very loudly. And today would be one of those days for sure. But I think it's equally, you know, equally as much um, as those individuals um, hypocrisy is being revealed today. I do think that this whole, um, you know, this, this gathering we have of people that are supporting WikiLeaks and Assange is really, really awesome. And as Susie said, it's really, Absolutely. really awe-inspiring and it's a success and it's replacing the coverage that you would expect to see maybe 10 years ago from CNN or MSNBC or whatever. You know, we are, this stream is what people are looking to, to get their news on Assange. And I think that is fantastic. So that's good news. Awesome. Yeah. And My just a word for HA, I'm just so delighted to be on this show, so to speak, with you. I'm um, delighted to be with you. I'm honored to be with you. <laughs> I was on our, an RT segment with you. I don't know if you remember. Long time ago. Russian spy. I was on an RT segment with you. I don't know if you remember. I, I, it was a while ago. Yeah. Well, I was just going to suggest sort of a frivolous suggestion, but uh, if, you, uh, if you know a, a Madame LaForge, and she's knitting her uh, her sweater in front of the Bastille. Uh, you've you've made a mental note of those names. It would be good to get those names into the knitting for when when the revolution comes. All right, you get me? You get my drift? <laughs> I get your drift. <laughs> I get your drift. I'll put the maquillage on the spikes. <laughs> Adelante. <laughs> just on, just on what um, Elizabeth was just saying, money cannot. I, I can tell you this from experience. Money cannot buy exposure at this level. I say I can tell you from experience, not because I've spent money on promoting anything, but because in activist movements in New Zealand, this is what I did: was to create hashtags and to push them and viral them. Our movement against the TPP, um, our hashtag hash TPPA no way trended number two worldwide that is a feat that is unmatched by marketing agencies with million dollar budgets there is no marketing agency that can sell a client now 120 million impressions on twitter from over 9,000 accounts even the governments can't pull that off so what we have pulled off here with people power and with networking and a genuine cause, because this is this is it. There has to be a genuine cause at the heart of it. No competition, no win a million dollars or a sports car is going to get people to advocate your cause to their entire social networks at the level that is happening right now with Hash Reconnect Julian. People innately understand that this is a serious issue, that we're not here for kicks. We're not here for self-promotion. We haven't asked you to give us money or any anything like this in the like five, six, six hours, I think, that we've been going on the stream now. We are here because we care about a human being. That human being is in a very serious situation and it is only human solidarity and our own determination and networking together that is going to have a chance to make a difference for him. Also, just on what was being said about Julian having saved Ed, to save Julian's life is to save the lives of all of those who he will protect in the decades to come. Journalists mm -hmm. and whistleblowers, we will be saving the next Ed Snowden if we save Julian Assange. We will be saving the next Laurie Love or Amin Husseinov if we save Julian Assange. This is why, one of the many reasons why it is so critical 
that we act in support of him because it is not just one man. It is one man who has saved the lives of many others. What Julian's done with establishing the Courage Foundation has served whistleblowers and journalists in a way that simply did not exist before. What WikiLeaks has done is change media sphere and publishing forever, but it's also created a, a standard of source protection that did not exist before. Contrary to the narratives that some have tried to push, we know from the research and the article being Julian Assange that WikiLeaks absolutely 1000% was the impetus, was the inspiration behind the source protection mechanisms like Secure Drop, which are being rolled out around the world to press agencies. There is no other publisher on earth that has gone to the lengths to protect their sources and to protect whistleblowers and journalists to, in the way that WikiLeaks has. When we protect WikiLeaks, we are not just protecting Julian Assange and we're not just protecting the staff of WikiLeaks. We are protecting all of the sources, whistleblowers and journalists who WikiLeaks has offered protect protection and solidarity and services to that for a multitude of reasons, other press freedom organizations thinking Reporters Without Borders and others who we know have been extremely selective in choosing who they will or will not back for their own political reasons. WikiLeaks has supported Pussy Riot in Russia. WikiLeaks has supported, you know, Amin in Azerbaijan. They've supported across the board, regardless of political, of politics, geopolitics, regardless of ideology. They have supported at-risk journalists and at-risk whistleblowers, no matter where they came from and no matter who they blew the whistle on. So that is why, to me, it is so incredibly important that we act to save the life of this man who saves the life of so many others. Yeah, if I could just uh, say a word about uh, us. Um, we are, the saying goes these days, we are there for you, Julian, uh, in a way that you have been there for so many of these people that you just mentioned, Susie, um, in the way that you were there for Ed Snowden, I remember asking Julian uh, on one of my visits to the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, why was it that you, uh, that you pulled out all the stops, you took in all your chips to make sure that Ed got out of Hong Kong alive? And he said with some vehemence, he said, we had to. We had to make it possible for this whistleblower, not to end up like so many others. We had to do that. And so what I'm saying here is that we need to be there for Julian the same way that Julian was there for Ed Snowden. Uh, Julian doesn't have any Julian Assange to speak for him or to support him. He's got us. But I think that we're going to be enough because this latest horrendous episode, denying him communication with the outside world, just will not stand. And I think it will coalesce and, and maybe get people thinking about what it really means to have an asylum without communication. I mean, it's sort of like a, a contradiction in terms. So what I'm hoping, and I'm, I, there's a lot of reason for hope, given the statistics that you have mentioned, Susie, that uh, this will congeal and make people aware that look, this is this is a person who's a patriot, patriot of 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 the world in terms of making sure that there's one way at least to get the truth out, documentary truth, so that people can have a wider perspective and realize what's really going on in the world, including some of the horrendous practices that Julian has exposed. AJ, did you want to add something to that? I saw your head nodding. No, I, I just, you know, I'm, I think we're all very fortunate to have Ray McGovern and all the people who have been um, a part of this um, community, like William Binney and the VIPs, VIPS, because they give us a context of decades of experience in how these spy agencies run and work and how they don't uphold the constitution 
and how they don't uh, protect the country, how they, they protect their own interests. So I'm, I just, I'm honored to be here with Ray McGovern and Cass and Kim.com and Susie and Elizabeth and everybody here. I'm just, it's, it's really an honor to be with people who um, put humanity first. I mean, I, I, I said, I, I've said often that I loved Bernie Sanders back in the day. You know, I was, they called me like this big Bernie bro. I was the, the prototypical Bernie bro. And, but if I found an email from Bernie that said, oh, you know, we're going to go ahead and put the uh, 20 million in the bank. Don't tell anybody. I would say to myself, hey, what happened? This is not right. I would disassociate myself, even though I loved the guy, or I was, I would look in the mirror and say, well, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with him? And I just don't understand people who, who are so, they have such allegiance to political organizations that don't care about them. They put uh, ideology or a cult of personality above truth. And exactly. I think what really unites WikiLeaks supporters is that we all value truth over ideology or individuals. And we don't want to bend reality to make our favorite person, you know, more agreeable in our heads. And we don't try to make narratives that fit that. And I think that's the fundamental thing that really does unite us all. I, I agree with you. I think, Elizabeth, you have that exactly right, you know. And if you look at uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, I, too, was a big fan and a big, uh, I had great hope that he might prevail. He was cheated out of the nomination, okay? Now, we know how that happened. We know that on the, the 12th of June, 2016, Julian said, I've got a lot of emails relating to Hillary Clinton. Now, what happened next? Well, next there was this release by this Guccifer or somebody you know, with Russian <laughs> telltale things. So the way we analyze it is that the people, the techies that were working for Hillary Clinton wanted to set up this thing so that when, when, Julian released this stuff. God, it might be before the Democratic National Convention. Uh, he had got six weeks. Uh, when he released it, we could say, I was the Russians, it was the Russians, with the Russians, okay? We could see them sitting around the table, you know, here's Hillary saying, what are we gonna do? My God, he's probably got an email that's gonna show we cheated. Oh God, it might be, oh. And somebody says, well, we'll blame it on Russia. So, was it the Russians? It was Julian <laughs> Assange. That's good, we'll get a twofer will say that Julian Assange did it from getting it from the Russians, and we'll get them both. It worked like a charm. I have to tell you, three days before the convention, what happens? Julian dumps this material out. And what does the media do? Why do the Russians do this? Why do the Russians? Nobody looked at the content of the emails. I don't know if Bernie Sanders uh, looked at them. And I was really disappointed because you know, there should have been an open convention then. And I was surprised, really surprised that Bernie was so, so, so much a, a political animal that he couldn't see that this was his moment, that this showed that he'd been cheated out of nomination and at least make a try for it. So this whole thing, this whole Russian thing started then, and then it became convenient to try to blacken, blacken uh, uh, Trump. It didn't work, and Trump won. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that Trump couldn't do what he wanted to do in terms of creating a decent relationship with Russia. I mean, it was a, it was a magnificent diversion and it worked. And uh, Julian did everything he could, but he was up against the mass media in our country. And most of the Americans believe that the Russians played some sort of hand with, with WikiLeaks and it's just awful because you can't get the state story from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. And people read those things still and think they know what's going on. It's crazy. I mean, at this point, the Washington Post is like an extension of the DNC. Or the CIA. <laughs> the CIA, exactly. exactly. And Podesta right in there with them, for sure. <laughs> exactly. It, it got so bad uh, in July, August of, of 2016, when CIA and 
NSA and the White House were leaking so much to the New York Times and the Washington Post that the Wall Street Journal saw fit to complain that they weren't getting cut in on this. <laughs> it was just going to the Washington Post and the York Times. What about us? It was that bad. Now, you don't see that reflected very much, but the Wall Street Journal guys did say that in public. So you have to be really careful. You do have to read this stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to believe it. The, the best is when I see articles written by Maggie Haberman and Glenn Thrush. When they combine for an article, I'm like, oh, I have to read this. This is amazing. But this is before we find out that they're like basically public relations executives. Yeah. Well, it's like before Iraq. The same people, you know, David, David Sadler, and others, you know, same people who who advertised as flat fact weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, exactly the same people, not their sons, not their cousins, and not their grandsons. These same people are writing about all this stuff. And uh, uh, it's just really, you know, when you talk about media, that's what we're all about here. We're talking about Julian Assange. That's, that's why Julian is such a threat to these people. I mean, hello? Uh, he, he, he deals in truths. He deals in documentary evidence after which intelligent analysts and, and, and journalists worth their, their label lust. I mean, oh, you got documentary evidence. You got, you got, okay. And that's what he deals in. And they can't, they can't uh, abide with that. And as I say, when push came to shove, when Julian did release this stuff in a searchable form, so that it could be appreciated by people before the convention. Uh, that's when this magnificent diversion happened. And everybody looked at why the Russians, why the Russians, why the Russians, and nobody looked at how Hillary had tricked Bernie Sanders out of the nomination. And I've just been reminded there are a whole lot of questions in the etherpad that um, I haven't asked yet. And a number of them are for Ray. And I'm just going to scroll through one moment and pick one out to ask you. Um, we have one asking, um, what do you suggest doing for CIA infiltration into our own pro-whistleblower movement? How to spot it or prevent it from having any effect? That's from uh, Propaganda. From, and it's a question for Ray. Well, I don't think we really need to be too concerned. Uh, all we're do dealing with is... is open truth and uh, trying to find out the lies be behind government pronouncements. And uh, if there are infiltrators into that, just as uh, the FBI has infiltrated the Catholic worker movement, uh, you know, and, uh, and Wall Street, uh, you know, uh, that movement, um, Occupy movement, uh, they're going to be around. I mean, it gets so many people they need, need to work. Maybe you try to convert them. Maybe then they would be a double agent for us. That's what I would recommend. <laughs> I like that plan. That's a good one. Um, I'll just scroll through a few more. If, by the way, if anybody um, on the YouTube chat, if you have questions for Cassandra or for HA as well, please throw them into the etherpad and I'll try and get to as many as I possibly can. Um, and uh, Diana Radha Diviana just asked in general, has there been any update from the embassy? And because I've been in the stream with you all and you know, we've been in this stream, I'm not sure um, what updates, if any, there have been. I think I the, most, the most recent update is that WikiLeaks has tweeted out our stream, which is exciting. <laughs> I've also just seen this tweet, um, which I'll just quickly share screen and show you guys. And it's from the WikiLeaks task force, um, which has oh, also shared the link to the YouTube and said that there's an online vigil with Kim.com. Thanks to supporters gathering at the embassy and protesting on the reconnect Julian hashtag. And I'll have some more metrics for us soon, but we, it's just astronomical numbers. I cannot even begin to monitor the hashtag. Every time that I click refresh, there is hundreds and hundreds of new tweets. I'm also getting ridiculous amounts of notifications. Thank you guys please understand that the ones that I'm retweeting are basically um, I'm just retweeting what catches my eye. I'm not at all able to monitor all of my mentions. So please, if I missed you, don't feel bad. In the coming days, I'm sure I'll go back through them and acknowledge everyone. But thank you so much for this incredibly overwhelming response. 
Um, in a few minutes, we have CIA torture whistleblower John Kiriakou joining us. But Elizabeth, please do go through the Etherpad questions because I know there are hundreds of questions that are being submitted for our panelists. Absolutely. And I have another general one. It's from II Captain. And his question is, is there any legal action we can take to force Trump to end the extradition attempt against uh, Julian? Which I believe we all assume that there's basically a secret, you know, Pfizer warrant against him. But so are there any legal minds that have an opinion on that? I mean, I, I don't know, but since nobody else is jumping in, um, I, his lawyer keeps arguing on behalf of WikiLeaks. So I feel like we need to start putting pressure on Trump, on the Trump administration. People like Don Jr. are really active on Twitter. You know that they occasionally read their mentions at the very least. We need to put pressure on them to do something and point out the fact that his own Trump's own lawyer is making these points. So I think that it's important to take screenshots of those, um, you know, those legal filings and just start tweeting them at Trump, tweet them at Trump Jr., tweet, tweet them at anybody involved in the administration and put pressure on them to stand by their words. Because if they're going to use this defense for like self-serving purposes, then they better use it to do right by Julian too. And that's what I think. Sorry. I think that's a fantastic response. I think that's really awesome to hear. Well, I mean, I, I don't know of the legal aspect, but I can say that Trump has an, an untapped base of people who will forever be grateful if he didn't, if he, if he just abided by the UN resolutions and, and did right by Julian. Absolutely, I agree. I'm just reading through these massive amounts of questions we have rolling in here. Um, Kenneth N. Holly West asked on Facebook, has Ecuador been threatened or did they expect um, him to not speculate or report? And I think we've, we've covered that very, very much, you know, very thoroughly from lots of different angles. Um, and WikiLeaks himself ha ha has tweeted specifically about one tweet that uh, Assange sent that Ecuador uh, has asked them to take down. So, um, share that tweet as much as possible, but I think we've very much uh, covered the answer to that question. And then we got another uh, question just now. Um, Rondon says, what do you guys think about uh, Assange not signing messages with this PGP kid anymore? I don't uh, feel comfortable speculating on that at all, but I don't, I don't know if Susie or anybody else uh, tech background has any thoughts on that. And Susie, maybe I'm, off. I'm, no, I'm here. I'm, I'm okay. not aware of him ever having signed messages with his PGP key. I would consider that to be a diversion. Um, okay. That same argument was made or the same question was raised during what WikiLeaks has called the black propaganda. Yeah, people exactly. People claiming that Julian was dead the last time that his internet was cut off. Um, we said at the time, I actually wrote an uh, article called No, Julian is Not Dead and pointed out that if there was a serious threat to Julian's life in terms of something, you know, him having been abducted or arrested or killed, we would hear about it from Christine Assange. We would hear about it from Sarah Harrison. We would hear about it from Renata, um, Renata Avila, from the, you know, sorry, Avila Renata? I always get so confused because of her Twitter handle. Um, but of the people who are the closest to him are not going to sit on information like that. They're going to tell us. They're going to raise all hell about it. So anybody who's seriously concerned for Julian's welfare would look to those who are closest to him who would absolutely alert us if there was any problem. Um, I don't think a PGP key is going to make much difference, quite frankly. Yeah, and uh, another, um, there's a number of questions um, all addressing whether or not people will be um, gathering at the embassy to, you know, both watch and report on what's going on. So there are, you know, like three or more questions on that. And absolutely, there are people outside the embassy. There are a number of great reporters, I believe, that are streaming from outside the embassy. And definitely, you know, Emmy and all of the amazing people who regularly keep watch and vigil at um, the embassy will be there. So... I think that 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 clears a number of different questions that we've gotten on on that subject. So, 
And on that note, I'm really pleased to announce that CIA torture whistleblower and my personal hero, John Kiriakou, has just joined the stream. John, just to fill you in, there is currently 10,000 literally accounts on Twitter circulating the hashtag, hash reconnect Julian. It has over 120 million impressions on Twitter and the entire world is waking up to the news of what's happened today. Um, please let us know your response. At first, to tell you the truth, I didn't believe it. Uh, I didn't think that the Ecuadorians who have been so great through this whole process uh, would take such a drastic and sudden step. I was gravely disappointed. I've got a, a radio show here in Washington um, and my friend Ray's been on it a couple of times. Hello, Ray. Hey, Jen. And uh, the moment that we heard uh, what had happened, we, uh, we canceled some of our scheduled programming to, uh, to talk about this live. One of the things that I think um, is so important with this event right now that we're doing is getting the word out because the mainstream media won't get the word out. They'll publish a paragraph, perhaps. There was a paragraph in the online edition of The Guardian, for example. But that's about it. It's up to us at the grassroots level to make sure that the world knows and understands what's happening. Uh, this is not an accident, uh, what's happening to Julian right now. Uh, this is the plan. It's always been part of the plan between the US Justice Department and the CIA and FBI on one hand, the British on the other, the Ecuadorians, and now perhaps even the Spanish. Uh, they were certainly looking for a reason to set Julian up. Perhaps they believe they've found it. We have to make sure that we can block that. Absolutely fantastic introductory points. And as we know, the Guardian's little paragraph on this event was completely false. It was totally wrong. They, they guessed incorrectly as to the cause for this silencing of Assange. So showing, showing once again the inefficacy of the legacy press. Absolutely right. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you'll be happy to know I've just gotten the notification that um, Hash Reconnect Julian is also now twinding, uh, trending, twinding, trending in Australia. Oh, that's so awesome. As soon as we get the US, then we will have topped all five of the Five Eyes countries. Very, very nice. That is a huge success. John, um, could you tell us a bit about your history with Julian, what you know of him and the significance of Julian and his work to humanity as a whole? Oh, you're muted, John. I've never hey, had the yeah. honor of meeting Julian in person. We've conversed a couple of times uh, uh, via Skype uh, and we've spoken at a couple of events uh, at the same time on Skype, but I've, I've not met him. Actually, as a felon, I'm banned from the UK, so <laughs> I won't be able to go to the UK to meet him anyway. Uh, perhaps we can meet up in, uh, in Australia one of these days. <laughs> or Iceland or another uh, neutral venue. Uh, but, you know, the first time I ever heard of Julian Assange was, uh, was the day of the, um, of the Chelsea Manning revelations. I was working for... John Kerry on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And um, he called a staff meeting that afternoon just to discuss WikiLeaks and uh, the Manning revelations. And, uh, you know, I went into this meeting just assuming that because we were all progressives, or at least we all profess to be progressives uh, in this office, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that we would all agree that this was a good thing because transparency is always a good thing, especially when it comes to issues of war and peace. And I was shocked and disappointed to find that I was the only person besides an intern, an 18 year old intern whom we had just hired that week uh, to say that this was a positive development. And at the end of the thing, uh, John Kerry just shut the meeting down because we just were not going to find unanimity on whether or not this was a good thing. Uh, I, I thought it was a very good thing. John Kerry thought it was a very bad thing. And uh, it seems like it's just been downhill since then. Wow. Very disappointing, but not surprising in retrospect. Ray, I think, uh, I think you'd agree with me. John Kerry's no liberal. 
Yeah, I would agree, and I do agree. And you know, it, there's something about um, we were talking about the upper crust before, and the establishment, and uh, you know, they know us best. And uh, something uh, extraordinary like this, an extraordinary exposure of secrets that everyone would like to sort of compress is so extraordinary <laughs> that uh, they can't make their peace with it because what would happen if all their secrets were exposed? That's right. And what about their guilty knowledge about what's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and their state cables, which show a whole matter of uh, untoward things. So it's a natural reaction from the people on the top and the people, you're your intern friend and you, I'm glad you weren't alone, but it's a perfectly natural uh, reaction on the part of someone like you who's seen both sides of this and realizes the supreme need for transparency. Indeed. Okay, there's been one update um, to the situation, which is that Bloomberg is reporting that Ecuador has confirmed that they will meet with Julian Assange's lawyers next week. Well, I don't personally think the internet is going to wait until next week, but that is the latest that we are now hearing. What are your totally, thoughts on that? Totally unacceptable. My personal position is that regardless of the internet issue, he needs to be able to have access to his loved ones and to others. I, Cass told us that she was notified that there is a lawyer with Julian present inside the embassy, but I don't believe that that's good enough. I believe that visitation rights need to be restored effective immediately. Personally, this is my personal opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone else. Um, and I believe his internet and his, uh, his human right to communication should be restored effective immediately. I believe that the Ecuadorians should be asked, are they allowing food and water in? Somebody did make that point, actually, on Twitter. They literally said, what next? Are you going to stop feeding him? And this, of course, is in violation of the UN rulings in favor of Assange, I mean, obviously. Yes, and the fact that he's been granted asylum means that, and he's been given citizenship, means that he should enjoy the same human rights as everybody else, including the right to his personal and political opinions, the rights of freedom to communicate, freedom of association, and freedom of speech. I think it was Kim earlier who made the point that by granting him asylum and then denying him these rights, they are contradicting their own position. Kim, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Uh, hi, John. It is nice to see you again. Um, I have been uh, up for over 30 hours now. Now that John is here, I like to hand this uh, uh, Reconnect Julian project over to you guys. I hope you keep going as long as possible with as many people that we can get into the stream as possible. Uh, I have already passed out three or four times while uh, you guys were still talking. I apologize, but uh, I'm too old now. <laughs> as a kid, I used to do 40 hour gaming sessions, no problem. Uh, but now uh, my my battery is, uh, is uh, on zero. So I have to apologize. I have to go to bed. But keep fighting, guys. Uh, you know, make sure that everyone in the world gets the message and, uh, you know, keep going. Let's keep this marathon going. I hope you guys are still here when I wake up. And then, you know, I, I, I take over again and we just keep going until Julian is uh, reconnected. Shift work. We got this. <laughs> I'm not sure at what point YouTube will just cut us off, actually, but we're at six and a half hours of streaming right now. And someone just said a moment ago, this is a historic stream. <laughs> we, we've set records for the whistleblowing and privacy community so far at six and a half hours into our event. 
Kim, thank you so much for pushing this and letting everyone know it was happening and for being a part of it. You're amazing to just jump on board. Thank you, Kim. Guys. Yeah, you. it's definitely worth a round of applause. <laughs> All and right. Good absolutely. night, guys. Okay, on one thing, Kim, before you go, yeah. just one thing. Yes. You, you and I know that the day will come where Julian sits and watches this. So what would you like to say to him before you go to bed? Well, we love you, man. You know, you're, you're doing the, the, the right thing. What's happening to you yet again is, uh, you know, is, is historic shame. In this case, it's Ecuador. It's uh, ridiculous what they have done. You know, you're just pointing out facts. You're speaking the truth and you're punished for it again. You know, and uh, just stay strong. Know that you have many people that love you and support you and will keep fighting for you. You know, every time they do something like this, we hit them back. You know, we point out the, the falsehoods. We point out, you know, how they are persecuting you. And it's always them who uh, at the end of the day are looking like the, the fools. Thank you so much, Kim. Sweet dreams, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Sure. All right. Thank you. Well, it was nice to meet you, Ray. Same here. Bye. See you later. Okay, John, give us your two cents. What do you think about this situation going forward? Do you think, Julian, you know, do you agree with me that effective immediately his communication should be restored? Oh, without any question. Of course they should be restored as a basic human right. Listen, when, when, when he went into that embassy, the Ecuadorians could have thrown him out and they didn't. They made a commitment to him and they need to uphold their end of the bargain. Not only did they say he was welcome to stay in the embassy, and it's been a long time now, but they've made him a citizen of Ecuador for God's sake. They've given him a diplomatic passport. And so they should give him the same support, the same respect and the same resources that they would give any Ecuadorian citizen who's in trouble in a foreign country. At the very least, they owe him connectivity to the rest of the world. Amen. I have a question for John. Yes, and, I, and John, I think you're a hero, along with you know, Kim.com and Julian Assange and Ray. And uh, what role, I guess this is a, could be a simple question to ask, but what, what role do you think the CIA has in, in cutting the, the internet? Because Kim, Kim explained that it's very likely Spain uh, putting pressure upon Ecuador. Do you think the CIA is involved at this moment? Oh, I would bet money on it. I would bet my next paycheck on it. Um, not just the CIA, but the FBI as well. Uh, you know, the, the press has speculated for a long time that there are secret charges pending against Julian here in the United States, and specifically in the Eastern District of Virginia, which is known as the Espionage Court. It's known as the Espionage Court because no national security defendant has ever won a case there. And that's, that's why they charge all of us in Alexandria, Virginia. I was charged there. Jeffrey Sterling was charged there. Uh, Ed Snowden's charges are there. I assume that they've charged Julian there as well. Well, guess what's in the Eastern District of Virginia, the Central Intelligence Agency. Hmm. And so I think that that's part of the plan. The plan is to charge him in EDVA, knowing that he can't possibly win a case there because his jury, were he to plead not guilty to whatever charges they decide to throw at him, his jury would be made up of men and women with some sort of a connection personal, familial, whatever, to the CIA, the FBI, the Pentagon, the intelligence community, the intelligence community contractors, the Department of Homeland Security, etc. He couldn't possibly get a fair trial in the Eastern District of Virginia. And so I think, frankly, that the American intelligence community is tired of waiting. And so they decided to exert whatever influence they have on Ecuador and Spain, working in concert with the British to make this happen. Now, I hope that the rest of us are loud enough and potentially influential enough uh, to raise enough hackles around the world that we can stop this. 
but I think it's gonna it's gonna take a few days to play out. You know, uh, I'd comment, John, on on the Eastern District of uh, you know the place where everyone gets hanged. Um, there was a fellow uh, once upon a time. There was a general named David Petraeus, <laughs> and, he, and he actually did commit known crimes by giving his paramour access to top secret code word and above information. He carried it himself to where they had these, you know, where they met. And right before he became head of the CIA, he collected them all back and hit him. <laughs> that was so good. And nobody found them, right? Now, guilty as sin. Where was he tried? Do you remember, John? I do. He was charged in the Western District of North Carolina. And <laughs> decided to take a plea, a misdemeanor plea, to mishandling classified information after he was sentenced to 18 months of unsupervised probation. <laughs> the judge came down from his bench to shake his hand and to thank him for his service to the country. How about that? I didn't get that kind of treatment in my trial. <laughs> and I suspect Julian Assange won't either. So, uh, the, the wheels of justice grind exceedingly slow, uh, and it depends on where you get placed. And uh, the government has carte blanche to put your place, uh, put your, your court proceedings in the, uh, in the district where you're inevitably going to be hanged, and you prevented yourself from figuratively being hanged by doing a, a, a plea bargain so that you could be with your children uh, after two years, and that's what happened to you. So this notion of universal justice uh, has really got big holes in it when it comes to our judiciary. And uh, Julian Assange, we know, at least I know, uh, given the, the leaks from Stratcom and Strat4 and all those things, that he has been, there is an indictment pending for him. So the notion that he can just walk out the embassy, I mean, give me a break, uh, tell me another fairy tale. You walk out the embassy and uh, our little British surrogates who follow everything we ask them to do would seize him, put him on the next plane or figuratively hold him in prison for a couple of days. The extradite, <laughs> I was talking before, John, about the extradition uh, request. It would be like, it would be like the one for Ed Snowden. Do you remember? The Russians were, the Russian procurator, had, uh, the attorney general's opposite number was appalled because the first thing it said was, uh, we won't carry out, um, uh, uh, we won't do, we won't kill him. Okay, we won't apply um, whatever they call it, the sobriquet for, you know. And besides that, we promise not to torture him. Okay. <laughs> God. I see the Russians looking at, well, that's what we used to do. Okay, well, that's all right. But we're still not going to give them to you. If you want an extradition treaty, make one, but we're not going to give them. And John Kerry, you mentioned John Kerry. I think this played a role in, uh, in Putin's decision. It's a tough one, you know. Here, Ed arrives in Moscow. He's stateless. Well, I think John Kerry took his passport away, okay? Now, what does John Kerry say on the TV? He says, Mr. Putin, you must give Ed Snowden back to us. And I could see, you know, I could see Putin sitting around with his advisors, you know, saying, I must. Who, who's this guy? Who, tell me who this guy is. I must. I, must. <laughs> I think that played a role in, you know, this imperial where you must, plus the fact that, you know, it was the, it was the legal thing to do. Despite, I mean, they talk about Putin being an intelligence officer. He was. Now, what kind of precedent do you want to create by allowing a person who has spilled the family jewels of another country to have uh, you know, asylum in your country? Well, does that mean that you're sort of hinting to any Russian KGB or other agent that uh, they can do the same thing? And is that the kind of precedent you want to set? <laughs> despite that, 
despite that, Putin said, yeah, come on in, just don't make a lot of trouble, just be quiet for a while. And, you know, that was a pretty responsible decision. Now, when he was asked by uh, Oliver Stone, did, uh, did uh, uh, it's no do the right thing? He was careful to say, no, 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 that was, just, well, he has to say that, lest uh, his former colleagues in the Secret Services do the same thing. But, but the whole thing about this imperious nature of John Kerry saying, you must give it Snowden back to us, Mr. Putin, and Putin's reacting, you know, <laughs> in the way that Putin would be likely to react. That's the way the U.S. thinks it can still get around in the world. We're going to find out, or they are going to find out, that it's no longer the case. And uh, with this latest thing, I think there will be an uproar uh, among liberal societies that say, look, are we talking about his right to communicate, his right to, to talk to his children? Or to, I mean, it's pretty serious here. And I think this will, will play in a way that will show that, that Julian deserves not only respect, but the honor of his human rights. Elizabeth, how are you going with questions? Oh, fine. Um, a number of them have, I've kind of discounted because they're um, a little bit irrelevant. So, for example, we'll get a couple of questions like, what are your favorite books? And I, you know, I know that we're trying to uh, make this a very long stream, but I don't know that that's um, particularly cool. No, no. Yeah. Keep on so there are a few like that that I'm not, I'm not particularly paying much attention to. But um, we've got a question from Pink Rose um, saying, what did John Kerry say to Julian? So I don't know if um, John or Ray want to attack that one or Susie. I, I'm not aware that John Kerry um, said anything uh, to him. You know, John Kerry's a funny guy, uh, not funny, entertaining, haha, funny, strange. Um, I'll tell you the truth. When I got in trouble, uh, I, I wrote to him. By then he had been named uh, Secretary of State and because I had been a senior staff member, I had his personal email. And so I sent him an email and I said, Mr. Secretary, please help me out here. I'm leaving for prison in like four days. I have five children. Can you ask the president to commute my sentence? The conviction would still stand, but I could at least work and, and earn money to raise my family. Two days later, I got a response from him. But all he said was, please do not ever attempt to contact me again. And that was it. And I left for prison two days later. Wow, so, that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And that's John Kerry. That's the kind of person he is. So if we're looking to people like John Kerry for help and support here for Julian, we're barking up the wrong tree. On this issue, I, I believe very firmly, we're on our own here. God knows we have no friend in the White House or in the State Department or in any other uh, governmental entity in the United States. We're on our own. And we have to do this ourselves for Julian because the powers here in Washington are not going to help. Absolutely. But I think it's also really awesome that even though this is not something that any of us um, are glad that it has happened, it's been really great to have an excuse for us all to get together and speak like this and actually spend some decent amount of time talking with each other. And, and really, um, you know, it's, a, it's an example of solidarity and unity for the people that really value truth. And the other thing I wanted to say really fast is that both uh, Ray and John and us, uh, Julian and, and many, many others, what you guys do is you expose the hypocrisy of, of the Western idea of, of liberal democracy because you show how illiberal um, these states have been. And I think that's one really um, critical thing that Assange did with Catalonia is he was pointing out that this Western state that's a member of the EU was treating its citizens with such illiberal and, and violent um, tactics. So I just thought that was an important point. And I'm going to uh, scroll through these questions a little bit more. Um, guys, if you're in YouTube chat, please uh, throw us some questions for John as well. Guys, I'm just going to bust in. I'm just going to bust in for sure. one minute and just um, give you a little update. Okay, so um, my good friend Lee Camp from Russia Today has just said that he would love to join the stream. So I've just sent him the link as well. And I know that he is a big fan too of John Kiriakou and of Ray McGovern. 
I'm um, of he's so cool, so, isn't he? He's like he's the closest thing this generation has to like a George Carlin, you know. Really, very much so. Um, and I love that. I mean, I've known him since Occupy days. I supported him when he had his Moment of Clarity podcast, and um, he's just a wonderful human being. And it's been great pleasure to watch his career tra- trajectory as well. Um, so Kim's dream for this vigil is that either we keep going until we all drop dead or we bring in new blood and we just keep bringing cool, accomplished friends that also stand in solidarity with Julian. So I would ask each of you panellists, because eventually I will exhaust my contact list, um, if you have other accomplished, smart people that you know who stand in solidarity with Julian, each of you panellists have the Zoom link and you're welcome to pass it along. It would be pretty historic if we could get to the point where Kim wakes up in six or eight hours time and jumps back on the stream and it's still going. But I know also, I totally understand that people, you know, have probably prior commitments before they had me jumping on them today saying, hey, come do this, come do this. Um, And I'm particularly concerned about Elizabeth, who at this point is about to clock seven hours of, I don't think she's even stopped to get a drink or go to the bathroom. Well, speak for yourself, Susie. I mean, you've been here too from the very beginning. So Yeah, I've I've gone to the bathroom a few times. (laughs) I take my phone with me and recruit more panellists while I'm there. (laughs) Multitasking. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, I took one break, but I'm good for now. Cool, and if I think not making sense. Then let me know, and I'll take the appropriate break. You seem to be doing all good, but I know that Lee is just a brilliant showman, and entertainer, but also really amazing at interviewing people. So I think that his contribution would be really welcome, and maybe that would give you twenty minutes or thirty minutes at least to try and do something for us to rejuvenate yourself, Elizabeth. But you've been a champion, and also what people can't see behind the stream right now is that um, my party internet party our whole event crew is manning the facebook page and the youtube chat is on twitter driving the whole viraling of the hashtag people are working their butts off to promote this so there are many faces that you don't see that are equally committed to how, trying to aid julian and wikileaks and in any way that they can and so I just want to say I'm really very grateful for all of those people who are helping to make this happen for for Julian and for all of us for humanity as a whole like there are many people sacrificing their days and their nights in various different time zones to make this happen so thank you all and of course thank you so much to all of our panelists for caring enough to be a part of this it's really something I will never forget and I think a lot of people will never forget especially Julian so on on that note if you have some um have you got them on yet no I'll just go chat. To, I'll go chat to Lee for a sec. But if you guys go ahead with any questions or anything else that you want to talk about, and I will magically reappear shortly. Awesome. Yeah. No, and I, I don't feel that I need to take uh, time off just yet. I'm really excited to hear what Lee has to say, and I'm so glad to be here with Ray and John. And this is an amazing, amazing event. I wouldn't want to miss a minute of it unless I absolutely had to. So, with that out of the way, I will get back to a few more of these questions. Um, so I have one for Ray that speaks about um, it, that asks him how much support would Julian have among CIA rank and file members in his opinion? And I guess, you know, John, you might be able to speak to this as well, maybe um, any, and they ask if any difference would be there between the rank and file and the higher ups. And I think that's a pretty obvious yes, but um, would definitely like to hear your thoughts on how much, if any support there may be among the CIA rank and file. Well, all of my, uh, fellow workers are either dead or uh, uh, long since retired. So I'm going to defer to John on this uh, because I like to know what I'm talking about when I talk. <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been very lucky in that um, even when I was in prison, uh, 16 former or current CIA officers came to visit me. I mean, they took a real risk. Ray McGovern included because Ray almost got himself arrested uh, 
giving the guards uh, some attitude when he came to visit. Me. <laughs> wow, and, nice. Yeah, he really did. And then I, I defended him by saying, do you have any idea who that is? Do you have any idea how dangerous that man is? You owe him some respect. Anyway, um, privately, many of them will tell you that, yeah, they support, if not Julian personally, the concept of Julian and the concept of WikiLeaks, they support it. Uh, I'm not aware of any who would be willing to go public, but the sentiment is there. You just have to sort of dig for it a little bit. You know, there are so many people at the CIA, and I, I know Ray can say the same thing about, about the time that he was there, and he was there twice as long as I was, that, that most people want to do the right thing. Uh, they just feel unbearable pressure uh, to stay quiet. And they have a lot to lose if they don't stay quiet. You lose your pension, you lose your freedom, you lose your friends. Uh, in many cases, and you can ask Tom Drake this, you lose your family. And so for many, it's just too much of a risk to take. But they're out there. That is an incredibly thoughtful answer to that question. Thank you a lot for giving that um, insight into that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, which looks like it, uh, somebody's asking us if we would do these discussions on a monthly basis. And while I would love to do that, I, you know, I don't know that we'll um, be able to, but it's a nice suggestion. So I'll leave that to Susie to, to think about. But yeah, and I'm getting a lot of questions as well on QAnon and whether they're legitimate or, you know, various questions on that. And I'm not going to ask, I, I don't think it would be good for us to spend time on that. I really... I know Susie and Caitlin Johnstone and, you know, myself, we've spoken out before saying this is, you know, a PSYOP. And so just like, uh, you know, when Julian Assange, when people were asking for proof of life and making that into a giant mess, which he explained was a black PR campaign afterwards, um, you know, similarly, I don't think it's good to pay attention to stuff like you. So if I see any questions like that, I'm not going to answer them or I'm not going to ask them to, for, for our I panelists. I hate the QAnon stuff. It drives me insane. It's yeah. Like the most maddening thing, especially when they kept saying that he was at, like that uh, they had transported um, Julian to Mar-a-Lago and all this stuff. I'm like Or Switzerland or whatever. Yeah. Like I can definitely confirm he was in the Ecuadorian embassy last Thursday. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I'm glad like we, consensus agreed. No questions about QAnon. Um, it's just, it's just below even acknowledging, I think. So um, some, uh, we've got a question asking, you know, a basic uh, question. Would denying Julian outside visitors be considered a human rights violation? Does that include legal counsel? And I think, Cass, you've really, you know, given us the answer that, that he does have legal counsel with him. Is that right? Yes, he does have a lawyer there. does not count as a visitor. Um, he was there, I think, probably all day. So, and I spoke to him and... That is for sure. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm glad. I mean, I think you mentioned that a, a number of hours ago now, so I'm sure that there are people watching who don't, who didn't know that. So it's really helpful to explain it once again. Yeah, that's like the one thing that is kind of comforting in this situation. Like he's not entirely alone, and the people at the embassy are so nice too. Like they seemed really like they really cared. That you, it was nice to see. Definitely. And I'm looking at the questions as they come in. We've got um, Chris Nix, <laughs> Nixefk or something. I, I apologize at this late hour for me um, that I'm not pronouncing that right. But he asks, uh, can you guys comment on social media being controlled by the deep state, the role of social media in the fight to release Julian, and which social media platforms you would prefer to use? And I know right off the bat, the answer to the last part of that question for me is um, Steemit is a really great um, outlet to use now. Um, as opposed to old legacy, awful um, social media platforms like Facebook. But I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that, on social media and both like, so the, the way it's controlled by the deep state, but also how it's um, playing into the fight to release Julian. It is a really interesting dichotomy actually, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. That's it, a, the, the question. Going both ways. Uh, and it, yeah. ties, it ties in 
back to what I was saying before about how marketing companies couldn't dream of no matter how big their budget was of achieving the type of reach that we are demonstrating today. Um, it's true that it's a double-edged sword. It is uh, an ally to us in terms of the millions of people, ordinary everyday people who can wield it as one of their few weapons against the establishment. But then the establishment also ultimately controls the, the architecture of the platforms and wields it back against us. Um, I think much of life is like that. There's, there's always the light and the dark side of, of everything. And that's just what we're seeing with social media. But I would also implore all of you guys watching to use it while we've still got it. While it's still of any use to us at all, please, please you know, carpe diem do do the best or the worst that you can with it um, because we never know how I mean some platforms are almost dead to us already Facebook being a classic example um, Twitter is not that far off it we do have steam it and other platforms um, that are creating a future pathway but right now while we can still get 120 million impressions on Twitter like we have tonight go for it go for gold that would be my advice. I totally agree. I think that's a really good way to sum it up. Yeah, it's pretty cool that we've managed to get so many impressions on Twitter, even though they're not letting it trend in the US. Yeah. Can you imagine what it would be if they weren't censoring it? Right. <laughs> Luckily, people are... Uh, smart enough to not just rely on that so we're good you know there's a really dark side to that and it's um it reminds me of michael hastings michael hastings mm -hmm. is a huge part of why my journalism is as tenacious as it is um michael hastings was on cnn telling the truth about obama and drones michael hastings was on msnbc and the other major networks and more than anything the deep state jealously guards access to the mass market and to the mass audience and the fastest way to get you on the shit list is to be someone who has access to that mass market who is seen to turn against the interests of the deep state and that's precisely what Michael Hastings was doing he had access at the mass saturation level he had the ability to uh, get his messages across to tens of millions of people. And that is one of the things that made him so um, dangerous, so incredibly dangerous to, to the deep state. Um, so I'm always, I'm always conscious of that, that I think the organic audiences that we build ourselves, as much as we face opposition, um, it is not opposition at the level at which we would be facing if we were talking to 20 million people or 40 million people at a time. It's interesting to see now that this level of reach with Twitter and with social media for this event, because we are starting to push beyond with these types of numbers, push beyond just an alternative media outlets reach. We are starting to push into the types of numbers at which um, you would expect of, of mainstream media. So we'll see where we go from here. But then again, I'm living in exile in Russia, so <laughs> I'm not sure that I can get in much more trouble than I'm already in. But I am very pleased that we still have this avenue of truth remaining, or well, that we still have these avenues for speaking truth and for sharing truth um, with humanity, because God knows it's a rare occurrence that they hear it. And, and speaking of, uh, yeah, I was going to say, speaking of sharing, <laughs> no, speaking of speak truth, here we are, yeah. Lee is the most classic example I can think of, of sharing truth, and he does it with such good humour. Hi, Lee. Welcome to our incredible, so far, seven hour long, 120 million impression online event in support of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Thank you for joining us. And Lee's muted. I don't know what you're doing. It's truly, uh, it's truly just, just, yeah, amazing. So good to have you here. We've got with us Cassandra Fairbanks, of course, Elizabeth Lee Voss, John Kiriaka and Ray McGovern. 
We've had Caitlin Johnson. We've had H.A. Goodman. We've had representatives from the international pirate parties. We had Kim. Kim did an amazing six and a half hour run with us. Yeah. which was just in, absolutely incredible. And we're just doing our best to raise awareness for Julian. We are doing live updates about his situation as they come out and tracking metrics on this incredible viral hashtag. Nice. Uh, something I, I was thinking about, which, uh, you know, I, I imagine it's been said and you can shut me up if it's been said too much, but all of the major, like, truly uh, uh, threatening moments to the, to the corporate state, to the uh, uh, American empire that is connected to that, uh, over the past many years have been connected to WikiLeaks. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the, the Arab Spring was somewhat uh, inspired by things that came out through WikiLeaks, the, uh, which then spawned Occupy. Uh, that then uh, rippled into uh, the Bernie Sanders movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, you know, you, the, the things Chelsea Manning revealed, uh, that which which uh, greatly uh, questioned what the American Empire is doing with our military around you know eight eight hundred nine hundred military bases around the world. Um, it, it seems like if you go through the list of of things that have made them uh, really fucking scared uh, that this that this uh, you know unfettered exploitation of so many in the world might be questioned or might uh, have a, a stumbling block, it's been connected somewhat to WikiLeaks. I'm sorry, I was a bit distracted just sharing the most beautiful photo of you live on the stream that somebody just captured and was tweeting about you with. Um, <laughs> Lee, that's actually a really unique point. And it's one that I hadn't considered. I had seen from a technological perspective the impact of WikiLeaks in the tech space and in tech-related tech activism, privacy-related activism. But I hadn't thought of it in terms of the mass, the spiraling of mass movement to mass movement. I remember Min Ray is a fantastic Canadian activist telling me the movements come in waves and each wave is bigger than the last. But you're absolutely correct that, and it's very seldom acknowledged or discussed um, the impact of WikiLeaks on the Arab Spring, the impact of the Arab Spring on Occupy, the impact of, I would argue, not just Occupy, but the repression of Occupy by the state, which smashed and attempted to subjugate, I'd say actually failed at subjugating um, occupiers because that splash effect of occupiers being spread into a million locations they wouldn't otherwise have been in the wake of the raids and in the wake of the dissolutions of the occupations has seeded so many initiatives and movements across the world. Um, and you're absolutely correct that WikiLeaks was that initial life-changing invention, this endeavour that has resulted in the awakening of so many people and once you are awake you can't not take action you can't put your head back in the sand you can't take the blue pill once you already took the red pill and and the, the revelations of uh of election fraud in the dnc and with the hillary campaign it's like there, there's a large election integrity movement that's going through the united states right now i mean they're, they're doing everything they can to suppress it and cover it up but it's all connected back to the revelations that we got from uh you know knowing the truth behind how how corrupt our election system is and so these things do ripple out and maybe uh, eventually, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we could actually have a legitimate election in America because of what was started a couple of years ago. John and Ray, Ray, you're grinning away at us. So you're obviously very pleased at what we're saying. Well, you know, I love Lee and uh, he makes a lot of sense. And so do you. Uh, it's kind of nice to be just kind of relax, listen back, and uh, uh, not having to uh, pronounce uh, in any way. Um, I think I think that Julian is kind of the catalyst for all this, and that's pretty much what I hear you all saying. And that, 
makes it all the more demanding on us as his base to uh, support him the way he supported Ed Snowden, the way he supported so many other people. Um, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's so incumbent upon us to do this that as I listen and I think, um, he, we are all he's got, plus that wonderful legal team that he has. And if law means anything these days, and if the Ecuadorians can be dissuaded from uh, taking liberties with the law regarding asylum, then we should be able to uh, keep Julian safe for yet, yet a while until somebody does something sensible and lets him go free. Ray, there's hundreds of instances of the exact same question on the hashtag, which is, what can we do to help him? I think this is really a question for everybody on the panel. I mean, I've said in interviews about being Julian Assange in the last few weeks, I believe in diversity of tactics. I think the answer is that we should do everything. We should petition, we should letter write, we should camp outside the embassy, we should door knock if we have to. I mean, in Iceland, they got pots and pans and banged them and walked up and down the streets to get people's attention. So I think the answer is everything. But if there is particular initiatives that each of you can come up with, I would be really interested to hear them. Well, if I were in London, I would be out there before the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, my vision would be in maybe a few hours time that there'd be so many people around that embassy that there'd be no traffic, uh, that the folks who, who shop in Harrods would have difficulty uh, getting in to buy their premium goods, that London would wake up and see that the current British government has nothing but disdain for the resolutions and for the judgments of the UN, which has, has already decided that uh, Julian Assange is a prisoner of conscience, that he's illegally detained, and he should be made free. Are there not enough British people that are willing to do that? I think here in Washington, we could do something similar, but we don't have that embassy to rally around. We have to think of more imaginative things and for that reason, thank God we have people like Lee Camp. <laughs> thank you, Ray. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, I have another question I, I thought of, uh, which is, uh, you know, I, as I was talking about all of the all of the ripples of WikiLeaks and, and all of the things it's it's managed to change or uh, the, the 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 awareness it's managed to create. Um, I wanted to ask John, uh, you, you know, you, you are someone that has been imprisoned for your whistleblowing. Is this, is, is this just what happens to, to people that are, that are, you know, able to speak out in, in such a way that it, it threatens the, the corporate state at the end of the day, they're just going to do everything they can to, to, to harm and crush, uh, the Julian Assange's of the world. Uh, yes. In a, in a word. I hate to say it, but yes. And, you know, I, I had deluded myself, Lee, into thinking that this was unique to the Obama administration. It's not. <laughs> uh, you know, Jeff Sessions, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, has uh, declared war on whistleblowers just like Eric Holder did. Uh, just yesterday, I don't know if, if uh, our viewers have, have seen this, but just yesterday, an FBI whistleblower was arrested uh, and charged with espionage for passing... Um, uh, purportedly classified information to the intercept. Uh, Reality Winner was arrested for doing the same thing and has been charged with uh, espionage. So yeah, I think that both the Obama and Trump administrations have used and are using the Espionage Act as an iron fist to stamp out dissent. Now, in the greater scheme of things, I was lucky because I did 23 months in a low security prison um, Jeffrey Sterling, as rough a time as he had, was lucky in that he did 30 months in a low security prison. For Ed Snowden and Julian Assange, I fear that that is not the plan. The plan is to silence them forever. And that means 
a stretch of more time than they could possibly do. And it's not going to be in any low security prison. And so we've got to fight. I want to, I want to tell one little anecdote too. I learned this from a group um, in North Carolina. Uh, you know, it's, it's made up of uh, mostly senior citizens who have been active in the fight against CIA rendition flights. And so what they did is when they realized that their local municipal airport was being used by the CIA as a base and as a refueling station for rendition flights around the world, they went to the owner of this airport and they asked him to cancel his contract with the CIA. He told them to go fly a kite. So they began protesting outside the gates, the entrance of the airport, and that did nothing. But then they began laying down in the road in front of the entrance to the airport. And after a year or so, they became such colossal pains in the ass for this guy that he ended up canceling the, the contract with the CIA. Now, of course, the CIA moved on to some other airport someplace. But my God, if we all did that, if we were all as active as we want to be and as we want people to think we are, we can really have an impact. And it's the same thing here. If enough of us do everything, literally everything that we can, as Susie said, I think it was Susie, maybe Elizabeth, um, you know, people are gonna have to step up and take notice. If we're marching in front of the embassy, if we're, if we're harassing our elected officials, if we're parties to lawsuits, uh, and we're laying down in the street, eventually they're going to have to do what we say. If the movement is big enough, they'll have to do what we say. Yeah, absolutely. And there was actually a big win this week of uh, activists you never would have thought would, would have won, but they were uh, protesting a pipeline and they used the uh, necessity defense that uh, the world has no choice but for us to try and block these pipelines. And uh, this week, I believe they they won a court ruling. So it, it goes to show that the impossible can happen with the with this activism. That's some really um, unexpected good news. I hadn't heard that. That's awesome. But I had a question building on what you said earlier, Lee, about the fact that WikiLeaks sort of inspired all of these different social movements. And I was wondering, because I know you're a comedian and a journalist, I was wondering um, if WikiLeaks had not existed, if Assange just kind of gave up and said, you know, okay, guys, you're, you're wrecking my life, so I'm just going to pack up and go home. What would the effect have been for independent journalism like you conduct and independent journalism in general, would we be able to even function? Like, would you even have your job if WikiLeaks had not existed? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's one of those impossible questions. I don't know. It's possible uh, Occupy never would have happened. Occupy definitely was a, uh, a big, uh, I don't know, momentum boost uh, in, in terms of my activism. I mean, I was an activist before it, but it, it, it definitely uh, lit, a, lit a fire under my ass even more. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know if I would. Uh, so it's, it's one of those ripple questions. You don't know the ripples that, that led to where you are. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that courage is courageous and, and the way people, you know, Snowden has said that and, and the way people have, uh, have seen uh, Julian never stop fighting, uh, I think has been courageous. Uh, sorry, I think it's been uh, contagious to, uh, to a lot of people and uh, the, the whistleblowers we continue to see coming out and, and revealing the, the corruption, the fraud, the, the villainous activity that we see uh, among our uh, so-called elected officials, among our, our uh, ruling elite. Um, it, it really is uh, contagious and, and people, you know, you, you can see that contagion in, uh, in these pipeline fights, in these, uh, the, the teachers are standing up more and more across the United States because they saw what happened in West Virginia. And so this stuff is contagious. This, this type of, of fighting back against, uh, uh, you know, the, the profit over all else and, and uh, corporate rule over all else uh it definitely is contagious so so it, it's really tough to estimate the the impact that julian assange and wikileaks uh and everything they've they've put forward has had um you know one i didn't mention earlier is the the trans-pacific partnership which you know they're the corporations and the and the, the corporate state are continuing to try and push it 11 countries are still signing it um but it 
it definitely is the only stumbling block we've ever seen for these massive trade deals that control so many lives and allow our environmental laws to be decided by tiny tribunals of corporate judges. So again, that's something else that never would have happened, never would have uh, at least had the information to be able to fight it uh, without WikiLeaks. Absolutely. I know, I know Susie cares very much about the TPP. I don't know if she's uh, with us right now, but she has been very, very active on that subject. And I think that um, for myself, like looking at the impact WikiLeaks has had, I would not be able to write the majority of the articles I write if it wasn't for WikiLeaks and the content that they've published. It doesn't matter what subject it's on. Whenever I write an article, usually there is at least one reference to a WikiLeaks uh, document. And that is such a, a, um, a stable foundation for all independent journalism. I don't think, I, in my personal opinion, um, to answer my own question, I don't think the independent media could exist in, in any sort of um, successful way that it has if WikiLeaks hadn't existed, so. Ray, I believe you had something. Yeah, Lee, I would uh, underscore some of the things you said and, and add that uh, there are whistleblowers that we don't know about. Okay, the yeah. whistleblowers, the effects of their whistleblowing, we do know about. And I'll, I'll uh, hazard uh, a mention of at least one, maybe two. Um, the, uh, the disclosures that CIA had a whole new directorate, part of which was employed with cyber attack mechanisms, cyber tools, that was revealed by someone we think a contractor working for the CIA. Now, why is that important? Well, when uh, Julian Assange revealed that on the 7th of March this year, uh, he revealed that uh, this material was more abundant and more meaningful than all the material that Ed Snowden brought out. Hello? Okay. Now we've, and he said, I'm just diver, divulging 1% of it now. Okay. Now that raises a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, some of the things he's already revealed are pretty damning. And I don't want to go any further into that other than to point out that was a whistleblower. We don't know who it was. We would know if he were caught. Apparently he did it right and he wasn't okay. caught. Now the other thing has to do with why it is that the inspector general of the Department of Justice released all those text mails between Dumbstruck, not Dumbstruck, which is Peter Struck and his paramour, Lisa Page. Now, those were ironically enough uncovered in the uh, Mueller investigation. But for those uh, who don't know, they reveal that this Peter Struck who was in charge not only of the investigation into Hillary's emails crimes, but also, and let her off, but also uh, in, in involved in this deep state attempt to make sure that Trump was not elected, and then if elected, he wasn't going to be able to rule. Now, that's not hearsay, that's not something McGovern imagined. Those are texts, those are, e those are, text messages, okay? Now, how did they come to light? It was the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, who just before a major meeting of the House Judiciary Committee, revealed them to the press and to the members of the committee. Why did he do that? This puts a real crib in the attempt to explain why it was that the Russians did this, the Russians did that. Well, they revealed it, I think, because one of his people thought that this was so horrendous that they told Congress and said, you know, you ought to ask for the, for the, book, for the texts from, dumb, dumb, not dumbstruck, Peter Struck and Lisa Page, ask for them because they exist. They were found in this search of all the stuff having to do with Russiagate. So whether I'm right about that or not, or whether the IG himself is, is a person of, of integrity, so it was possible, right? The IG of the Justice Department, uh, it came to light. Now, these are incredible, incredible material, substantive documentary evidence, and they show a whole different light on, on, on 
Russia Gate. But in both instances, we have the contagious courage example uh, exemplified by by Ed Snowden, but even more so by Julian Assange, but to to be models for young people who say, well, you know, this is really this is really beyond the pale. I'm going to reveal this, and there's a secure way for me to do this. And uh, so it should not be de-emphasized simply because we don't know too much about any recent leaks. We see the effects of those leaks. And actually, we should rejoice, in my view, in the fact that we don't know who the perpetrator is because the perpetrator did it right and he or she avoided jail. So that's a very hopeful thing for me. And the fact that people continue to give stuff to WikiLeaks and that WikiLeaks continues to put things out, like even today with Julian at a commission, uh, that's also a hopeful sign. I know uh, John has a limited time uh, availability with us, but before you leave, I want to ask you one last question that somebody threw in the etherpad, and it was, what made you blow the whistle, and was Julian any influence on that? So I don't know if you want to answer that, but... Uh, no, Julian wasn't an influence because uh, when I did it, it was December of 2007. And I, I, I hate to even confess that I had never heard of Julian Assange uh, in December of 2007. Um, you know, I, boy, I, I'm, I'm a little bit ashamed or embarrassed to say that uh, I was waiting for somebody else to do it. <laughs> uh, I left the CIA in March of 2004, convinced that word would leak out that this horrible program was, was in place. And, uh, and it didn't. Human Rights Watch came out with a report saying the CIA was torturing its prisoners. The Bush administration denied it. And then Amnesty International came out with a report in 2006. They denied it again. The Red Cross said it in 2007. They denied it again. And then finally, in, in December of 2007, President Bush gave a press conference in which he looked directly into the camera and said, we do not torture. And I said to my wife, who was also a CIA senior officer, I said, uh, that's a bald faced lie. He's looking the American people in the face and he's just lying right to our face. And so it was that press conference that made me realize that, that somebody had to say something. And so, um, so I did. It's been a long road since then. <laughs> Good for you, Jen. <laughs> yeah, thank you, John. Just before you disappear, John, I would like to ask you the same question that I did, Kim, or not even a question, but just a favor. Uh, when Julian inevitably sees this, what is your message to him? Oh, keep up the fight. My God. You know, I, I was so happy to be able to pass a message to him uh, recently. And then we both uh, appeared, well, he via Skype uh, at the same uh, Libertarian Institute uh, uh, event. And, and I said the same thing there. Keep up the fight. It's easy to fall into a trap of not realizing how many people support you. It's easy to fall into this rut where you feel alone and you feel dejected and you feel like you've made a mistake. But you can't allow that to happen because you haven't made a mistake. And there are millions and millions of people counting on you. And so that's what we need to we need to uh, convey to him that we're we're with him. We're not with him just for today. We're with him through this whole thing, through this whole experience. And God forbid something terrible should happen, but we'll still be with him, whether it's in London at the embassy or it's in the Eastern District of Virginia. We're going to be with him. And that's the message I want him to know. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it that you're here. I know Susie does. I know we all do. So thank you for everything you've done. Guys, um, I just, I hope we haven't lost John before I give this little piece of news. But, um, John, are you still here? I would just like you to hear this. No, I think he's, oh, that's a shame. Um, Christine Assange sends her love and is very proud of all of us for speaking up and advocating for Julian um, and possibly she will be joining us by audio a bit later on or otherwise um, she is going to give us a statement 
but she is aware of what we're doing and is very, very proud of everybody who's speaking up. And for me, like for the first time in eight hours, I feel like I'm going to get a little bit teary because I, I have massive respect for Christine and have had going back for a number of years. So it's extremely special to me that she is aware that we're trying to raise awareness for Julian's situation and, and trying to help to advocate for him. But I just wanted to let you know that because this to me is an incredibly special thing. That's awesome. She's so cool. She's such an inspiration. Uh, actually, her interview with Randy Critico last year where she was talking about, and Elizabeth's already nodding, she was talking about what Julian was like when he was a little boy and how curious he was and how he used to just disassemble everything to see how it worked. And he had that real, like, hacker spirit evident in him, even from being a toddler, you know, onwards, how curious he was. And, um, and how much she loved him and, and delighted in her time with him. And it was during that interview that I really understood. I mean, I, I knew that Christine was very anti-war. I knew that um, she has very strong ethical principles. Um, and it was clear that that had carried on in, in Julian, that Julian's anti-war positioning had um, was a legacy, a legacy from within his own family tree. Um, but hearing her speak that way about her son uh, really humanized him in a way that um, I hadn't heard before. Thinking about Julian, the three-year-old, Julian, the seven-year-old, Julian, the 12-year-old, and, and understanding that the path um, to where he is in his life was had its roots, you know, in so many decades prior. It was really um, expanded my my understanding of Julian when I heard that interview and I think it was one of the best interviews I've actually ever heard uh, given about Julian. Yeah one of the things that I was um, nodding my head about was also the fact that she said that Christine said you know when you are attacked it's a badge of honor and at the time I thought of Caitlin Johnstone immediately but then two days later Randy who was interviewing her was fired from his position at WBAI so um, prophetic words from her and that's what really has stuck with me for months after that interview took place. Let me jump in here just to to remark that uh, affirmation is really important. Uh, that's why I'm so delighted to still be here with you all affirming Julian Assange. The reason I mention that is because we were one of the first to recognize Julian Assange with a patriot the international patriot that he is. I don't use hero. A uh, hero is the wrong word. Uh, you set up somebody like a hero and then you say, well, he's a hero. And I get another hero, so I can't do the things that he can do. No, he's a patriot, okay? Now, one of the first things we did was award Julian Assange uh, the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and Intelligence. And I think I mentioned before that uh, John Pilger and uh, Craig Murray and Dan Ellsberg were all there when we when when they they were in London awarded that. Now uh, we thought that was a good thing to do. We didn't get much playback from it, but then Christine told us, and Christine mentioned it very often that Julian received the Sam Adams Award. That meant a lot to us, but even more the fact that. It meant something to Christine. It made made it all you know all that effort worthwhile, and uh, and it just was a, a a tangible example of how when you try to support a, a, a patriot like Julian, it's really good to have other people around, and that's why it's such a joy tonight. We've got other people around doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good group to be involved with. Uh, something I was thinking of earlier when John was talking about, uh, you know, it, whistleblowers and him serving time and everything is that, you know, there, there is a system that's set up to deal with, uh, with people like John and uh, with, with, with people like you, Ray, although I, I think you've avoided prison time, which is good to hear. Um, <laughs> <There's one. laughs> um it, it, you know, it, it really is the white, uh, I, I assume I'm stealing this analogy, although I, I think, uh, I, I can't remember who, but 
uh, it really is the white blood cells, you know, the, the mainstream media, uh, the, the deep state, uh, so many levels of our society are the white blood cells that surround anything that is uh, willing to say that the status quo isn't working, isn't feasible, isn't good for so many people. And uh, those white blood cells attack furiously, depending on the level of the threat. And uh, Assange and WikiLeaks are the, the highest level of the threat that they've probably encountered in years um, and maybe decades. So uh, the, the fact, you know, I, I, none of us and, and, you know, you other journalists, wonderful journalists that are on this panel uh, know that uh, it, it should be no surprise that uh, if you are willing to speak out about these things, that the, the, the white blood cells will attack the disease, the, the quote unquote disease uh, of, of unfettered uh, corporate state that's crushing everybody and everything in our environment and everything around it. Um, it's it's going to come after us. And, uh, you know, it's that obviously we need to support those it is uh, chase down and attack to the worst. Let me uh, add something here from my various uh, uh, arrests and imprisonment. Um, I did do one unforgettable night in what they call the tombs, the, the bottom of Manhattan uh, under the criminal justice in quotes building. There I saw how people are treated. There I remember what Dostoevsky said. Uh, what he said was the level of civilization of a nation can be measured by looking into its prisons. I've never been treated quite so badly as then. When I wanted to go to see David Petraeus, the earlier general, and ask him why it was that those crackerjack um, Iraqi troops that he trained so well ran away as soon as a couple of AK-47s were, were shot in, in their direction there back when ISIS formed. Uh, I was beat up uh, by the police just trying to get in to where I had a ticket. What I mentioned, what I, what I mentioned about that is that Petraeus uh, had found out that I was coming and I had gotten a ticket through somebody I didn't even know. So the state is aware of where you're going. Uh, when Petraeus says, I don't want to be asked any questions by McGovern, so don't let him even in the, in the, in the building, uh, you get that kind of reaction. So this kind of uh, all pervasive surveillance is serious. When Ed, Ed uh, Snowden talked about uh, turnkey tyranny, that's what he meant. In other words, you got all the surveillance. All you need to do is turn the key and you, you've got the Gestapo, you've got uh, the right. Nazi thing, okay? And the most wonderful, this is on a lighter side, but when Ed did that, uh, and we thought about the Stasi in East Germany, and many of you will have seen Das, uh, das, das Leben der Anderen, uh, the, the Lives of Others. It was a film that was made about 12 years ago. It was Academy Award candidate, or one, I guess. Anyhow, it was about the Stasi and how they listened to everybody and how they monitored everything in the old East Germany. Now, we knew uh, an old colonel from the Stasi, from the East German Stasi. His name was Wolfgang Schmidt, his real name. So we asked him, there are a lot of Americans as a result of Ed Snowden's revelations that they say, well, I don't care. I have nothing to hide. I, you know, so it might be, oh, how do you feel about that, Wolfgang? <laughs> Wolfgang says, this is incredibly naive. And the reason they collect this information is to use against you. You don't get to decide how it's used, and sometimes they will tailor it but it's to be used against you. The only way to prevent it from being used against it is to prevent it from being collected in the first place. <laughs> it was terrific, okay? And that's what Americans need to hear. This kind of surveillance is so blanket and so insidious and so eminently retrievable that it's going to be used against you. And that's why we have to, have to take... take uh, it's warning about turnkey tyranny seriously and make sure that we oppose to the degree we can. 
this kind of invasive invasion of our privacy and, uh, and denial of our Fourth Amendment rights. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the idea that, that you know, uh, so-called liberals or, or those on our, on our left side here in America thought that everything was fine under Obama because it was Obama, it's like, well, even if that were true, which I could give you a hundred reasons why it wasn't true, but even if that were true, do you really want to leave a dictator's toolkit for the next guy? Do you, do you really want to leave a system that allows, you know, uh, uh, unlimited detention for journalists and, and everyone else under NDAA? Do you really want to leave unlimited surveillance for whoever's coming over the horizon? <laughs> Even if that were true, it's, it's so preposterous that we should be fine with this level of, of surveillance and intrusion in our lives. And, uh, you know, obviously it took whistleblowers to reveal that to us and to, to make it clear what level of intrusion is being done. And just today or yesterday, uh, Microsoft announced that all, the, all their platforms, they go, they're going to ban, uh, you know, uh, bad language or like, uh, <laughs> like uh, you know, a violent uh, uh, talk or whatever. And uh, that means on Xbox, on Skype, uh, they're going to ban nudity and everything else. And you're like, well, that sounds good if you, you, at first, oh, good, I don't want nudity on my platforms. And then you realize like, oh, they're watching all of our stuff and they can cut out anything they want. And it's, it's really a, 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 a form of a dystopian future. It's pretty scary. Definitely a slippery slope. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It is truly crazy. Ray, I want to ask you, when, when you kind of made your transformation and started uh, becoming a more of a protester than, uh, than part of the CIA, your old, your old buddies in the, in the deep state, what did they, did they try and talk you out of it? Did they agree with you? Did they secretly say, hey, I'm not going to do what you do, but good for you or what? Well, it varied, of course. The most... Uh the most demonstrative effect was that nobody talked to me anymore. <laughs> they wouldn't email me. They wouldn't get on the phone. Um, the best thing that would happen is I'd go to a concert and I go into the men's room and there Joe Blow was saying, I work. I go, Ray, you're doing a great job, man. We, 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 we read your stuff and keep, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I went to a funeral. One of my people who worked in my branch died. Okay. That branch was pretty, pretty good branch. I had Robert Gates in that branch and a couple other notables. Okay. Anyhow, this fellow was one of them and he died. He had cancer. So I went to the wake and I saw my old people that worked for me back in the seventies. Now they're my Irish grandmother would call it the high muckety mucks, right? They're at the highest level of the agency. Yeah. And I got sort of a diffident greeting from them. Uh, Hi, Ray. Good to see you. You know, like, I guess it's good to see you. And, and one of the wives of one of the chief guys comes over to me and she looks at her husband and she says, Way to go, Ray. Way to go. Way to go. Here, keep it. Keep it up. And she goes, So as her husband is leaving, he stops me and says, Well, Ray, it's good to see you again. Uh, but now I have to report to security. I said, Report to security. Yeah, I have to remember, write a memo to security that I talked to you. I said, come on, you're kidding, right? Said, no, no, uh, you're considered a journalist now. And, you know, any contact with journalists, we got to So I guess it was good to see you, but you caused a little extra trouble for me. <laughs> yeah. I like the other guy. And I said, oh, is this the same guy that I knew back 30 years ago who took his work seriously and tried to figure out what was going on? And, uh, so in answer to your question, though, uh, I didn't really fall off my horse. Uh, it was really a case of when I saw my former colleagues deliberately falsifying information to justify a war of aggression against Iraq. I couldn't believe it at first, but we had enough ties, our little group, veteran intelligence professionals for sanity had enough ties back into the organization to find out that that was precisely what was going on. That was it for me. You know, uh, the prostitution of the analysis part of the CIA was the cardinal sin. And so it, it uh, was, I had to 
rise to that occasion, find uh, compatriots who felt as strongly as I did to, to expose this, and expose it we did with three memoranda to the president before the war, okay? Yeah. Knowing that uh, this, was, this was crazy. Of course, none of it got any mention because of the, the press, but I'll tell you, the first one did. The first one was so unusual. Here's an alumni group from the CIA formed for no other purpose than to hold accountable. It's, it's from a colleague. Whoa, that's new. So it went out on the AFP wire, okay? Agent France Press, okay? Went all over the world. And we got, we got people calling us from Netherlands, from Indonesia, from, from Spain and France and Rio de Janeiro. And, but nobody from the USA. <laughs> It was the most bizarre thing. Nobody. Zero. Okay. Yeah. And we got mentioned in one column in the New York Times was a little, just before the war. But, but so that's how it was shocking to us. You know, that's how, how they keep it contained. And uh, do you it, have hope these, these wars can be stopped? What's that? Do you have hope these wars can be stopped? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that... Uh, yeah, I do. I think we have to get out there. And what I was, the reason I went into that big Petraeus thing is because um, when I got wrapped up and there was a lot of uh, a lot of publicity to it, and later when I demonstrated before Hillary Clinton by just turning my back silently, uh, my Veterans for Peace colleague uh, put out all this publicity about uh, how this old 71-year-old at the time man got beat up. And Hillary Clinton received thousands and thousands of emails and telephone calls. And my point is simply this. When that happens to an older person like me, I'm even older now, with white hair, Americans care about that. Okay. Maybe it's the same in Europe. But the, the point I'm making is that this kind of hair here, even whiter maybe, is a big plus. It gives you an advantage. It gives you a tool that you can put into play. They're not going to kill you, mostly. They're not going to break your arm. Uh, but you have this advantage over these young people, the attitude being, well, young people, they got to come and tell them, you know, beat up those young kids. You know, But old people, it's different. And so my appeal, and the reason I mention all this, is that all you people throughout the world, uh, if there's a human instinct that says, hey, don't beat up babies and don't beat up really old people, you ought to put that into play. And if somebody needs to lie down in front of these airports that you mentioned before, then old people should do it. I mean, some of us don't have to work anymore, supposedly anyway. And so do it. Do it. We owe it to our grandchildren. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it's, yeah, they're actually, it seems like everyone seems to be listening to these, uh, these kids on the March for Life because they're kids. So apparently if you're of a certain age, uh, America will care about your thoughts, I guess. <laughs> Either young enough or old enough. Yeah, that's my point. <laughs> Sorry. On, Ray's, on Ray's point about the hair color, I guess we have to remind the media in the West that uh, what color Assange's hair is, I suppose. Maybe that would help his situation a bit. <laughs> that's true. That, that might do it. I'd be grasping at it. <laughs> And I'm just, I'm just glancing at the etherpad at the moment. And it's uh, one question is, do we have more good people than bad inside of our government and, and the governments of other countries? feels like much much of the West is captured by sociopaths. And I, I wouldn't uh, venture to answer that question other than to say that I think Caitlin Johnstone did a fantastic job when she wrote about uh, the way that the Western um, power structure is set up. Uh, encourages sociopaths and psychopaths to rise to the top and to rise to positions of power. And so it's a self-perpetuating issue. So I think that would be a general answer to that question, just to get a yeah, few. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And I've been thinking about doing a, a segment on that for Redacted tonight in that uh, it's not just the government, but it's, it's and, and, you know, corporations and the government are now so interlinked that they're kind of one in the same, but it's corporations. Corporations are not a democracy. They're a totalitarian system. And how do you get to the board or the upper echelons of a large corporation in America or in so many countries? Um, you, you have to be a, uh, at least a bit of a sociopath, if not a full-on sociopath. And any moment you show 
care for the the path forward that is not about profit um, and is not about beating out competitors, you are pushed aside. You are pushed out. You are, as as Ray said, you are not spoken to anymore because you are speaking against uh, the, the, the system that has been set up, which is profit over all else and domination over all else. Um, so it, it absolutely is a system that, and, and it's not all, it's not a just a direct line to sociopathy. It's a, it's a slow gravity that orbits and slowly sucks in like a black hole, the sociopath to the top of the system. That's a great, a great analogy, a great way to put it, I think. Absolutely. And so, yeah, for that reason, we wouldn't ever like venture to answer like some sort of percentage to that question. I think it's a decent question, though. And I think, as you said, it's definitely a structural problem where those types of personalities are rewarded. And the, as you said, you know, with Ray and John are the best examples of the people that won't uh, go with that sociopathic mindset that stand up for what's right. And they are, you know, thrown out of that system. So yeah, and, and, a little jocular note here. People wonder why we pick this uh, income, this very cumbersome VIPS, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Well, basically two reasons. Uh, thanks to the internet, we were able to give each other sanity checks before the war in Iraq, okay? We didn't have to be together as we were in the office at, at Langley. Uh, we could do, you know, if I wanted to write that Dick Cheney is lying through his teeth, and get, sell that to a, an op, as an op-ed? Well, I like to double check, you know, with somebody I trust, okay? So that was one thing, a sanity check. But the other thing was the VIPs. All of us had been recognized up to a point, but when we got to the, the real higher echelons, uh, there was a sort of a, a, a glass ceiling uh, over people who, for whom integrity was more important than anything else, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, really, the kitchen. It was sort of like uh, you know, if you go with the team, or uh, if you if you're sort of a windsock, and you could smell the prevailing winds and say, "Oh yes, sir, outstanding idea," and then you made it to a a real VIP, okay, like Bobby Gates, head of the CIA, and then head of the State Department, or head of the Defense Department. So we wanted to become VIPs. <laughs> so so we, we it, was, made, it was a middle. It was a middle finger to your to your <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> we made a, a, an acronym that said VIP. So uh, you know, uh, people don't realize that, but there were good reasons behind that very cumbersome title. <laughs> I like it. And for anyone viewing, they should definitely check out uh, VIPS, your, your, your memos that, that you have written over the years. Um, but yeah, I, uh, what, what I was going to say earlier when you, when you were talking about, uh, when Elizabeth was talking about uh, those who stand out are, are pushed aside or in John's uh, case imprisoned or in, in Ray's case, uh, you know, uh, given the cold shoulder, um, uh, Th those of us who are who are some level of journalists, or in my case, a comedic journalist, uh, we're pushed out in, in different ways. You, hopefully, not prison, although that happens too. Um, but you know, uh, Su Susie is not in uh, her country of origin anymore, and um, I'm uh, on a network that is not an American network on RT America, and uh, it's because these are the outlets that will allow uh, the. The, the talk about these subjects, the, the talk about the things that WikiLeaks is revealing on a regular basis. Um, so uh, we're, we're all pushed aside in one way or another. Now, I think those of us who are pushed aside are now uh, starting to get the upper hand where people are, you know, it's something like eight or 10% of America still has full faith in the mainstream media because they realize at the very least, they're not getting the full story. And at the worst, they're getting full on propaganda. Um, so, uh, may maybe the tides are turning in that respect, but. I think RT is, uh, really becoming more and more a problem for our government and a solution for those uh, Americans who, who are, have the, the good sense to tune in. Uh, one thing about RT, I will say, and I go on anytime they ask me, assuming I know something about the subject, I only turn them down when I don't. Uh, the, there's something very distinctive. Uh, 
and it sets RT off against CBS, NBC, uh, and SNBC, the whole, the whole CNN. And that is that when I'm asked to go on for an interview, uh, they don't have a pre-interview oh. interview. Okay. Now yeah. that involves for BBC and Al Jazeera and all those folks. I said, now, Mr. McGovern, we're going to call you back in a half an hour to just to give you a pre-interview interview. And I have been saying, okay. But then, you know, I get what they do is they find out what you're going to say. This happened with Hannity. One time I was asked to be on Hannity and, and Hannity called back and said, well, you know, we found somebody else. <laughs> okay. So did BBC. Right. Okay. What they want to know is what you're going to say. Somebody said to me, I should lie. And I'd say, oh, I'm with the, really with the program and then screw them up. With it. But I haven't done that. Yeah, right. but Ray, what I've learned is if you do that, you're on one time and you're never called again because that's what I have done on a few networks. So, well, you know, but, but the point of my of my mentioning this is that what is distinctive about RT is they ask me to come on, and they I say, well, what do you want me to talk about? And if it's something I know something about or that I can learn quickly by looking at the link they send me, I say, sure, I can come on. And then they say, okay, uh, three o'clock, can we send the car? Okay, all right. No pre-interview, interview. interview. <laughs> they never tell me what to say. I'm always free to say whatever I want. And uh, uh, it's distinctive. It's amazing that that should be so distinctive in terms of being asked for interviews on things that pass for the news or for such news programs in America. Well, the other yeah, thing that's uh, unique about RT is that in the retaliation against it, you guys have been, uh, you know, forced to declare Farah, uh, what, what is the uh, phrase that goes with that foreign, acronym? Foreign, foreign agent. agent. Yeah. I love the way you guys always start out your show. We're Americans in America talking about American news. What we're called. I, I also work for Russian media. I work for Spanish. That's right. Yeah. Um, about two and a half years. And I can honestly say that it was the best place that I've ever worked. And the only reason that I quit was because it, the scandal and people harassing me got to be too much. But it was such a joy working there. I mean, they didn't tell me that I couldn't write about things. If I had something that I really wanted to talk about, which was usually WikiLeaks related, they would be like, yeah, go for it, do it. Like, whatever, go. <laughs> and they never, <clears throat> I mean, I wrote for, at the same time, I had written for Teen Vogue, tons of other outlets. And they would literally go in and change my articles, change full yeah. paragraphs, add full paragraphs. Like they never did that to me at Sputnik. And I get people all the time trying to get me to bash them now that I've left because they're like, well, you know, Russians, whatever. And I, I refuse because I, I absolutely loved working there. And my mm -hmm. boss was super cool. And the way that they, the way that they treat their reporters is really great. And I think it's just such a shame that the way that RT and Sputnik are being attacked right now, it's really unfair because it's, if you have views that are outside the, you know, norm for mainstream media, yeah. it's a fantastic place for people to go work. I think the pigeonholing is deliberate. Um, it's pretty clear to me that it's, it's a fixed agenda. They have engineered a situation where Russia today is the only place that will give airtime, as Lee said, to these issues, fair airtime to these issues. And therefore, they use that, then they use that association to smear us for it, when in fact, it's a reflection on them pigeonholing us into only having one media outlet that we can, or a couple maybe with Telesur, um, that we can speak to about these issues. Um, just also in terms of interference in media appearances, it goes beyond even just the interference from the corporations. I'd like to note that when Julian spoke at Moment of Truth event um, with Snowden and Glenn Greenwald and Kim.com in 2014 in New Zealand, which I was at and covered, <laughs> you could literally hear the power drills and the banging from the um, the apartment above the embassy where Julian was. They knew when he would be speaking and they did absolutely everything that they could to disrupt Julian to try to prevent him speaking and try to prevent people, physically prevent people from hearing his voice. There was an incident in Berlin where he was due to speak in an event and sure enough, right before he came on, off goes the fire alarm and everybody's shepherded out of the building. This type of interference um, 
it goes beyond just the political interference or the economic interference. They are fully capable of physically interfering with the streams and, and trying to prevent people from accessing Julian's messages and his voice. Um, I think it's been noted several times that comedians and the comedians of this generation and Julian's generation have been stepping up in a really profound way to get these issues into the mainstream. Jimmy Dore is a classic example of that, as is Randy Critico and as is, of course, Lee Camp. And I'm really pleased that we actually have uh, Ron Placone with us, who is from Jimmy Dore's extremely popular YouTube show. Uh, he's also from the re Get Your News On with Ron. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, <laughs> and he's yeah, just yeah. joined the stream now. Hi, Ron. Hello. How is everybody? Can you hear me? My, my Very mind. good. Ron, just to fill you in, I'm not sure if you've been across the last eight hours and 50 minutes now, seven hours and 50 while. minutes I of it's been a while. online vigil, but we came together under the hashtag hash reconnect Julian due to what has happened today with um, his communications with the outside world and with his loved ones and supporters being unceremoniously severed. Um, we are pretty indignant about that. So we've been assembling people like yourself who support Julian and WikiLeaks and been doing this marathon online event. We have hit, had over 10,000 separate Twitter accounts tweeting about it to the tune of some 30,000 tweets and 100, uh, yeah, 125 million Twitter impressions. And we've managed to trend in every country except the USA. So welcome to the stream and please thank you. tell us what your thoughts are on, on what's occurring. Well, when I first read about it this morning, what blew me away was just how vague the rules were that apparently Julian Assange violated. And, and it, so when you read them, it's very obvious that the, this is just one of those things whenever he does something that somebody doesn't like, they can just go ahead and take his internet away. Uh, it, it's just that simple because it's as vague as, well, you can't interfere in any sovereign nation's affairs. Well, he is a journalist. That's his job. That's what he does. He is a journalist in the purest and rawest sense of it. Uh, so those rules are, I think, vague and ambiguous on purpose. And that, and that was the most striking part of it to me. And, and as far as the United States goes, I mean, he is just, um, he is one of the biggest scapegoats right now, um, you know, since the election and, and so forth. He has been one, of, I watched you, you guys mentioned Randy Credico. I watched his interview um, on MSNBC and it was so mind blowing. You know, if they have an oligarch on, that's nah, a nice little softball interview. If they have a oil and gas executive on it's a nice softball interview a politician nice softball interview but when you got a comedian that had a radio show in new york on that's that's when you play hardball that's when you try to get a gotcha moment any opportunity you can so that's that's what we're dealing with right now how you doing ron what's up lee how are you <laughs> haven't seen you in a while <laughs> i know it's been a minute man good, good to see you too man <laughs> um yeah you, you you guys are uh, are doing good work talk, talk about uh what what you think uh wikileaks has meant to your to your comedic journalism <laughs> if, if, if that's the term we're using now is that is that the thing now is that that i mean I, I guess i'll wear it i well to me i mean when wikileaks first came out i mean it was one of those things where it was just like uh you always just want that kind of access to firsthand like here it is you know, you decide. And uh, so the whole just concept of it existing really, really appealed to me and really, uh, you know, motivated me and really kind of tore an ugly mask off of so many things. So as far as, you know, me being a citizen, uh, it really made me, it really made me aware of how rigged truly is. And as a comedian, I think it's very important to have no sacred cows, to serve no master, so to speak, um, and to really just sort of be an outsider. And uh, WikiLeaks has made that easier for me because it's made me realize that I'm going to be that way whether I want to or not. I don't really have a choice in the matter, so I might as well embrace it. And I'd like to think I have. What about you, Lee? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, you know, for me, it's kind of uh, uh, terrifying that, like, you know, for example, the election fraud that went on, and I was covering mm. so often, and and you and Jimmy definitely covered. Uh, <laughs> like to think like, you know, and I used to say on the show, like when it was going on 2016 or whatever, I, I was like, I don't want to be covering election fraud every week, but no one else is talking about it. Yeah. And so it was like, it, it, you know, if, if you're going to leave this thing on my plate, that that is so crucial to our, our, our country, our voice, everything else, and no one's going to talk about it, then all right, I guess I'm doing it. I guess I'm one of the, you know, a handful that are willing to talk about this topic. And, and so in that way, it, it started feeling like I was becoming a journalist as opposed to just being a comedian and repeating what uh, uh, other, other shows had said. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, I mean, I think, yes, it's, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a feather in our caps, but it, it also is a bit of a sad statement on uh, uh, the, the, the media, the fact that these stories are so crucial and they do, dodge them like uh you know it's they're dodging a sneeze out of the face of someone with a plague is uh <laughs> you know it's a sad statement well and just I, I, uh, break in really fast yeah. i know uh, sorry i'm sorry but uh, ray has to leave us now and so i just wanted to say thank you so so much for sticking with us for many hours uh today and it was great to speak to you we're all honored to have you here and we appreciate it the most it was the, uh, Elizabeth, it was the most pleasant five hours I've spent uh, <laughs> in, in a long, long time. And uh, I admire very much what you're doing. I think it's essential. And someone suggested we ought to do this again in a month. Now, I don't think that's an outlandish <laughs> suggestion. I think it's a fantastic idea. Even if we only have half as many <laughs> yeah, as we have I tonight. We might have twice. We might have twice as many, Ray, considering we put this together in about 45 minutes, literally. There you go. I think this is, is key, you know, and talk about social media. Well, this is the best, okay? And as long as we have it, as you pointed out, Susie, let's do it and let's keep the faith. Thank you so much for having me on. Ray, what is your message for Julian when he inevitably gets to watch this stream? What would you like to say to him? Just keep being Julian. Just keep being Julian. Thank you so much, Ray. You're most welcome. Thanks. Th thanks, Ray. Uh, unfortunately, I have to go too. I hate to, uh, to for two of us to leave at once, but uh, I've been <laughs> I've been hanging on longer than I thought I could. Um, but uh, you know, everybody keep fighting. I I immensely respect what what you guys are doing, and you you are uh, have done far more of it than my little uh, hour here. Um, and uh, the, you know, this is so so significant uh and just just keep at it and i'd say the same thing to julian if if he were able to watch uh keep fighting thank you thank so you. much for being here lee it's just it's put a huge smile on my face and there's some really cool tweeted i actually dm'd you i think um there's some really cool quotes from you already so thank you so much for for everything oh your message to julian before you go what do you want to tell julian assange my message to Julian is, uh, other than keep fighting, is that the, the, the ripples of what you have created and uh, it, it will continue to create um, are immense. And I don't think I've seen many people sit down and really try and calculate uh, just at large the impact you've had on the world. And that's why we, we need you to keep fighting. That's why we, uh, we're, we're fighting for this, for transparency, for a, a new world that is not owned by a tiny elite. Um, and you are an important part in it. Thank you so much. That's so awesome. And just before you go, Lee, you might be interested to know that uh, Christine Assange has sent me the following message. She says that she thinks all of us have done such a fabulous job here today of advocating for Julian. Uh, she says that this is Julian's generation's battle. And Christine is so pleased to see that Julian has the support of so many brilliant, talented, good and courageous people. She says that this event and the hashtag has been a roaring success. So there you have it from Christine Assange, Julian's mother. Can you ask her, or if she's listening, 
for tips on how we can raise our children to be as <laughs> amazing as she did because she really nailed it like we need some parenting tips from Christine <laughs> I want um, my daughter comes out like if she grows up to be half as amazing as Julian as an adult, I will be so thrilled. <laughs> I literally responded to her and said, Thank you for giving the world Julian. Aww. That was my response to her. I think she's an incredible woman. Absolutely incredible. And I'm so sorry, Ron, early that I cut you off. I just wanted to say goodbye to Ray before we lost him because I knew he had to leave. So but thank oh, you no, again for joining us. Yeah, no problem. I, I was uh, I was thrilled to hear about it. I was just, uh, I'm sorry that it, it took me so long to get here, but I, I was just coming off a bike ride. I, I probably look a little disheveled. But, uh, <laughs> Not at all. Not you at all. Fine. How, do, how do we look after eight hours on stream? <laughs> you, you guys look great. You guys, everybody, everybody looked fantastic. That's why I, I tuned in and I was like, everyone looks fantastic. Uh, Lee always looks great. Lee, Lee always looks spectacular. Lee camp. So I was just like, ah, I'm all disheveled. I'm on a bike ride. My shirt is wrinkled. I gotta, I, I gotta do a little bit of this before I, before I sign in. But, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, I was happy to be here. Glad I could join you guys for a bit. Thank you so much. Do you want to continue where you left off and just tell us about what impact you've seen Lucky Lakes and Julian have and, and why it's so important that we do support him? Well, it's so important because he is exposing the stories that uh, nobody else was. Uh, and he, you know, developed the platform to do it. And, you know, I mean, th those it's incredibly important, the work that he does and continues to do. And like a true journalist, I mean, I, I wouldn't define myself as a journalist. I would call Julian Assange a journalist. This is a guy that, you know, doesn't have a dog in the fight, so to speak. Uh, but still puts the truth out there and in the meantime has lost his own freedom it is uh, his health is in uh, is at risk uh, all for the sake of telling the truth to people the best way he knows how uh, that's the definition of a journalist that's the definition of a hero and uh, journalism in the United States at least uh, and, and I would say it's an issue worldwide as well in the industrialized world but you know, in the United States, when you have a corporate media that is owned by the most repulsive uh, of organizations, um, you know, I mean, it, it's a it's a joke that we we use the FARA Act against uh, against American bureaus like RT America. Uh, meanwhile, we have organizations owned by Comcast uh, and the Murdoch Empire and uh, Jeff Zucker, who's more concerned about creating reality television than news. Um, something like WikiLeaks is beyond essential, or I think we'd be in even worse shape than we're in, or I know we'd be in worse shape than we're in. So, um, what, wh at what point did you begin supporting WikiLeaks and Julian? Was it as far back as collateral murder or is this a, a recent development for you? And, and when did you begin incorporating that into your work? I was into WikiLeaks as soon as I became cognizant of it. Um, and I, I can't, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know what year specifically that would have been. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, as soon as I was cognizant of it, I, I definitely by grad school, likely undergraduate as well, I was uh, just a, an incredible fan of what it, it does. I mean, I, I, I love the idea of primary sources. I love the idea of just documents at your disposal. So, uh, so I was all about it 110%. I thought it was an important, uh, an important resource. I thought it was heroic work. Uh, I felt the same about all the whistleblowers. Um, I really thought that the Obama administration was going to take a much uh, better approach to whistleblowers. That ended up, uh, it couldn't have been further from the truth, unfortunately. And that was, uh, I think, among the most disappointing things of that administration, if not possibly the most disappointing. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to rank them, you know, but, uh, but it was very disappointing. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've always been in, in that that sort of thing needs to be exposed. I am all for transparency, especially when you have a media structure uh, where transparency is, is not only rare, it is non-existent. It is absolutely non-existent. Uh, the corporate media 
again, the time that they decide to be hard hitting is when they can punch down. They'll try to catch Jill Stein in a trap. They'll try to catch Randy Credico in a, in, in a, in a trap. They'll, they'll talk down to Susan Sarandon. They'll crap on an environmentalist. Uh, but as far as actually exposing power, actually exposing the oligarchy, they're not in the business of doing that. They benefit from the status quo. So, I mean, we, WikiLeaks is absolutely essential to our conversation and at the very idea of uh, any attempt at a democratic experiment succeeding in this country. Yeah, and one of the points I've made many, many hours ago was that without uh, without WikiLeaks, so much of um, basically the stuff that I've written, but also independent the independent media reports in general, would not be possible if it wasn't for what WikiLeaks publishes. I yes. mean, their documentation covers every single subject across the spectrum. You know, without them, I think independent media could not be the the successful rival that it's becoming to legacy press at the moment. So. Yeah, that, that's a much better way to put it. My I, Mine was way more rambly. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's been a few hours. I don't know. But we've, I've probably said that like three times by now. And I see uh, that we have amazing, incredible Tim Black with us right now. That is, thank you for joining us. Unmute your mic, Tim. Oh, you're muted. Hey, Susie, can you unmute him? Yep, I got it. Okay, great. There you go. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Nice seeing you again, Ron. Uh, What's Susan, up, Tim? What's up? Um, you guys are the amazing ones. I'm just glad to be able to to lend my voice to uh, this movement and and to what we uh, what we see as a miscarriage of justice. Frankly, I mean, the, the, to me, you know, I, I just want to say we either we're going to have free press in this country or we're not. Okay, and either we're going to fight for that or we're just going to give in. And what Julian represents to me is the best of that, the best of actual journalism. Uh, he's what we all aspire to be, I believe, um, truth tellers to the, in the purest sense, purest sense of the form of, of the meaning of the word. And um, I, I think most Americans, um, I, I'm ashamed of, of how we, uh, how our mainstream media has treated Julian, how they've treated WikiLeaks, how they treat all whistleblowers, not just Julian Assange, but um, just the idea of anyone who speaks against uh, the establishment. It's, it's just appalling. Um, it, it's shameful. And I think the, the, the general public, they, they have no idea. They have no idea they're being lied to on a daily basis. Ron, you know, we've talked about this on the show. Um, they have no idea. And um, what the Ecuadorian embassy has decided to do, a heavy-handed, uh, Stalin-esque uh, approach um, I, that they could just take away his ability to communicate, to take away his rights. Um, he's already jailed. They're already torturing the guy. I mean, what else? What more? What more do you want from this man, this human being who who hasn't really had justice, uh, hasn't had his day in court, um, hasn't hasn't been treated um, as we've all would expect to be treated in, in a situation involving uh, any charges, all charges laid against him. None of them have been proven, and it's just horrible. And I know I'm all over the place, but uh, I'm really passionate about this. You are nailing it. What do you mean all over the place? I'm literally <laughs> writing quotes of you on Twitter like, <laughs> as, you, as you speak. It, it's just it's just how I feel. And and it, it sometimes it's very disheartening to me because I, I know many people who spout these talking points for mainstream media about Julian Assange, about WikiLeaks, about other whistleblowers are just repeating garbage nonsense that they hear every day, but they hear it from trusted sources. They just have no idea that those sources cannot be trusted and that they're there serving the, the, the purpose of the state. So um, Julian Assange, um, he, he deserves our support. And um, I think the more we amplify his name and we bring attention to this, um, we'll be doing a service not only to him, but to other whistleblowers. And there's so many. How do you feel about what happened today, Tim? I feel that it's I feel that it just shows that they have no respect for for us not just Julian for truth tellers they have no respect for free press they have no respect for the idea that human beings should be able to talk he should be able to express himself now if Twitter uh, where did this conversation he have the words on Twitter I, I, I guess with this British uh, prime, uh, this British operative or whoever he is um, he said something this, this British official didn't like it, and now we find ourselves here. Somehow he violated some, I don't know, unwritten rule that you can't talk bad, uh, can't talk mean to uh, power. Uh, is that it? That's what it is? I, I don't understand why that would require him not to have, you know, internet access. I don't get that at all. I mean, so that's how I feel about it. I feel like it's it's bullshit, frankly. And 
um, they should hear about it from everyone. And 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 I'm just glad to be a part of giving them giving them hell about it. They definitely are hearing about it from everyone. <laughs> We've had awesome. over 10,000 um, different separate Twitter accounts so far tweeting the hash reconnect Julian hashtag, which I think is a remarkable mm-hmm. achievement for a few hours. Really, um, it's incredible. We're looking at a third of a day and we've clocked 120 million impressions. I've Damn never, impressive. ever, I've never seen stats like that ever. And well, I've been doing well, look, I, I was about to jump in the shower um, and uh, and uh, Ebon Kim hit me up on, uh, he, he, he texted me. He said, hey, would you like to go online now uh, for Julian? And I said, hell yeah. So I, I jumped out and uh, <laughs> ran downstairs into the dungeon. And uh, he told me I would be in good company with Susie, Elizabeth, Ron, and Lee Camp. And I said, "Well, you know, just just count me in. Save me a save me a place at the table. I want my name counted in that list of people that stood up." That is what it's all about, totally. And I'm so pleased. I can't actually stop smiling, even though I've been on screen for God knows how many hours. We just heard. I'm not sure if if you heard it, Tim, but we just heard from Christine Assange, Julian's mother. And she said that this this battle, this fight, is the battle of Julian's generation. And she thanked us and said she's proud for everybody who is of everybody who has spoken up today on behalf of Julian. And that deeply, deeply moved me because there are real people being seriously affected by what is happening. You know, Julian is not just a cartoon character or a pinup or whatever he is a real person with a real family who love him and care about him and, and who are being traumatized by what is being done to him and, and frankly um i feel i feel ashamed of myself when you just mentioned that because i never considered that uh that uh, julian had people that loved him and, and uh, he had a mother a mom and um and maybe siblings i don't even know his backstory all i know is what he's meant he's meant to us you know, and that's still so selfish right now, you know, to admit that. But it's true. I mean, I'm just just like, you know, just taking in all soaking in all of the good that he has done and through and WikiLeaks in general and uh, not even taking into account that the people that miss him, um, that love him for who he is besides uh, the great work he's done. Absolutely. And uh, uh, terrified for him. Um, and but they're having to balance it's a balancing act because on one side they understand how historic and how significant his sacrifices are but then on the other side they have the very human pain of having to watch him go through it and never knowing what's coming tomorrow I think it's a hard thing for people to understand who haven't faced exile or who haven't faced serious um, sacrifice for their, the, their political work and that is that you find yourself living a life where you can, like next week is not guaranteed to you, next, next month is not guaranteed to you. You never, you never know what will happen at any given moment and you can't rely on anything. And that's the situation that Julian has had to live in every day in the embassy, not knowing if he will be dragged out by armed police, not knowing if he will be assassinated, not knowing if he will be extradited. To live under that level of pressure and that level of stress year in and year out takes a massive toll. And the fact that he not only copes with that psychological pressure, but continues his work, continues to sacrifice, and through the Courage Foundation has continued to support and advocate for other journalists, other whistleblowers, other sources, is unprecedented. You know, my mom, I, I love my mom. She's a she's a tough old gal from uh, from New York City. And um, I'm pretty sure if I was in an embassy in a, in a foreign country, she'd say, tell them whatever they need to hear. Bring your ass home, son. Um, so I, I just want to say much respect to his mom. And uh, uh, we appreciate her so much for allowing um, us to share her son um, for, for us to, um, yeah, to take... Um, I don't know. I feel like we take ownership of him in some ways. And um, I don't know. I, well, he gives so much to everyone. That's, yeah. I think it's not that we're stealing anything. I mean, he gives so much to the entire public for their benefit. So I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's a better way, much better way to put it. I, at least I hope that's the way um, he sees it. 
um, I, I just feel like we this is a very small thing that we're doing now. It's big, but it's a small thing. I just wish we could do more. Um, has there been any updates? Has the Ecuadorian embassy responded on Twitter or via any other outlet? There was an interesting development that Susie um, let us in on, uh, keyed us in on earlier, and it was something about um, them meeting next week. I mean, it was a very, very lame response. It wasn't acceptable in our books, and we had a bit of a discussion about it. But Susie, what was exactly that update that they, that the, I, it wasn't the embassy, it was Ecuador that sent it out, right? There was a communication, an official communication from Ecuador today, which said that Julian had um, violated an agreement that they had that he wouldn't comment on issues between other states. Uh, WikiLeaks has put out a counter statement and said that there is no such agreement in existence, that Julian had never agreed to any such thing. Um, from our perspective, we believe it is a human rights issue he has uh, he's has been granted asylum he's been given ecuadorian citizenship he has the same right to political opinion to free expression to freedom of communication freedom of speech freedom of association as every other human being on this planet is given just because he happens to have a lot of followers or a large platform should not mean that those basic human rights can be denied to him and that's why we call for immediately the restoration of his, his ability to communicate with his family, his friends, his loved ones, to receive visitors and to speak to the world, which is what he does. That is his, his work and his passion as his life's work and what he's sacrificed for. It's so absurd because it's almost like they're grounding him. Like, it's what I do to my daughter. <laughs> I'm like, no internet for you today when she's bad. It's, it's really like infantilizing almost. It's mm, infantil demeaning. Yeah. Yeah, and as we said earlier, it's also an attack on journalism itself and his not just his personal right to speech, but the right to the free press to comment. And that's what um, he did when he was uh, commenting on the situation in Catalonia uh, in, or in Germany with the leader of the Catalonian uh, movement there. So, Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge attack on, on him specifically as well, because, I mean, again, uh, those rules are just so vague, and I would make the argument intentionally so, that it seems like they could just do this whenever they want. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's probably the most disturbing part of it, is, is that this seems like this could just be an ongoing thing whenever they feel like doing something like this to him. Yeah, Definitely. arbitrarily, like any time he, he makes any statement about anything, I guess if it's not directly affecting Ecuador. <laughs> it's something, if, it, if it interferes in, in state affairs, but even that's applied broadly. So it's like, well, what is that? I mean, that, that basically means being a journalist. If you are a journalist, you're violating a rule. And it's like, well, guess what Julian Assange is? A journalist. <laughs> so uh, we have a problem here. Exactly. Can you imagine if CNN was shut down for, quote, meddling in state's affairs? I mean, I don't think we really, um, I think a lot of people don't see Julian as the as the journalist and as the editor-in-chief of the publisher that he is. And so that's the that's the the lens with which I'm viewing this event is like, it's like shutting down a publication or the leader of a publication just for commenting. I mean, it's just, if it was a, an American journalist or an American outlet, we would be outraged, rightfully so. So True. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to worry about CNN ever being shut down because they're never going to say anything that challenges the narrative that's been given to them to peddle to the masses. So it, it'll never contradict. Uh, uh, you know, they, they're safe. They'll be they'll be able to talk from now till doomsday about whatever they you know. Absolutely. Yeah, they got the cliff notes. They have the cliff notes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. So, so um, I thought it. I thought it was about the Russian like nerve, the the you know the allegations. No, that, that's you know. what the Guardian. Yeah, I was gonna say the Guardian put out fake news about that earlier today, literally. Mm. Unlike the Guardian, WikiLeaks has never put out fake news, never had to <laughs> anything or <laughs> issue any apologies. Just saying. <laughs> well, you know what? Since you guys brought this up, I mean that's. One of the first things you learn in like debate 101 or argumentation or whatever is that when someone just attacks your sources, especially without any type of actual data backing it up, if they just attack the source, 
most of the time that's because they just don't have a leg to stand on. They have nothing to say. They have no defense, et cetera, et cetera. So when you go back to when all that started transpiring during the election season and so forth, why did the Clinton campaign and the DNC and everybody just start being like, he's a Putin puppet, Julian Assange, well, because they had no leg to stand on. Those documents were out there. It was obvious, clear as crystal what they did. And there was no way they could defend that. So what did they have to do instead? They had to smear Assange. That was what they were going to do because they couldn't defend the documents that were in there. There was no defending it because it was absolutely repulsive and disgusting. Absolutely. Ad hominem attacks where they, they go after the messenger and, and, and get the focus away from the actual issue. And in fact, Ron, you know, as I do, man, they, they never said that the documents were, were not real, that the documents were inaccurate. So right. that's never that's never been the, the point of contention. It's just how would how did you get the truth? You know, <laughs> how did you come by way of the truth has been the whole issue. The whole Russian narrative has been about that. So um, and I don't think most Americans realize that. Very good point. And I just want to um, throw it, throw this out there for the all of the audience that is watching us on whatever platform, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, or whatever. Um, please go to the Etherpad, ad, which we will link in the various comment sections. Please ask us questions for Ron and Tim, because we I'd really like to be able to convey, you know, get some information from them that you all want to hear about this or whatever. So please do that, and I want uh, ask those questions as soon as I see them. So very uh, cool. Because Very most cool. of the questions that I see left in the Etherpad are to guests that um, that have already gone, oh. uh, whether it's Ray or anybody else. So, oh, I miss Ray. I miss Ray. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was on for like five hours with us. It was incredible. Wow, wow. that's a soldier. Absolutely. Great job. You could, you could ask you could ask a Vips person questions all day. I, I mean, <laughs> we've had uh, over on the Jimmy Dore show. We we've had Bill Binney on a couple times, and uh, like sometimes. Uh, whenever we pull up the interview, sometimes like we'll get all the AV stuff set up before, you know, Jimmy comes in and stuff like that. And I remember when Bill, the first time he was on, I was just kind of like, oh, so what are you working on? And he started telling me and I was like, I don't think I'm intelligent enough to carry on this conversation. I feel like, <laughs> I, I, I feel like, so uh, I, do you like hockey? I don't know where to go next. I don't <laughs> That's amazing. I can't handle it. He's a very, very intelligent dude, but he knows how to break it down so that the common person can understand what he's talking about. I was just, uh, I was just a little intimidated, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, folks like that, I mean, they, they've had peaks under the hood that I, I think would, would just, I don't know. I don't know if I could handle it. <laughs> like, the, like the peaks under the hood they've had. So, so yeah, I get it. Everybody. Yeah, uh, you know the the entire uh, the I, I know I, I well I was introduced to Vips through Elizabeth uh, th through Disobedient Media when they did the article about uh, the the transfer rates of the files uh, from from the uh, the actual documents and uh, it, that blew me away in itself I mean, because it was so 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 contrary to what mainstream was putting out you know and uh, it was just amazing work and once again Elizabeth that was great work and you guys do over there the Disobedient disobedient media i appreciate it so much such an honor to be even associated with anything that vips has ever done um and all all i did was i reported on the forensicators findings and i was willing to put my name on saying this looks legit that's that's the only risk i took i wasn't you know and i, I really wish that uh things uh think that the situation was such that the forensicator could you know take the credit that they are due for the work that they did and the, you know, the entire kind of Russian hacking narrative that they um, just demolished in one sweep. So, um, and Adam Carter as well has, it has been amazing in debunking the Goose for Two persona and all sorts of stuff with that. So I've been so honored to work with both of those individuals and I'm so glad that Vips uh, picked up on their findings and, val and validated it to a great extent. And yeah. And so, I see uh, Ron, Ron has to leave us pretty soon. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. It's incredible to speak with you as well in this vigil. Thank you, you know. so much for inviting me. I mean, it was really, yeah, unfortunately, I, I do have to get to another thing now, but it was, uh, it was the perfect timing. I was right in between uh, uh, running an errand and taking a break watching some hockey, and this was uh, way more productive. Uh, so <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having Ron, me. This was Ron, sorry to interrupt you, but I just really no. want to know something for my own personal curiosity because I watch Jimmy Dore's show like pretty religiously all the time. 
um, what what was the impetus for Jimmy like um, focusing so much on WikiLeaks and Julian, and how much has it meant for you guys that Julian has consistently shared and and promoted and amplified your work? And then just one, the second thing was, please, um, I'm asking everybody before they leave to give a message directly to Julian because I believe that the day will come where he does get to see this stream. A absolutely. So yeah, first. Uh, you know, we would talk about those stories because similarly to, you know, what Lee was pointing out, so many people weren't. We also saw the way Julian Assange was being scapegoated. Uh, the way, I mean, people in this country, in the United States that are on the quote unquote left uh, are, are celebrating his bad health. Uh, I mean, it, it's absolutely, it, it's terrible and, and it's, it's embarrassing. Um, and, you know, so we were talking about it because, you know, a lot of people weren't and it was important and somebody needed to say it and it was in the news and the information that WikiLeaks provides is essential. Um, and it's provided. So in the, in the purest sense, you know, this isn't Julian Assange isn't somebody who's, you know, putting on a suit and tie parroting the propaganda of the establishment and making 30 grand a day doing so. He's a guy that has just tried to tell everybody the truth the best way he can and has lost his freedom because of it. You know, I, I mean, so yeah, these are the stories that need to be told. And that's why uh, we've talked about them. And uh, as far as his response to the Jimmy Dore show, you know, I, I can't speak for anybody specifically except for myself. Um, but I, I'm pretty confident this is shared with everybody, uh, is that we're incredibly honored and very, very flattered uh, whenever Julian shares one of our videos. Um, so my message to Julian, please keep sharing our videos. It, it makes me <laughs> But no, it, it, sincerely, uh, you know, Julian Assange, thank you so much for all that you do. You have put yourself in harm's way. And that is an understatement. I cannot imagine going what you going through what you have gone through, continuing to go through uh, what you are going through. Uh, you have a level of courage and commitment uh, to integrity and the truth that I cannot, uh, I cannot even fathom. It, it's absolutely remarkable and inspiring and encouraging. Um, and, uh, I, I, I really hope that, uh, I, I really hope that this, uh, this ridiculous thing that's going on ends, uh, very soon and ends in a positive. And, uh, and in the meantime, I, I, I will continue to do all that we can. Definitely. And we'll, we're here, we're here until it comes back on. We may uh, be a little bit tired, a little bit ruffled, a little bit disheveled by the time his internet gets restored, but we're going to keep fighting. So, and thank you again for joining us. And if we're still going tomorrow at some point, if you're free, feel free to jump back into the, the conversation. So this is, this is like a, this is like a dance marathon for yeah. activism <laughs> and press freedom. This Definitely. is like, this just is the thinking, way it ought to be. I was just thinking I might go and like, get in my pajamas and do this for my bed. <laughs> and for peace. <laughs> well, I'll start singing you guys songs and playing guitar. <laughs> so cool. We're heading on to our third time zone, I think. And I'll just give you guys incredible. A, I'll give you a sneak peek of something really cool that's happening. And Ron, I hope you don't mind us borrowing your image along with everybody else's, but our graphic designers right now are just working on this awesome compilation. Wow, picture that's so cool. cool. All of the people who have appeared on the stream so far, I think actually there might be a few missing. We've um, had a pretty good go of it and we've still got a few more to come. So you'll see that being pumped out with the hashtag and the link to the full YouTube stream as well. Um, and we'll circulate that far and wide. So thank you so much for being a part of this truly historic event. Yeah. And again, if I can, guys, thank you so much for letting me be part of this. And it truly is uh, an honor uh, and, uh, yeah, if y'all are still going, I will definitely hop back in at some point. And again, thank you. This has been really, really great. Well, and, if this uh, is... it's, uh, it's, it's made me a little more optimistic and I hope for the people watching and for you guys, it's done the same. I really think it has. I think it's impacted a lot of people and it's, I hope that it, it has made Julian, you know, feel, I know it's made Christine and other, other people close to Julian feel quite heartened. Um, if this is what we can do with 45 minutes, then I think, yeah, if we take Ray's suggestion and others' suggestion, 
and put a bit more organizing effort in and maybe run a marathon once a month that we could do something even even cooler so thank you so much for being a part of this on super short notice i really really appreciate it absolutely thank you way to represent ron all right tim see you later absolutely kick ass okay guys um tim what's your message for julian wow Wow, I, I just want to—I want to tell that uh, I want—I would like to say to Julian that you, you mean so much to to truth tellers everywhere. You're such an inspiration. Uh, everything that you've done, everything that you stand for, um, you so, you so you show such an amazing level of courage that everyone wants to emulate that. Like you're setting a standard uh, in truth telling, in standing up for what's right, uh, in the powers to be, in the face of. Uh, all types of repercussions. You know, I have a saying that we say on our show, uh, you know, don't let nobody take your cornbread. And uh, your cornbread could be whatever is important to you, uh, whatever you, your prized possession, it could be your privacy, it could be your family, it could be your your freedom of speech. And in this case, um, obviously, um, it, it would be his integrity, Julian's integrity. And um, if you let someone take that, the saying goes, there's going to be consequences and repercussions. Well, Julian has stood in the middle of the ring and uh, he's taking the, the he's taking the punches right now, and um, it takes people like that who are willing to do that to set a standard so that others can can be willing to put themselves in in, in the same situation if, if in the same situation to have similar fortitude. So I, I just like to say I just think it's remarkable what he's done. I, but I'd rather I want to see him go home. I want to see him happy. I want to see him free. I want to see him with his mom, with his family. That's what I want for him. Um, I, I don't. I don't want him to be a pariah. I don't want him to be a martyr for the movement. He, we, our, our leaders should be celebrated and appreciated, uh, and 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 not have to suffer the way Julian has. But I, I'm damn proud of him. I never met the man, but I'm damn proud of what he's done, and I just continue to 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 want to support him and and thank him so much for what he's done. I think. One of the most um, significant parts of this evening has been that we have had people from every single political ideology that you can imagine, and they're all here, all saying that they love Julian and and want to support Julian and that his contributions are important. And that's something that you very rarely see. You very rarely see this, this unity across the political spectrum, which has been by design so divided over the last two years, particularly over the last two years. And we all know who it serves for us to be divided and for us to, I mean, so many people feel like, oh, I can't appear on this show or that show, or I can't appear with this person or that person. But this stream has been purely about showing solidarity to Julian and no matter what a person's beliefs are, who they voted for or what their background is, and to me, that is probably the most special part of this tonight. And now you can actually see the the, the dawn is yeah. literally, literally, <laughs> literally shining on my face. So I'm going to have to go and shut my curtains, actually. But um, now as we are at eight hours and 32 minutes into the stream, um, I feel entitled to have bad lighting. Yeah, well, and that was a point that we made earlier in the stream too, that people that are supporting Julian and WikiLeaks and on this stream are all people that value the truth more than ideology, that that's the ultimate guiding, you know, North Star that we all set our alignment by, which is just the truth. And that's what WikiLeaks and Assange brings us. So no matter what uh, part of the spectrum we're on politically, it doesn't matter. Um, The truth is above that. And the people that attack Assange are definitely those who hold uh, either a cult of personality or ideology above the truth. So, Or paychecks. Yeah, oh, but that too, very much that too. <laughs> the money, the Definitely. money, you know, that, that you know, uh, the, the, what is it, the $30,000, I don't know, an hour, I don't know, the crazy amounts of dough that's piled into the pockets of the people that pump out their propaganda. Yeah, they, it's, it's a, they, they love the jets, like the Matt Lauer uh, flying in on his helicopter and the, uh, the, the I don't know, eating the, the Grey Poupon with the pinky out, drinking the fine wine, and meanwhile, lying to the people. 
and telling them, to, yeah, you know? telling us that uh, that WikiLeaks emails are illegal and we can't look at them. Oh yeah, that w- that was nice. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Alka Seltzer, whatever his name was, uh, I forget which one. <laughs> was it Chris Cuomo? Well, Cuomo? Yeah, it was Cuomo who said that. Yeah. yeah, he said that that blasphemous bullshit on his airwaves there. So, y- you know, it's a you know what it is. They don't like Julian because he shames them. You know, he shames the hell out of them. They they get they get they get to see what they should be. And they fall so short of it. It's like, oh, it's just an embarrassment, you know? It's like if you, like, you know, uh, if you're around people who behave badly and then you're the one that's upstanding and you hold doors for, for you know, for old ladies and you are nice to children, you make them feel even worse for being, a you know, a cretin, a horrible individual who lies or steals or whatever they do. So uh, that's what Julian is. Julian is like, he's like the, he's like the guy who makes you feel worse about being horrible. And um, that's that's probably why they have so much that 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 and of course, like I said earlier, the money, the money. So I think all of that is great insight. I think it's a really good point that he brings up that just gut level emotion in them, like that they want to cover up how awful they are and how he point he really brings that into the light. Yeah, I mean, what... I always say that um, the whole media is based on leaks scoops and secrets and he's just better at it than everyone else that's (laughs) That's all it is isn't that yeah that's the that's the cornerstone of journalism right investigative journalism anyway right definitely none of these outlets could exist without using scoops and leaks and secrets and they're just not as good at it as he is (laughs) all all it comes down to and yeah, but I, I would wanna, say yeah. I was going to introduce yeah. uh, Trevor to our little uh, vigil we have going right now. Trevor Fitzgibbons, an amazing uh, friend of WikiLeaks and Assange, who has been been through it. Yeah, um, I was just going to uh, applaud you all as well um, because you all are carrying the torch. I mean, the work, Cassandra, the work you've done is just unbelievable. And Elizabeth, you as well, and, and Tim, and Susie hopefully is getting some coffee or something, but she's just been extraordinary. So just, I applaud you all as well. It's just unreal. It's great work. Thank you so much. That means a lot to hear. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, I just to kind of share a, a little bit about, you know, one of the reasons I have a lot of admiration and respect uh, for, for Julian. Um, You know, one of the, the kind of uh, the type of work I do, which is communication strategy, which I did for Julian in in WikiLeaks for a few years. Um, And this is right at the time of Edward Snowden disclosing the documents, um, to Glenn and to Laura, um, you know, it was a it was a real kind of a touch and go situation. And I can remember standing in my backyard in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, with Julian, you know, on the phone, and Daniel Ellsberg, and I think a few others. And I was moderating a telephone news press call uh, to 800 reporters from around the world. Um, And they were on there because Julian and WikiLeaks were providing some updates for them, but also working incredibly hard to save this guy's life and to get him extradition um, and asylum. Uh, in a country that would take him, you know, from, you know, trying to raise money for a private plane to get him to Iceland to, you know, all sorts of countries. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's one of the most extraordinary things about WikiLeaks and Julian, um, Sarah and everyone affiliated, um, you know, Michael Ratner, the late Michael Ratner was really kind of my, my, mentor and the person I worked with the most. And he was one of Julian's US attorneys. Um, But what really struck me about Julian and the organization's commitment to source protection. 
source protection, wanting to protect sources and not just their sources, but sources in general. You know, Snowden wasn't a WikiLeaks source. Um, you know, he gave the documents to, uh, to some other folks, but his life was on the line and Julian and WikiLeaks was right there fighting just as hard to save his life as if, you know, he was a source for WikiLeaks. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is, uh, you know, I, I first kind of got introduced um, because the kind of my first client was working with um, Chelsea Manning and going to visit Chelsea at Quantico, uh, every, you know, almost every weekend for a while when Chelsea was having a tough time. They were stripping her naked at night and um, holding her in quasi solitary confinement almost 24 hours a day. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a dicey thing because I think they were probably trying to get Chelsea to roll on Julian and uh, Chelsea was really strong and held her ground and uh, it was all based on principle. And um, I just, I just see the same type of principle with Julian. Um, and I just, uh, I mean, that, that's why I'm here, you know? Um, and anyway, that's, that's my deal. I was just a small person in all of this. There's a lot more important people, but I, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge how much Julian's done for journalism and whistleblowers around the world and why I support him. Absolutely. That was a huge point in Susie's article was um, the way in which WikiLeaks supported Chelsea in the, from the very first day on. So. Trevor, um, I think you've got unique insight into events that a lot of people have heard about in the media and have read about and the fans of WikiLeaks would know about, but you have it from the inside. Now, we know that Michael Ratner was one of several people who were extremely um, significant influences on Julian. Um, I would be very interested uh, in any insight you have into those relationships. Um, uh, these are Julian's mentors, right? You know, um, thinking Gavin, I, I Gavin McFadden. Yeah, I mean, as well. I, you know, one of the things that I always thought was really extraordinary, um, you know, in the United States, and, and I've had the honor to work with several heroes, and uh, one of them was Howard Zinn. So I was able to work with Zinn up until uh, his death. And I didn't work with him for a long time, but the, like the last year or so. And, um, you know, his, his intelligence and his capacity to recall history um, in the United States was just extraordinary. Um, and I'm sure it was broader than just the U.S., but that's what we heard about so much. And... Uh, you know, he, he passed away, he was swimming in outside of Los Angeles. Um, and it was, it was a huge loss for the world. Uh, but I, I remember when I first went to the embassy and, and I went with Michael and, um, and met, met Julian and, and the team and Gavin McFadden and Michael and, 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 and others and just kind of sitting around listening to them. They reminded me, uh, they reminded me of Howard Zinn and their knowledge of history um, was just extraordinary, not just in the U S but like, you know, Peruvian uprisings from the fifties and, and just shit like that. It was just extraordinary. And um you know, Sweden is a, one of the biggest arms dealers, you know, uh, uh, and, and manufacturers for the Nazis during Germany, during World War II, and, and just stuff you don't really know about. And, um, and it just struck me that, that uh, I was sitting down with, um, I don't know, you, sometimes you meet people and they, uh, 
they just elevate you. And, and I certainly felt that way about Michael, Julian, Gavin McFadden, and Michael was so bright and he'd been through so many battles. And, and I'd, I'd say Margie Ratner Kunstler is the same way. Um, uh, and, and, you know, their uh, long uh, history and um, just f- fighting the fights of our times it was just extraordinary. And, and I do think that, that Julian uh, likely, um, you know, wanted that sense of history and, and, and wanted people with the experience who've been through that. And, uh, you know, when you, when you see what he tweets and what he cares about, um, you know, he'll, uh, he'll tweet out uh, an old interview with, uh, with, with, uh, with Bill, Bill Kunstler, you know, from, from the sixties or seventies, um, debating, uh, what's his name? The, the guy who founded the national journal or not the national journal, but, uh, Oh, I forgot the, the big conservative, uh, paper that's been, or a magazine that's been around forever. But, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think he really wanted to wrap himself in that. And I think that's one of the most, um, you know, for me, not to go off on a tangent, but, you know, a, a lot of, you know, some of the brilliant minds today that are kind of up and comers, not just in, uh, you know, communications, but in, in intelligence, tech, etc. It's almost as if people think they can get what they want when they want and do it whenever they want. And there's not the respect for history that I think that there should be. And it's one of the things that I love that you all are doing with Decipher and going through the documents and and why I respect what Susie wrote so much uh, about kind of the history of WikiLeaks and going back, um, looking at a lot of the attacks on the organization, but what actually happened. I think that's really critical because if you don't understand history, you're not going to be able to make the most informed decision moving forward. And I think that's one of the reasons why Julian really wanted to embrace some of the, the greatest minds, uh, you know, legal activists um, like Michael, Michael Ratner and, and Margie and, and, and Gavin. Awesome. Uh, Tim, do you have any comments you'd like to add? Because I'd love to hear some more thoughts from you on all of this. Wow. That, uh, I was just, uh, <laughs> I'm sort of in a trance listening to uh, information that I'd never heard before. Um, uh, Fitz, man, you right. broke it down, brother. Uh, wow. Um, I need to go back and read this article that um that you were re- referencing um that Cassandra wrote uh but uh no I I'm just uh, like I like I said before I mean I I just believe that our job is to wake people up and that's that's what I try to do I'm I feel like I'm sort of um just just kind of new to this and just kind of finding my way through and just amazed at the amount of amount of truth telling because once you from it from my perspective like you come into this and you hear so much of corporate spin and and then you find you you slowly start finding these real voices these truth tellers you know and it's like um you're stumbling in the dark it's like oh there goes a there goes a rail Oh, go here goes. A, there's a couch I can put my put my hand on and kind of get through this darkness here. And, and you keep finding. So that's what these people mean to me. That's what you all mean to me. And um, it's just I, I think um, if if I can be that for others, then that would be a, like wow, like that's such a huge accomplishment to to be what you guys are. Well, it's an honor to have you with us. I'm oh. really really glad you joined us. And I think that the group of people that we've assembled in this visual over the last, like, what, approaching like 10 hours now has been so incredible and inspiring to see that we can all unify in solidarity for this, for Assange. I think it's really, really awesome. Trevor, I've got um, a question I'd like to ask you, and that is that you have met with Julian personally at the embassy and worked with him for a number of years. I would like to know what your impressions were when you met Julian and what the experience of meeting him at the embassy was like. 
Um, I mean, you know, first of all, just to be crystal clear, you know, there were a lot more people that were a lot closer, <laughs> you know, obviously to him than I was. I, I just uh, helped uh, uh, with, with media relations and, and getting his message out there. Um, so, you know, I wasn't any type of advisor or anything like that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I was, that's kind of what, like what I was saying. I, I think that um, his, his, just his intelligence and his appreciation and his knowledge of history uh, at a global, on a global scale. Um, and, and the same with Gavin McFadden and, and Michael Ratner and others and, and Susan and, and I mean, it was just, it was just, it was breathtaking. It was just extraordinary. And, uh, and I mean, you know, they talk about courage is contagious, you know, it got me. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, I was in DC and, and there's not a lot of communications firms in Washington or New York that would, would necessarily take on working with WikiLeaks but I had so much respect for, and I continue to for what they do. Um, and just wanting to, to, it's, it's just, it's just very attractive wanting to work on some of the biggest issues of our times and to be fearless. And as they say, courage is contagious and it truly, it truly was. So, um, brilliant, smart, um, methodical, uh, but you know, not, not like, um, stuff is thought, stuff is thought through. Um, but I would say funny as hell, <laughs> which you may not see just hilarious. And, uh, and just like a nice, a nice guy who has like a deep and profound, uh, you know, commitment to the truth and to, uh, you know, human rights and, and the good of the world, I would say. I don't know if I told you, but I, I actually went and met with him last Thursday and it, it was similar. I was just in awe. Like he, I was listening to him speak and I, I just kept like finding myself just like sitting there like, like shit <laughs> in awe because he's just he's so brilliant and that he was, he's really just absolutely remarkably intelligent. It, it was intimidating. It was, right, I was right. like, oh my God, I feel like such an idiot right now. <laughs> I'm so glad you went. That's so great, Cassandra. Yeah, it was, I didn't want to leave. Like I gave him a hug when I was leaving and I was like, I don't even want to leave. <laughs> Dad, I want to take you with me. Thank you, my brother. He's very tall. <laughs> You know, one other thing that was just a funny thing, I remember, um, like, I got a text. I, I forgot his name. Uh, he, he's a father, like a, a religious father from Ireland, but he's a boxer. He's a famous boxer. <laughs> and he went to the embassy, and he's a good friend of Julian's. And, um, and they were like, you know, they are like, father so-and-so is going to come and he's going to spar with Julian. <laughs> we want you to go get some articles. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was great. It was like, I called up Ryan Grimm from the Huffington Post. And at that point he was like running, he was before he went to the intercept and he was like running the, the home page or the front page. And I'm like, Hey man, if I could get you some, some sweet photos of Julian and the, and the, and, and I think the headline of the press release was Julian Assange punches out a priest on Easter Sunday or something. <laughs> and the photos were just awesome. If you search the Huffington Post website, I think you can probably still see them. But, you know, just just like, I mean, I, you know, he, here's the thing that I, I, I always like to tell people, um, or it's, it's just something that I've learned. Um, you know, uh, everybody's affected from their environment, in their environment that they're in. And God only knows what 
myself or any of you or any person or any critic out there, how they would, what their mental capacity would be, their physical, you know, how they would come across if they were essentially under house arrest for five years or, you know, detained for five years. And the embassies, you know, it's small. It's not like it's this, it's not like there's a gym, right? It's not like there's like a, a, a big patio for him to go stroll, right? It's like this tiny, tiny place. And, um, you know, I, I, I uh, and, and thank God that, that Carrera and, you know, the Ecuadorian government, like, you know, granted him asylum and, and, uh, and, and now citizenship and hopefully everything kind of gets smoothed over rather quickly. But, um, mm. you know, everybody's affected by their environment. The fact that he hasn't gone crazy or lost his mind is, is just a miracle. And uh, because you want to talk about like having emotional and mental and, and physical strength to endure I mean, what that guy has gone through is insane. And, uh, you know, any critic, any of these, these, you know, Rachel Maddow's or these snarky, you know, pundits or journalists talking about like, you know, he's obsessed with himself or what just bullshit, like, fuck them. Like, why don't they go live in an embassy for five years or six years and see how they feel? You know, world. <laughs> yeah, are. and I think it backfired because I almost feel like he's more effective than there. You know, kind of like alone or not alone, but you know, he can stay focused at least. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, you know, uh, what Rachel Maddow? I'm, I'd be surprised if she's touched a stirring wheel in the last three years. Um, and um, and we know Julian hasn't, but we know that's not because uh, that's not out of choice. All right, so like these these people, they they like I, I I said earlier, they have no concept of of they're a shell of who they could be or, or maybe who they used to be. I, I don't know, and maybe at one time they were different people. But I would like to say about the Ecuadorian embassy. I mean, Ecuador, you did a great thing. You you know you took in our brother, right? Well, continue to do a good thing. Like don't don't let us down now. This is this is complete bullshit, right? Uh, you know, if you if you're gonna you're gonna make him a citizen, we'll give him the rights of citizenship, which is to be able to speak his mind and 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 don't pull the rug out from underneath him. You 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 made us all proud in what you've done, and and now this. So um, I was really hard on him earlier, but Fitz Fitz, uh, you just put it in perspective. Maybe I need to, I don't know, like tell him, hey guys, come on now, like uh, uh, be who you be be who we thought you were. Um, and, and don't pull this. Um, not not now. This is the last thing we need. Well put. I had a, thoughts. For sure. Go ahead. I had that little mermaid song stuck in my head where Ursula is like, I'll give you everything you want. All you have to do is give up your voice. <laughs> like, <it's instead> of <laughs> ah, that's, interesting. that's perfect. The perfect image. Wow. Hey, you I'm all. i it in my head like half the time I've been on here. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an awesome uh, metaphor, I think, for sure. Figured I'd share. <laughs> Disney or not, doesn't matter. <laughs> hey, y'all, I'm so sorry, but I actually have to write a couple of press releases. I have to sign off, but I just, um, I thank you so much for doing all of this and Elizabeth and 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 Susie and, and Cassandra, your goddesses and, and Tim. I don't really know you, man, but you'll, you'll, you're a God, I'm sure. But uh, just thank you all for what you all are doing. And, uh, you know, let me also just say this. Uh, I'm so psyched the karaoke came on. Um, you know, uh, when, when, when I start, uh, because he, he, he is, he, there was so much respect for him across the board. Um, from progressive journalists to, conser you know, conservative journalists, except torture lovers, uh, to like very mainstream journalists. And, and I think that that's critical. Um, you know, in the same way, you know, Julian, when I was working 
with them, you know, he would do democracy now and, you know, that's great. Go on with Amy. But when we started to get him on meet the press and on this week with Stephanopoulos and really kind of like mainstream it. So that message could get out to the masses. Um, it's just, it's important stuff. And so having people like Kariaku on, uh, Ray McGovern, you know, all of that, it's just, I mean, God love those guys. And, uh, and, and the women that, that helped make that happen. And, and uh, so anyway, yeah, Ray, with that. Ray was with us for like a, at least five hours. That was incredible and such an honor yeah. to share, share this little panel with him. Absolutely. All so right. Thank Thanks, you. Susie. Man, thank you, brother. Nice meeting you. Take thank care. You. Trevor, Trevor, before yeah. you go, what's your message to Julian? You have so many supporters out there, man, and uh, that that um, have so much respect for you and keep fighting and uh, never let the bastards beat you. Just keep fighting and, and thank you for everything that you do for everyone else. That's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. So, um... I'm sure that in the coming days we're going to hear, oh, I can't believe you had this person on. Oh, I can't believe you had that person on. Oh, don't you know that that person's a mega supporter? Oh, don't you know that that person is a uh, hates Democrats or is a Democrat or is a blah, 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 blah. And I just like want to clear this now, like to save myself responding to the tweets. You might notice that tonight on my timeline, I have not responded to a single hater and I won't be responding to a single hater. I will be responding only to the people who have relentlessly supported this effort, who put themselves out there and participated, no matter what their political ideology is. We are all united by wanting to support Julian and that is it. And I am going to have just zero, not only zero tolerance, but zero attention or zero time for anybody who wants to be a backseat driver or a critic because your criticism is not freeing Julian and your criticism is not advancing the cause of the free press and your criticism is not protecting sources, is not protecting whistleblowers so either keep your two cents to yourself or don't be surprised when you don't get my two cents back because what we have here is a beautiful gathering of people for a unified cause and that I just want to clear this up now on the stream because I, I'm sure I'm sure that it's coming in the future days so the there are other people um, who've been invited tonight who I personally can't stand their work would never amplify it and I have no ideological cause with them except that they are significant people who support Julian Assange and for me this is the time to lay aside the divide and conquer, lay aside the different differing political ideologies, lay aside the personal beefs. I mean I even invited someone on here tonight who I've had direct personal beef with in the past because they were willing to support Julian and support him on this issue. So I feel like this is the time for all of us to rise above and to be adults and to keep our eye on the prize. And the prize is human rights for Julian and liberty for Julian. So I just, I just want to put that out there now before I, I get all the complaints. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of what we've done tonight. I'm really proud and I will stand up for everyone who has appeared and anyone who appears in the, in the future. And Susie, I know, um, you know, you are so constantly over the last 10 hours we've been doing this stream, you know, you're, as you're mentioning just now, you're always, um, you know, calling people, trying to get people to come join us. So while we have you here, um, I want to ask you the one uh, question that's come up in the etherpad for you and I, which is, has Snowden or anybody else from the Freedom of the Press Foundation uh, said anything about Julian's situation? That's from BB Hammer, Ham Hammer and Eben Kim. So... Um, Snowden has um, said many, many, many supportive things about Julian and about WikiLeaks, and they are very seldom reported. And on the extremely rare occasion that uh, Snowden has said something critical about WikiLeaks, 
it has been reported hundreds of thousands of times and is referenced and sourced over and over and over and over and over again. Um, in being Julian Assange, one of the first things I think in the, in the first segment um, of the article, I raised the fact that in the lead up to the election, Julian was calling Hil uh, Clinton versus Trump cholera versus gonorrhea. Snowden was calling Hillary versus Trump the calculating villain versus the unthinking monster. So while there has been this massive hype of Snowden versus WikiLeaks, it's this, you know, this, there's this beef, this bad blood, this blah, blah, blah. If you actually stop listening to what the media say about what Snowden thinks about WikiLeaks or WikiLeaks thinks about Snowden, and you actually take a look at them, what they say about the issues, they are virtually identical. Um, so you'll find that the, the supposed rivalry is 99.99% hype. And you'll find that for every one criticism of one against the other, that there is a thousand commonalities that are overlooked and downplayed so that the media can advance this agenda of division. That's all it is. It's just yet another aspect of the divide and conquer. Um, the bringing together of people who are profoundly different in opinion and in tr the trajectory of their work, bringing them together into one united cause is by far the thing I'm the most proud of. This is tonight has been the closest to the 99% that we've had that, where it doesn't matter who you voted for, it doesn't matter what you think, um, so long as you care about other people and express empathy for other people. Uh, I think, Absolutely. I think that's phenomenal. And I just note, actually, um, you know what, maybe we can even play it. I'm not sure how the sound will, the sound will work. Julian, um, Julian tweeted out my last interview with H.A. Goodman. And he said, this is good. But when he did that, he had it set to a specific mm -hmm. time in the interview. It was like 12 yeah. minutes or 12 and a half minutes. And, and the point, that point that he had selected in the interview was where I didn't realize it. it seems like quite prescient now, given like what I've just been saying about tonight. But I was saying at the time, like, we can't build a revolution of the 30% or the, the 40%. Like we can't stick to our clicky little groups with these like, like strict boundaries, strict ideological boundaries where we excommunicate anybody who steps a tippy toe over one of those boundaries and say, you're not welcome here. You can't be part of our group, out you go. That's not how you build a revolution. It's not how you build a mass movement. You yeah, I think you um, actually need to be inclusive. You have to the open time, the doors to everyone. Yeah, I remember the timestamp on that started right when AJ asked you a brilliant question about um, how it is that the legacy press hypocrites live with themselves for when they um, know that they're, they're telling people on uh, lies every single day. And I remember, yeah, your answer to that was extremely eloquent and well put together. So. I was surprised because I hadn't um, realised that that was even particularly a highlight in the interview. But what that tells me, I mean, because I spent most of the interview talking about how amazing Julian is and why we should support him. And it's, it's, it's actually extremely telling that Julian's favourite moment of the interview wasn't me any of the hundred times of me talking about how important he is or why we need to support him. His favorite part of the interview was where I'm talking about how we need to open the doors to everyone, be approachable to everyone and include everybody in our movement. So I feel like tonight would have made him proud in that regard. I feel like we've done him justice by not saying, oh, we can't invite him, we can't invite her, we can't invite that person or this person, or we can only invite this sector of people and not the other. I feel like tonight has been very representative of the widespread, the, the 
the um, a cross section of all of the different support bases that Julian has, and I think that that's really Definitely. really important. Definitely. And I don't know how long Tim is going to have to spend with us, but I want to ask you a question, Tim, that just showed up in the Etherpad. And it was, what kind of interference have you experienced with social media and attempting to quell your voice? And it's from a big fan from New York City going by the um, name Maron333. And I know just from my own reporting on your amazing work that I, I remember looking up how you had had thousands of your videos demonetized by YouTube. So... Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. And I, I want to thank uh, my friend from New York for asking that question. Yeah, it's been tough. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going through, I've been dealing with a lot of censorship on all platforms, but YouTube specifically, that's been my main home for live streaming. And uh, it's been the place where I've uh, had, you know, the most amazing guests on my shows. Um, but as I sit here with you guys, I feel like I ain't been through nothing. Like what I've been <laughs> dealing with is, ah, you can't stream for three months, Tim. Really? Oh, poor baby. Poor baby. You'll be okay. You know, so I, I don't even want to focus on that now. It's, it seems trivial. Um, and, and I am going to have to leave soon, but I would like to say, you know, there are a lot of people who should be here tonight, but they're not here. And it's and don't you worry, Susie. Uh, let the critics talk their bullshit. Let them, let them have at it. Uh, either you support free speech or you don't. Either you, 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 you want a free press or you don't. Um, they would... They would be here if it was corporate media throwing a party for Joy Reid. Um, they'd be here if we were celebrating the the the, mad, the uh, magnanimous contributions of Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes. But the fact that we are talking about a true truth a true truth truth teller, they're not here. You know, we could be talking about the the, the starving children of Yemen. We could be talking about the Legionnaires' disease that's popping up in Flint, Michigan. We could be talking about election rigging in Florida, uh, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Tim Canova, but they'd rather talk about Misty, uh, Stormy Daniels, Stormy Daniels and, and Trump. And if, yeah. if Trump had an affair one time. So so we know where their focus is. Um, and and that's why people like Julian are so precious to us. And, and, I, I, and I just want to say, look, this is not a eulogy. He's going to be fine. He's going to kick some ass. They're going to do more than this. So I, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm just waiting for the day to, for him to come home, pop some bottles, and, and, uh, and, and live stream that shit. Definitely. That is an incredible <laughs> thought. That's extremely energizing to hear. That's so true. Awesome. What a Thank party that will be. Very much. And I, I love that point. It's not a eulogy. Yeah, they're fantastic. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, you guys, I'm going to um, do the unthinkable. And I'm actually going to. Oh, no. Call, I'm going to call. No. no, you can't do that. Hold, We're on gonna, like... hold on a second. Hold on a second. If you guys can stay up, I will pass one of you host, and you are more than welcome to keep this going. I just chugged like a whole more, thing. More <laughs> than welcome. Um, but right now I'm getting cankles and I am not, <laughs> I, I am not old enough to get cankles. Okay? I might be old enough to get a gray hair or two, but I'm not old enough to get cankles. So I am literally going to have to have a lay down. I don't know if you can tell from my eyes either, but I'm pretty much like had it now. Um, Cause like Kim, it was a very long day before I started the stream and this journey. I'm more than happy to pass host to Elizabeth. And if by some miracle you're still going whenever I resurface, I'm more than happy to jump back on stream as well, just like Kim. Um, Julian, my message to you. My message to you. I actually said it in the HA video, but I'll say it again. Everybody who you have talked to in person or online, you you have never been able to get a thought out that wasn't packed full of information. You have taught us things that we couldn't have learned elsewhere. And we will carry that knowledge that you have given us for the rest of our lives. And we will seed and propagate that knowledge to other people. And I can feel inside myself that, that knowledge that you have came not just from your own curiosity and from your own exploration and research, though you've done plenty of that, but it also came from your guides and from your teachers and from your mentors. 
and you you have paid it forward. And I want you to know we will all continue to pay it forward. And I also want you to know that in the spirit of your sacrifice, so we sacrifice. We have the strength to sacrifice personally and to pay the price because of the example that you have set. And that's it. We love you. The world loves you. Congratulations. You have made change. Like I said on RT, you're an agent of change. You're not an agent of any man or of any country. You're an agent of change and you have brought change. You have brought change to this planet. So on that note, ladies, I'm very proud that it's three women. That yeah. <laughs> right Final um, countdown. We're right here <laughs> representing. Very, 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 very proud of that fact. And if you guys want to keep going, you are more than welcome. I'll even lay here and listen to you <laughs> and and fall asleep listening to you but i am super proud of every single person who came on tonight this like i said i'm going to say it again this is the first stream that we've brought the left and the right together united in one cause we have overcome the divide and conquer nobody saw that happening and it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't done this to julian so true, this very is, true. Yet, yet again, I see this time and time again. Whenever the deep state has some evil plan, it always backfires on them because their motivation is so rotten and corrupt that karma does not allow them to to truly profit from it. And that's exactly what's happened here. They thought they were silencing Julian, and instead we have a viral hashtag with God knows how many tweets and impressions and we have people that they've invested years and millions of dollars trying to separate and divide coming together and I think there's nothing more perfect than that and that's the most perfect ending to my little contribution to this anyway so thank Absolutely. you ladies I love you very much you have all of our organizing team at your disposal in the discord if you need them Elizabeth can hook you up yeah, I will probably, I think I'll be able to hold on from an hour, maybe two, um, especially for the people in YouTube and on the Etherpad that haven't had their questions answered. I'll do my best. And in case anybody else would like to join us, you know, and thank you, Susie, um, for everything you've done, whether it's the, you know, multiple tens of thousands of words you wrote for Julian, or whether it's, you know, this tens of hours you've put into this stream and before the stream started to put it together. Thank you for everything you do, because like today, you didn't have to invite me to this thing, but you did. And I was so, so honored that you even said, hey, get in the stream with us, because, yeah, I didn't I, I don't think of myself as part of this group of amazing journalists and activists that you all are. So thank you for inviting hey, me. Ray thank McGovern, you. Ray McGovern knew who you were. <laughs> So it I still think doesn't seem still I seems think, very surreal. So I, I think it's time to face the fact when when the people that you look up to the most know your name, it's a bloody good sign. I can tell Extremely you that. I can day. tell you that from personal from personal experience. Um, it means a lot when your heroes and those you look up to uh, in turn uh, acknowledge your own work, and that happened for you tonight. And I'm very proud of you. I'm very pleased for you because I know how exciting that is for you. Thank you, Susie. But yeah, thank you again for inviting me. And thank you, Cass, for staying with us for so long. And on that point about, that thank Susie just made about me. the fact, yeah, well, just about the fact that um, that we have had all these people from these different political perspectives or whatever, um, it has been the most chill, awesome, fun time with you all. There's just no no tension whatsoever. And I think, yeah, Ray, Ray made that point earlier. It was like the best five hours he spent with people in a very long time. And that's been the same for me this entire uh, 10 hours or so. so. My final know. final sentence before I literally log off is okay. that um, I'll talk to Kim and we will do this again and yeah. maybe maybe we book 50 people, maybe we time slot everybody and I think it's key to have the full spectrum of left to right and everything in between and everything outside of that. I really believe that's key and extremely powerful so We'll put some effort into it, but guys, go for it. The floor is yours. Elizabeth, I've passed you host of the Zoom. Cass, thank you so much for being here so long. 
Thank you so much for having me. I wouldn't, there's no place I would rather be than standing up for you. That is so cool. Okay, group group hug, right? Yes, very much group hug. <laughs> and I'm going to blow a kiss to the very special people who I know are watching. Thank you so much for being here and for supporting us and helping to amplify for us. Absolutely. And also, um, the, there is one reason that I will limit my um, time here as, as the host with with you all uh, to just one or two hours, because I know that we have so many amazing, amazing selfless individuals who have been behind the scenes all day long in Discord and helping us, you know, keep the Zoom going and helping us write Etherpad questions. It's been incredible. And I, I couldn't even name all of you because I know some of you probably wouldn't want me to, but also because, you know, there's just so many of you helping us out constantly all day today so thank you to every single one of you who have participated and who have been in the chat uh, asking us questions so um if you have any more questions or ones that and i'll i will try to look through now and see ones that i that we haven't answered and um obviously if they're to people like uh ray or you know the pirate party uh co contributors earlier then i can't ask those questions but any that i can i'll try to get to very soon so so Cass, I'll just hand you the mic uh, metaphorically while I read th through some of these questions real fast. I actually hate being on camera. This is definitely the longest that I've ever done. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I turn into a rambling mess of nerves, but um, this is actually pretty chill. So. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to talk about other than how much I adore Julian. <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of that today. It's pretty much my only deal breaker for friends and people that I know is if they don't support WikiLeaks, we can't be friends. <laughs> like, I just cannot, um, because it means that they don't really care about the truth. And um, exactly. You know, yeah. So it's been really awesome that everybody's gotten along so well and had such a good time in here. Even the there's people that probably have me blocked on Twitter <laughs> who were in here today. <laughs> and we all still had fun because we have common cause here. And um, I like, I love anyone who loves WikiLeaks. So no matter the politics or anything else. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point. And I think it's only somebody as unique as Assange and as gifted and principled and full of integrity as Assange is and, and as is WikiLeaks as an organization that could actually inspire that in people to right. really, truly, genuinely, not, not in a fake veneer way, but to genuinely rise above political difference like that. You know, you don't see that very often in human sure. beings, much less for like 12 hours straight or something, <laughs> whatever we're on to now. Yeah, he's just, he's an amazing person. It's, I really, really need some parenting tips from Christina Assange. <laughs> Cause like, she did a great job. Um, yeah, I've never, there's never, I can't think of another person that has ever inspired me the way that he does. So it's, it was very cool getting to meet him last week. And I, I was so inspired and I just want to do more now. And um, I feel like he has that impact on everybody, and that's such a special thing. Absolutely. Definitely. And I feel the same way. Like, when Susie does this amazing, incredible work, it definitely inspires me to more stridently support uh, WikiLeaks and Assange and what they do. Um, and then I've got a question now in the Etherpad that says um, it's from II Captain. I know I've read a couple of your questions out before, at least one. Um, but they say, remind us the, about the tweet and the subject that pulled the plug on Julian, an elected official uh, detained and returned to Spain, parallel to uh, companies, but some say comp killed many. I'm, I'm not sure what the end of that uh, question is referring to, but um, I think it's a great point to um, kind of bring people back and remind them what has caused like the reason that we're here today for a number of hours. And it's that um, obviously Ecuador cut off uh, Julian's internet access. He, they've prevented visitors. They've prevented phone calls. And so, um, and it was specifically, and, and the, the WikiLeaks account has tweeted that it was specifically a tweet Julian made regarding um, the Catalonian president, I believe. Let me just pull up, pull that up really fast. And Cassandra, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that the tweet specifically that um, resulted in this, apparently. I mean, <clears throat> he's supporting another political prisoner, essentially. Yes, exactly. Such a beautiful thing. And that's exactly what 
you should be doing. Like everybody should be doing that. Um, so it's it's pretty terrible that this is what they decided to pull his internet for. <laughs> yes. You know, Absolutely. they support him and he's a political prisoner. He's supporting, he's doing the same thing Ecuador did. He's, you know, <laughs> they should be. That's, that's a really fantastic point. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, I'm looking at the tweet. It's specifically, and I, I was hesitating to say the name because I didn't want to murder the pronunciation. I still probably will, but it's um, Carl's Piedmont, who is the uh, president of Catalonia. And um, they've obviously arrested him. And, you know, he spoke out about that. He compared it to the Gestapo. And, you know, I think that that is totally ridiculous that a journalist would be silenced for that. But Absolutely. And I'm just glancing through any of these um, the, uh, questions we haven't answered. And um, I'm probably losing my train of thought a little bit because I've been on here for so long. One second. Uh, Not a problem. I have a house guest and she has got here and now my dog, <laughs> Ricky, is going crazy. Okay, I'm just glancing through these questions for Ray. Um, Um, somebody asked, uh, Santiago Mullins on YouTube asked, what if Ecuador is actually playing geopolitics, shutting down Assange's internet to, maxim uh, to maximize his last tweet and avoid Catalonian president extradition? That's an interesting take. I don't know that we can, you know, I think we'd have to speculate about the hows and the whys of that, um, you know, more than we can, we can't definitively answer that question. But I think that um, regardless of the reason, like regardless of the, the specific geopolitical maneuvering that may be going on behind the scenes with this, uh, like as John uh, Kiriakou pointed out earlier that he, you know, he definitely felt like the CIA would be um, very much happy that this has happened, for example, like d despite all that, though, the, the end result is the same. And the result is that a journalist has been silenced and that is horrific. And that somebody who is arbitrarily detained uh, for years has been silenced and stopped from communication with his family and the people that love him and, you know, to the outside world and to visitors. So, uh, you know, that is why we're here. That's why we're speaking out against it. And um, thank you for your question. I hope that answered it a little bit. I may be not as um, specific as you would have liked, but it's what we have. So, and then this, this um, question represents a whole lot of questions. Zelda Robert said, is there something more we can do to support Julian? How, what, where, when? And there are a lot of questions like this in the etherpad. So this can like symbolically answer all of those. And I think we have discussed this pretty well, but it was towards the earlier part of the stream when Kim.com was, was with us. And he really emphasized, you know, uh, a, you know, definitely donate to WikiLeaks, but, you know, share, talk to, he, I remember Kim specifically said, talk to your friends and family, you know, speak out to the people that are in your life about what is happening right now. And I remember in that conversation, I was saying, you know, and, you know, it just so happens that Susie's article is so timely because it is the perfect um, text to, kind of back up what you're saying to your friends and family with. So like, if you're saying, uh, you know, oh my God, this thing happened to Julian Assange and it's so horrible. And they say, well, why should I care? You hand them um, Susie's piece and it will explain everything if they're willing to read it. And um, if they're not willing to read it, then give them the uh, interviews that Susie did with HA and Lee Camp and all of, and the amazing conversations that she's had about that. So um, that I think, also, um, go ahead. Yeah. In a specific more specific manner. There is a, a protest at the White House uh, in June for the six year anniversary of Julian entering the embassy. Yes, that's a really good good point to, to make. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll describe it, um, you know, throw that out there for people. I think that's yeah. a great So event. there's that, there's, you know, lobby politicians like Everybody on the Hill now, they joke and call me the WikiLeaks lobbyist or WikiLeaks is unofficial lobbyist because every time that I'm over there, it's like harassing people about Julian. Um, do that. <laughs> it works. Um, I have spent about three years uh, lobbying this one specific politician to get on board with the Julian cause and he's finally coming around. <laughs> so yeah, things like that, they work. 
um, tweet at people, tweet at the people in the administration that use Twitter a lot, uh, remind them that Trump's own lawyers have made the case that WikiLeaks is protected under the First Amendment. Um, there's, there's lots of things people can do and everything helps. <laughs> Absolutely, really great points, and I think the point about lobbying and getting your uh, getting the your uh, voice and thoughts to your pol politicians that represent you is great. You know, really letting them know that if you don't um, support Assange and WikiLeaks, that you won't have our vote, because as much as they're you know um, enamored with their donors, they still do have to um, get reelected. So, right. I actually registered with um, as WikiLeaks party. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I voter registration the other day. And I was hoping they would print it on the card, but instead they just wrote other party. So. <laughs> yeah. Good times. Definitely. I was just thanking everyone that's been helping us in Discord because they've been fantastic. And now looking through some of these questions. So this was an interesting one. It's from Salt Makes Snakes Dead. And they said, how about not just putting pressure on Trump, but also on those speaking loud against Julian Assange in the admin, like John Bolton, make it clear that we don't stand with Bolton and his wishes for Assange. I think that's a great idea. I think putting pressure on Trump and, you know, in addition to the, his, his supporters, the people that are close to Trump, um, definitely is a good idea. You need to be um, reminding them that you support WikiLeaks and that you support Assange and their right to free speech. Right. And to publish. And I think that's hugely important, especially because a lot of the people who support WikiLeaks right now are people who support the Trump administration. I mean, not all, of course, but just like when the Iraq war logs came out and the right went crazy saying that they were an enemy of the state and committing treat or espionage and all this stuff. Um, the same thing's happening now with the left. It's just reversed. And so currently a lot of the people who support him the most and are the most vocal are people on the right. So those are the people who need to be yelling at Bolton, at Pompeo, at all these people and being like, listen, we're your people and we disagree. <laughs> so that's absolutely super important. And then um, Pat Cummings uh, asked us, do we know uh, who is the ISP for the Ecuadorian embassy? And I have no idea. I am not the tech person that should answer that question. I wish we had had um, Susie and Kim on uh, earlier who could have maybe given you a more definite answer because I have no clue. Um, so I'll just have to, sorry, I apologize for that. If anybody in chat has the answer, um, then please, you know, comment and let us know. Um, then we have Diana Rada Diviana from Facebook. Do you guys know if it's possible that this has to do with anything happening with the Russia situation? I may, I think I may have uh, answered this or we, we may have discussed this before, but basically, um, you know, the Guardian wrote something very inaccurate, uh, suggesting that this was sort of to do with uh, the Russia situation and that it's really much more to do with um, Spain and its treatment of Catalonians and then Assange's um, willingness to stand up for them and to, to defend them against um, really, really corrupt and violent um, crackdowns by the Spanish government. So, and then uh, Chad Wilson from YouTube asks, do you think focusing on destroying the public's view of the FBI's reputation might pressure them into taking action against corruption? And no, I don't think that, um, you know, demeaning the FBI's reputation will have any impact on their policies or actions whatsoever. I mean, for example, the CIA, nobody, a lot of people hate the CIA and that doesn't stop them from torturing and doing all the things that they do. So, right. And then, um, and yeah, Cassandra, if you have any thoughts at all that you want to throw in, just interrupt me. I don't mind. I'm just staring at the etherpad going through these questions, but. Yeah, go for it. I'm just reading through Twitter right now. Awesome. Yeah. If you see any um, really interesting stuff on the uh, reconnect Julian hashtag, let me know. Okay. And then we have Crix, uh, Chris Nixofk. Uh, I actually think maybe we went over this with Lee Camp, but they said, can you comment on the role Anonymous played in the Arab Spring and Occupy Movement and the role of hackers in general to provide information? And I know that Lee Camp did talk about, you know, the influence WikiLeaks had on so. um um, you know, inspiring some different social movements, including the Occupy movement and um, the Arab Spring. 
Yeah. He's influenced so much. I mean, on just a global scale, it's unparalleled. There's nobody who has ever done, done this kind of good for the world the way that he has. It's so impressive. Absolutely. Definitely. Going back to the ether pad. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to delete this a uh, couple of these tweets, that, uh, questions that I've answered because I'm so sleep deprived or not sleep deprived, but tired that I'm like going back to ones we've already talked about. Um, oh, this is an interesting. Okay, so pro protect what's true, who I know you've been in a lot of the Decipher You streams because I remember your your um, name, your handle is really uh, distinctive. And you, great question, and I'm so sorry we didn't get to it sooner because you asked, how can we make sure that our tweets don't disappear if we hashtag Reconnect Julian? Would they survive if we accompany this important hashtag with a mix of different hashtags, for example? I wish we'd gotten to this earlier. It was right at the top. It's just that the, the highlighter color of that text was really, really light, so I didn't even see it until now. But yes, I'm sure that there was um, attempts to censor that hashtag as soon as it really got off the ground. But as Susie uh, let us know throughout the day, the metrics on that hashtag nonetheless were um, incredible and amazing and successful despite the censorship. So, you know, you guys have done an amazing job spreading the word about this, about this live stream. And I'm going to message a couple of people to see if we can get some more. And I think this is another question that was kind of you know, stems from the time that Lee Camp was around with us. Um, they said the the handle they are going by is Friendly Fire, and the or Friendly Fire question. And then it says, how does Antifa, Antifa uh, fit relative to protests like OWS, DAPL, and are enforcement responses to them relatively light-handed, considering their openly aggressive policies? And I think that's a bit of a you know, it's kind of off topic from what we're talking about here. And I think that is a kind of politically divisive question. So I'm not even going to attack it. I think that um, that's really not going to anything that we're talking about in the stream. So thanks, though, for participating. Um, and there's actually um, Ryan Bannock from YouTube asks, uh, they have a question for Ibn Kim and Fly. I'm really glad that people are, you know, addressing these people that are helping us so much throughout the day with this stream. They're asking Fly and even Kim, do they think Julian will release some real, uh, some incriminating files? I, and then they say, I mean, real incriminating. Well, I don't know why you think even Kim and Fly would know whether Julian Assange is going to release, uh, you know, incriminating files. But um, that's another question that I don't know that, you know, we're in a place to answer. So. Hope Kesselring asked if we know of any other live stream that has had so many noted individuals, comedians, journalists, and whistleblowers, and says that this looks like history to them. And thank you, Hope Kesselring. You're another person I really, I recognize from all of um, supporting Susie's work and also just I for you. So thank you for the question. And I don't know, Cassandra, have you ever been part of a live stream that has this many different uh, wonderful people? Absolutely <laughs> not. It's really cool. I think that what you guys accomplished today is, outstanding well you were right there with us for 90 percent of the time yeah. so it's been really it's an honor it's really cool and yeah supporting wikileaks is pretty much the the way that i can tell if people are good or bad <laughs> i'm just yeah pretty it's much the first thing i ask everybody i'm like so what's your opinion on wikileaks and if they like say something bad i'm like okay bye <laughs> yeah Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And it's really sad when people close to you, um, you know, don't see the value in WikiLeaks or Assange, no matter how much you talk to them. I mean, that can be a real, a real downer. But um, so um, another another question that's coming up in the Etherpad is um, towards myself. And it says someone had an interesting idea to piggyback the hashtag with another hashtag that is trending and not being censored. And that's something to consider. I think that's a fantastic idea. I know that that's something that definitely works. And as you're, and they're typing right now on the pad, something to consider for next time. Absolutely. I wish we could have um, had that discussion earlier in the day when it wasn't, you know, 10 hours in, but yeah, no, that's definitely something to think about for next time. 
and Cassandra, I know that you're really, you know, good at the Twitter game. So if you ever have any suggestions for the next stream on how to evade censorship a little bit, I'm sure that would be awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll think on it. But one thing I always did when I would do write up Twitter storms, I would pre-write a whole bunch of tweets with links and hashtags and then just put them in a paste bin and then send that out to everybody and be like, copy and paste all these tweets. <laughs> and it always worked, like it always trended. But the censorship has gotten a little bit worse since those days. So. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just getting a message from even Kim, who is one of our fantastic supporters uh, today that's been invisible and behind the scenes, but that has been there just uh, as long as Susie and me and, uh, you know, you and everyone who's been part of this. So even Kim is letting me know that Facebook's restream will need to be reset in 28 minutes. And so I think that'll be a really great, you know, I think we'll definitely make it past midnight uh, Central Standard Time. And I think that'll be a good point to end it because... Um, not just for us, but because I know that there are people that are helping us behind the scenes who probably right. are good to go after about 12 hours. So even if you'll let me know um, when we hit like, um, you know, five minutes out from um, that reset time, then just let me know uh, in Discord and I will um, wrap things up. Yeah, Susie has recommended also that if we need to fill up some time, we can uh, read Julian's old blog post. <laughs> that, that would be awesome. But my phone battery is pretty much dead. <laughs> my, I have a f two ferrets and my dog running around and they keep unplugging me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Ferrets are awesome. Not to get totally sidetracked on a totally unrelated subject, but ferrets are great. So They're my little cat snakes. <laughs> my dog is named Wiki, so like pet talk is totally related, sort of. Definitely, yes. Um, insubordinate um, has asked from YouTube, hey, Cassandra, has Julian ever talked to you about the contents of his Dead Man's Switch? <laughs> and I mean... I, no. no yeah. <laughs> Good, concise answer. No. <laughs> so I like that. Okay, so... Um, and then there's one uh, from Chris that I know that I discussed earlier. I just didn't write answer it in the Etherpad. But you asked, um, what social media platform do you think is the best or uh, best secure, most secure, or least data mining, and do you not use any of them? And obviously that was from when Kim was with us. Uh, we just I, I commented that I think Steemit is the is one of the best um, social media platforms you could possibly use. I know that a lot of independent media is going to Steemit, um, but that's my opinion. Obviously that's directed towards Kim. So, um, but I think, you know, Susie's made a really big point about the importance of Steemit. So, and obviously Assange hates Facebook. So definitely not Facebook. Yeah. Um, yeah they're all getting pretty bad. And yeah, very. Because there are alternatives like Steemit, like Gab. But the problem is that though all the people that you need to reach and influence are on Twitter and on Facebook. So, you know, like with Gab, it's kind of an echo chamber for the right. There's no mainstream journalists. There's no politicians. And so there's not really, it's not a good substitution unless everybody moves. Otherwise you're just, it's an echo chamber and it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not fun to talk to an echo chamber and preach the choir. Um, it's definitely better to feel like your message is getting out there to people who maybe have no familiarity with what you're talking about at all. Right. And then we have another um, question that we may have talked about before, but it also is about social media. And it says, what is the goal of organized media push against Facebook if new rules specify that the data remains with the, with the collector and may not be passed on? Would that not be the death of the smaller com competitors and the creation of a, a central storage space? And does, does, and does not the directing of the responsibility for our own data to, uh, for our own data to the user directly to a social, uh, this is getting into so much um, specificity about this that I'm not sure that I'm equipped to answer it. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, and it, it's towards Kim. My Google account. So like... <laughs> I think I think the initial part of their question is really interesting. That's why I'm still staring at it. It says, "What's the goal of the organized media push against Facebook?" That I I would be willing to maybe attempt to answer and maybe um but not not that i know but just one possibility is that uh you know facebook has yeah. kind of become less popular with the younger people and it's kind of sliding a little bit anyway so they may feel like it's an an okay scapegoat for the whole like you know 
Russia scandal, you know, debacle. But that's just a, a partial thought. But. Maybe. But Cassandra, if you have, I'm sure that you have thoughts about, you know, why the media might, you know, kind of all ban up again or gang up against Facebook all of a sudden. Well, I mean, you're right. They need a scapegoat and it's an easy target and, you know, people are mad and they can't get away with ignoring things that people are upset about forever. <laughs> you know, they, they ignore the contents of the WikiLeaks emails, for example, people were outraged about that and the media downplayed it and they kind of ignored it, told people that it was legal to look at all this stuff. You can't get away with that forever. Eventually you have to like, acknowledge these things <laughs> that people are upset about and that's a huge one right now oh. I'm, sorry. I'm just looking through the sorry. last few i know we, we only we're having you know we're coming up on the point where we're gonna have like 10 minutes left so i'm gonna pick out like one last question to answer and thank you everybody to put that put your questions into the etherpad and to those that were compiling them thank you so much and um, it's one that's directed towards you, Cassandra. It's from Bullshit Man, who is totally awesome. They said, uh, very few real people have had the opportunity to meet or speak with Julian in years. So your insight and thoughts are really valuable. So the question is, if you wish, can you expand on your friendship with Sanj, how it's developed, any tidbits or info about his situation in the embassy that you can provide? And please do not answer anything that you don't feel comfortable yeah. with. I just, I'm, yeah. I wasn't even planning to ever publicly say that I visited him. Um, that was a little bit of a slip up. Uh, yeah. I didn't tell Susie that I wasn't telling anyone. So yeah, came up on the stream, but um, we just, you know, talked on Twitter because I've been a huge supporter for a long time and I would, you know, t message him things or be like, Hey, did you see this? And, you know, just kind of snowballs. And then um, I asked if I could come up to visit and went <laughs> um it was really cool um it was really interesting because there were you know protesters outside and it was you know six o'clock at night or something when I went on a Thursday and there was not really anything happening and I was like this is great this is so cool because I mean I knew that they were always out there and that they did it several times a week but it was surreal to actually like pull up to the embassy in my Uber and, and see like this big part in Assange or free Assange sign. I was just like, that's awesome. So great. Um, and it was cool. Um, when I went in, the people at the front desk were super nice. They were like, Oh yeah, we were expecting you. And, you know, just very friendly. And um, it seems like he's surrounded by good people. Like they really genuinely seemed like nice people and they, were friendly and they cared and that that was really cool because that was something I've worried about and thought about a lot um and yeah you know he's he's great he's Julian he's exactly how you expect him to be he, it's a little intimidating awesome. because he's brilliant um and I get you know they always say you shouldn't meet your heroes <laughs> this is one yeah that's interesting good. yeah <laughs> if you ever have the chance to meet him you must take it he is wonderful and um it gave me so much different insight on things because there's a lot of stuff you can't really say like on twitter or online or whatever um so i i gained a ton of insight and knowledge about things that are happening and it was great to just see that his spirits are still good like he's not broken he's still That's fighting awesome he's still very like collected and um he smelled good <laughs> <laughs> one thing I was like man I want to tweet about this so bad <laughs> so that yeah so that's a, yet another piece of fake news that we now have debunked yeah. in this stream good was, good deal yeah that was I was laughing about that I messaged my editor and I was like if I write anything about this or ever talk <laughs> about it I'm just gonna write fake news Julian Assange smells good <laughs> period um but yeah he's He's very cool. He's friendly and warm and funny and um, just a really great person. Like I was, I was nervous and I was really worried that he was going to hate me or think I was weird or something because I'm kind of a weirdo, <laughs> but he didn't. And he's, you know, just a good, normal person who happens to be brilliant. <laughs> awesome. That's, that's so incredibly unique and amazing that you have somebody that's actually 
you know, as good as their um, PR kind of portrays them to be. Yeah, he was, and it, it was weird because it, it almost didn't feel like it was the first time I was meeting him because I've followed him so closely forever and he's just exactly how you, how he appears. Like what you see is what you get. He's the same as, you know, in the interviews on RT or whatever. Um, so it was cool. So you're telling me that he's like one of the few people in the media sphere that is actually honest about who they are. That's incredible. But um, yeah, Uh, there's a question here by Redneckonomics, who, again, I recognize from our streams and from supporting, you know, Susie's work and whatnot. They said, can you post the link to your Patreon, please? And I wasn't, I'm not, they didn't say who they were addressing that to, but I have, doesn't matter who they're addressing it to because the the only, um, you know, website that you should be um, or the only funding that you should be doing as a result of this stream is for WikiLeaks and for Julian's Defense Fund and all of those donation links are in the press release that Susie uh, put out on Steemit and so if you go to Susie's Twitter account I'm sure you will see that um, that press release and that's where you'll find the right links to go donate to and, and please do go to at WikiLeaks shop on Twitter and you can get cool swag. There's the 1984 clock. There's all kinds of awesome t-shirts that will get, make people give you dirty looks on the street. Um, there it's, it's always fun. It's a conversation starter. I carry my WikiLeaks tote bag almost everywhere. I have purses that cost thousands of dollars and they've been collecting dust on the, on the shelf. And I carry this like tattered free Assange bag with me everywhere I go. And it always sparks conversations. And sometimes I can change people's mind. And that's always fun. So also, yeah, please go to WikiLeaks shop, buy some stuff. They have good stuff. Absolutely. I'm so glad that we caught that question before we wrap things up. And I know I've got a couple of messages from the people um, uh, behind the scenes over in Discord. There's, um, one of them is saying that if they're willing, we could hold, we could go for about an hour or so until someone else can take the wheel. I don't know what your schedule looks like, Cassandra, but, um, so you know, and I'm, I'm fine to do that or, or fine to wrap up when the Facebook timer runs out, but go ahead. Um, also, people should donate to the Courage Foundation. Absolutely. And the WikiLeaks Defense Fund. But um, I am down to go for however long you want. Julian Assange is like, and WikiLeaks and how important they are is the one thing that I like always love to talk about. <laughs> So I can go, I, I'm going to the White House press briefing tomorrow afternoon, oh, but wow. uh, so I can keep going until then for all I care, <laughs> whatever you guys need. So. Awesome. Or we can wrap up, it's whatever, you, whatever you guys want to do. I hate being the one responsible for these types of deci- decisions, but let me see. I'm, I'm just checking up on the YouTube chat. I haven't looked at it in hours. So. Yeah, I've got a whole bunch of messages here. Let's see. So what do you guys want? Chat. I know there are still an amazing, you know, 360 people watching us right now. So guys, what do you want? Do you want us to stick around for an hour or do you want us to sign off, wrap up now? What is your preference here? (laughs) Garden gnomes like Elizabeth, if you're tired, go to bed. And I don't even know if I'm tired. It's just that I feel like my brain isn't operating as well. You know, like I'm starting to, just stop mumbling about random stuff, I feel like. But yeah, oh, and somebody talked about, uh, just pinged uh, John Pillager and Credico. And I know that Randy Credico was with us in spirit. He was, I think, doing an interview on, uh, you know, like a legacy press outlet. So he really definitely was doing good uh, speaking out about the situation with Assange. But if we have this event again, I would love, love it if uh, Randy Credico or John Pillager would be willing to speak with us. Randy Credico is so great. He's just definitely phenomenal. I love that guy. He's incredibly brave to stand up to the subpoena and say, I'm not going to speak on this. Like you won't make me rat. Amazing. Amazing. Not a lot of people would have the courage to do that. Well, he's got good friends surrounded by good influences. And I think that people who are brave and courageous like Julian and, you know, Randy, stick together they find each other so there's always going to be good people surrounding WikiLeaks definitely 
<laughs> so apparently five minutes ago we had 12 minutes left. So I guess I think that I would like to wrap up, not because I want to end this, but because I I feel like my brain is start of, start, yeah. uh, sort of and starting to fade a bit. Work. Yeah. And so I don't want the, I don't want the I don't want this stream to devolve into me just kind of like staring at you guys mumbling. So I'd rather kind of like end it on a good note. And I really appreciate every single person that has watched this stream, has joined us, has commented, has left a question. And um, so I guess I'll uh, Cassandra, I'll ask you what Susie's asked everybody else as the, as they've left, which is you know what do you what would you say to Julian if he was you know right here with you speaking to you. That, you know, we will never stop fighting for him. And um, I know that he will also keep fighting for everybody else. And that's a beautiful thing. And um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I kind of already said everything to him uh, last week. So it's similar to that. I think he's amazing and inspirational. And I think that he is saving the world. I think that he's the most important person on the planet and there's nothing that I wouldn't do if I thought that it would help to get him out of there. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a real shame. And I hope that he can walk on a beach soon and, you know, have freedom and sunshine on his face. <laughs> so I don't know. Keep fighting. <laughs> yeah. Likewise. I just, um, you know, to, uh, uh, my thoughts directed towards Julian. Thank you if you've what if you've managed to watch this whole stream uh, of uh, of so many people caring about you. Then thank you, um, but also thank you for everything you've done and have continued to like willingly put yourself through for the for the sake of other people. Whether it's Chelsea Manning, whether it's you know so many other people that are, there are just too many to even name and and have many thousands that go unnamed in the the countries that you stand up for, like Catalonia and you know, Yemen and endless on and on in Iraq, obviously. So thank you. And, um, you know, I hope that this stream that Susie and Kim.com began almost, almost uh, like 10 or 11 hours ago gives you some idea that people really do love you and appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. And that's all. I, I really hope that he understands how much we all love him. <laughs> and yeah, I really just, I, I think he does, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously WikiLeaks has a giant, giant uh, reach on Twitter with like five and a half million uh, Twitter followers. But I mean, I, I could understand if um, there was some sort of perce perception that his sacrifice was taken for granted. And I, I want, Julian to know that his sacrifices are not taken for granted by a large number of amazing people. So, And with that, I guess I'm going to call it a night. And I've never been the host of a, of a Zoom chat like this before. So um, I'm just asking my Discord people, um, if I just close out the meeting as you would any sort of conversation, is that going to work? Or is there anything else um, I need to do? Susie just suggested that we end with the quote from Julian Assange about awesome. injustice, which I can read or send over to you. To Thank you. No, 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 you do it, Cassandra. That's amazing. That's okay. awesome. It's a little bit long, so. <laughs> not a problem. Every time we witness an injustice and do not act, we train our character to be passive in its presence and thereby eventually lose all ability to defend ourselves and those we love. In a modern economy, it is impossible to steal oneself off from injustice. If we have brains or courage, then we are blessed and called on not to frit these qualities away, standing agape with the ideas of others, winning pissing contests, improving the efficiencies of the neo-corporate state, or immersing ourselves in obscuranta, but rather to prove the vigor of our talents against the strongest opponents of love we can find. If we can only live once, then let it be a daring adventure that draws on all our powers. Let it be with similar types whose hearts and heads we may be proud of. Let our grandchildren delight to find the start of our stories in their ears, but the endings all around in their wondering eyes. The whole universe or structure that perceives it is a worthy opponent, but try as I may, I cannot es escape the sound of suffering. Perhaps as an old man, I will take comfort in pottering around in a lab and gently talking to students in the summer evening and will accept suffering with, in I can't even pronounce this, I'm sorry, and I don't have my glasses on. But now men in their prime, if they have convictions are tasked to act on them. Sorry, I'm terrible at this. <laughs>
and my glasses are upstairs. Not a problem at all. That was amazing. And thank you for reading that. And thank you, Susie, for suggesting it. So, and with that, I think we will call it an evening, you guys. Thank you, you amazing, incredible heroes in chat that are still listening to us. And we will see you next time. I'm hoping that, as Ray said, that we will make this a regular thing. And even if that doesn't happen, um, I know that, uh, that Susie and Kim will be right back at this very soon, as soon as they've had a little bit of a sleep. So, and we'll all be here again. Thank so thank you, Julian. Thank you, everyone. It's been an honor to be part of this.